Welcome to this beginner level course where you will learn how to build a modern front-end application step-by-step -step using Blazor and the C-Sharp language. My name is Julio Casal and I spent the last decade building all sorts of cloud-based web applications that handle millions of requests every month. By the end of this course, you will have mastered all the skills necessary to start your journey into C-Sharp front-end development even if you have never created a web application before. So let's get started by taking a quick look at the application that you will build across this course. Imagine that your team has been asked to build the game catalog section of your company's video game store. The backend developers already took care of standing up the REST API that provides all the standard operations to create, list, update, and delete games. Now you, as a front-end developer, need to figure out a way to build a web UI for this game catalog where administrators will be able to manage information about all the games offered by the store. In this course, you will create this front-end from scratch using the latest innovations in the Blazor Web UI framework and C Sharp. If you're interested on the backend portion of this system, please check out my SPNet Core full course linked to this video where I cover how to build that part in detail. Creating a Blazor frontend involves understanding multiple concepts, techniques, and patterns that I'll cover in detail in this course. You will start by learning what is Blazor and how to create, run, and debug your first Blazor application from scratch. Then, you'll learn how to use Razor syntax to combine HTML with C Sharp to render a simple list of items in your browser, which you can later style using the popular Bootstrap CSS framework. Next, you will learn how to create your own Razor component and use it to improve the layout of your homepage. You will then use Blazor forms and bindings to capture data from your user and add it to your list of items. You will also add client-side validation to your form to ensure your application can only accept valid inputs according to your business rules. Next, you will dive into the dependency injection pattern to understand how to use built-in Blazor services in your components and how to reuse your object instances across multiple components. Then, you will learn to use Blazor's routing and navigation features along with component parameters to let the user navigate between components. And to complete your application UI, you will learn to use the interactivity features of Blazor to create a simple but useful dialog that can react to user events in real time. You will then learn to use the ASP.NET Core configuration system and the asynchronous programming model to configure your Blazor application to send requests to your backend API via an HTTP client object. And to close, you will learn to use the stream rendering and enhanced navigation form features to maintain a friendly and responsive user experience even when dealing with a slow backend. In order to take this course, you should have some basic knowledge of C Sharp, Java, or a similar object-oriented language. You should also know the essentials of web development, particularly how to use HTML and CSS to build basic websites. However, this is a beginner level course, so you don't have to be an expert on any of these topics since we write every line of code from scratch and everything we do is explained in detail. In terms of the software prerequisites for this course, you will need to download and install the following. The .NET Software Development Kit, or SDK, which includes everything needed to build and run .NET applications. And Visual Studio Code, a lightweight but powerful source code editor that you will use to write, build, and debug your code. Please go ahead and install these tools now using the URLs on screen if you don't already have them. So what is Blazor? Blazor is a modern web framework for building interactive web UIs using HTML, CSS, and C Sharp. With Blazor, you build web apps using reusable components that can be run both from the client and the server so that you can deliver great web experiences. But what does it mean to build web UIs using components? To understand this, Let's see what happens when your browser requests a page from a Blazor application. Upon the user entering or clicking on the site's URL, 
the browser sends a request to the server where the Blazor app is running. Blazor receives a request and loads what is known as a root component, which defines the top-level HTML layout of the page and imports the Blazor JavaScript runtime plus a few CSS files. The root component also finds and loads all the components specified for the requested page. For instance, there could be a header component, a sidebar component, and a main component. Each of these components can be developed individually with a combination of HTML, CSS, and C Sharp. And each component can also be reused and nested within another component. For instance, the main component here is really a combination of a search box component and an items list component. Blazor will then translate the structure of all these components into a standard HTML, and it will send it back to the browser where the page will be rendered. Another thing to understand about Blazor is that it behaves like a single page application or SPA. To understand what this means, let's look at another request where the user has clicked on a link that requests the page to edit an item. In a standard website, such requests would involve navigating and loading an entire new page. But in Blazor, by default, there will be no navigation to a new page, and instead, a JavaScript fetch request will be sent to the server. This happens thanks to blazor.web.js, the key Blazor framework component that is able to intercept standard HTTP requests in the browser and transform them into fetch calls that request the HTML of the requested page without the need of loading a new page. On the server, Blazor will find a component that maps the requested route and will use it to prepare the updated HTML. This HTML response is sent back to the browser, and once Blazor.web.js receives it, it will patch the document object model or DOM of the already loaded page, so only the pieces of HTML that change it are re-rendered. Since everything is really happening in a single page with no page reloads, you can think of a Blazor app as a single page application that preserves more of the page state so pages load faster and more efficiently than in traditional websites. Blazor has many other unique features, but at this point, it's best to get our hands dirty and prepare our dev box to start building Blazor applications. Let's see how to configure our local development environment to create Blazor applications. And here we are in Visual Studio Code. And the first thing that we probably want to do is to make sure that our .NET SDK has been properly installed. And to do that, we're going to open up our VS Code terminal. So let's go ahead and open our terminal by using this menu over here. So menu bar, let's open up this, and then let's go into terminal and then new terminal. Now a quick shortcut to open and close this terminal because you're going to be using it a lot uh, is by using, at least on Windows, the control tilde combination. So control tilde is going to close and open that terminal. And then another way to do this also, which is my favorite, if I just doing control J also on Windows, control J is going to open and close that terminal. All right. Now, while being on the terminal, what you can do is use the .NET CLI, which comes with the .NET SDK, to verify a couple of things about your SDK. The first thing that we can verify is the version, the version we have installed. So I'll do .NET dash dash version. And that's going to go ahead and list the version that I have installed of the .NET SDK in my box, as you can see there. And then if you wanted to get more information about your installed .NET SDK version, I'm going to just clean this quickly. You can also do .NET dash dash info, okay, which is also going to give you the version, but it's also going to give you much more information about everything related to the .NET SDK in your box, as you can see right here, right? Either way, if you're not getting any error, any errors over here, it means that your .NET installation is, is correct. Right, so now let's go ahead and close this terminal. And then the next thing that you want to do is to install one extension that is going to overall improve our C-sharp coding experience within Visual Studio Code. So to do that, let's go ahead and first let's just close this welcome screen and let's go into our extensions view on the left side over there. Let's open extensions view. And as you're going to see, the only thing that I have installed right now is the material icon theme. So this is a theme that just uh, makes it so that the icons look better in VS Code. That's totally optional. But what we really need is this one known as the C-sharp dev kit. So just type C-sharp in your search box over there. It should be the very first hit 
So this one here, C Sharp Dev Kit by Microsoft, this one. So let's click on that one. And well, let's go ahead and just install it. So let's click on install over here. It's going to take a few seconds. And the purpose of this extension is to install all sorts of productivity improvements so that you can more easily manage your C Sharp projects in VS Code, create C Sharp files. There are a few wizards to create projects. There's also a solution explorer. There is a test explorer to run unit tests and a bunch of improvements for C Sharp development, right? And then also one thing to keep in mind is that this extension is also going to install more things in your box than just extensions. So if you just go ahead and clear C Sharp from the search box, let's clear that. What you're going to notice is that, of course, we do have the C Sharp Dev Kit, which is right here, but it's also going to go ahead and install the C Sharp extension itself, which is the extension that actually provides the C Sharp language support into your box, right? So that's the C Sharp extension. And we also have the .NET install tool over here. So that one is used to provide a version of the .NET runtime or the .NET SDK to any other extension that may need it. All right. Uh, but really, that's uh, all you need in your box to start doing Blazor development with Visual Studio Code. And next, we're going to see how to go ahead and create our first Blazor project. Let's see how to create Blazor projects in Visual Studio Code. And the first way that you can do this is by using your command palette. And that is because you have installed the C Sharp Dev Kit extension. So to do that, what you can do is just go ahead and open up your menu bar over here. And then you can go into view and then command palette. Now the command palette is super handy in VS Code. So here's a quick shortcut for you that you can use to open and close it very quickly, which is Ctrl Shift P. That's going to go ahead and open your command palette very quick. And like I said, there are many, many commands here that are super handy. And since you have already installed the C Sharp the Kit, what you're going to notice is that you can now just type .NET, right? So .NET, and that's going to offer multiple options for different uh, commands that are related specifically to .NET projects. So for instance, you can click on New Project here, and that's going to open up this list of templates for the different types of .NET projects that can be created in your machine. Now, in our case, the one that we'll be, we'll be mostly interested in will be this one here that says Blazor Web App, okay? So not Blazor Web Assembly standalone app because that's a previous way to create Blazor projects. The latest and newer way to do it is by using this template that says Blazor Web. And we could go ahead and create our project using this option here. However, what I notice is that this option is a little bit limited. It does not offer us a bunch of additional options that we may want to set as we create a project. And because of that reason, we're not going to go for this way in this video. So instead of that, what we're going to do is use the .NET CLI or command line interface, which is, which is way more powerful in terms of the options that it offers. So to do that, the first thing that I'm going to do is to set what is going to be the folder in my machine where I'm going to be working in my Blazor application. So for that, let's just go ahead and open up once again our menu bar. Let's go into File and then uh, Open Folder. And then I have prepared this uh, D uh, projects directory in my machine. It can be really any directory in your box. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that here we're going to be creating one brand new directory. And in this case, I'm just going to name Game Store because what we're going to be creating here is basically a game catalog for a game store, the UI or the front end for this game catalog. So I just name it game store. And then I'm going to just click down here into select folder. And that is going to go ahead and open up VS Code in the context of this folder that we have just created, right? So this has become now our workspace in VS Code. So notice that now we have an Explorer window on the left side that is specifically opened in the context of that game store directory, right? So now let me close this welcome screen. And I'm going to do now is just to open up my terminal once again. So Control J, open terminal. Notice that the terminal opens in the context of game store also. And this is great because what we want to do now is to create our actual Blazor project. So for that, we're going to be using the .NET command line interface or CLI. So all you have to do is just to .NET new, and just like we noticed before that in the command palette, you can see the list of templates that are available for you. You can also do here .NET new list, and you're going to see a complete list of also all of the types of applications that you can create in your machine, which as you're going to see, is going to be a little bit more extensive because the CLI always shows way more things and options than your command palette, right? Now, in our case, since we want to go ahead and create a Blazor application, the option that you want to use is this one. 
Blazor Web App. So that is the template that we want to use. Okay, so now how do we use it? Well, let me show you. Let's go ahead and minimize a little bit this terminal and let's clean this. What you want to do is the following. .NET new, and then of course we type Blazor here. And then one thing to keep in mind is that the Blazor project template has many possible options that you can use to configure how you want to create your project. So if you just type here dash dash help, you're going to notice that, well, like I said, this template has many, uh, many different options, right? Because Blazor is a very flexible platform, right? Now for this video, what I want to do is to create the minimal possible Blazor application Right, so that we don't have a bunch of files and configurations that we don't understand. And instead, we're going to start very, very clean. And we're going to start adding things little by little, like Lego pieces, so that we understand exactly what's going on at every step. Okay, so because of that, we're going to take advantage of a couple of options here. The first option is going to be this one here, interactivity. And for this one, we're going to choose none so that we don't enable any interactivity yet. We're going to look into this later across this course. And we're also going to be using this empty option over here so that we only get the minimal set of files in our project. All right, so let's go ahead and collapse this a little bit and let's clean our screen. And let's now do .NET new blazer. And like I said, we're going to say interactivity is going to be none. And we're going to say empty here. And lastly, we have to provide some name for the actual project. So the name is going to be, in this case, gamestore.frontend because it is our front-end project. Right, so let's hit enter. And this went ahead and created the project for us, right? And so if we now open our file explorer over here on the left side, if you just open file explorer and let me collapse this terminal now, you're going to see that now we have our Blazor project created and there are a bunch of files that got created as part of that template. Now, one thing to notice is that if you select one of the C Sharp files in this file explorer, then the C Sharp dev kit is going to kick in and it's going to enable one more uh, interesting component of your VS Code experience, which is known as the Solution Explorer. And that Solution Explorer is down here. Okay, let me just close this program for a moment and let's open Solution Explorer. And what we're going to see is that well, we have these two views of, uh, of the files that are composed in our application. And the difference is that our uh, file explorer, this one at the top, is kind of a physical view of all of the files that are included in the application. So you're going to see everything about the application, including the bin and OBJ directories, right? Which are the, the files that, in, that are produced by the compilation process of .NET. But then we have this solution explorer down here, which is kind of a virtual view of how the .NET tooling looks at our application, right? So this is going to include things like the dependencies of each of our projects. But also this view, as you're going to see, when you right click on the project, is going to offer you new uh, contextual options to create files or to add references between projects, right? So this is all contributed by the C Sharp Dev Kit. So across this, this course, we're going to be using either Solution Explorer or the File Explorer depending on, on what is the task at hand, because there are things that you can do in, in one of these that you cannot do in the other, right? So we are going to choose the right explorer for the task at hand. Let me now give you a quick overview of all the different files that got generated into your Blazor project, just so that you understand better where are the different things located and how they work together, right? And so for this, I have opened here my file explorer, just because the file explorer is one that's going to show you everything about your project as opposed to Solution Explorer. And so in this file explorer, let's go and open up our program.cs file. So let's go open program.cs and let me close this. And this file here, which as you can see, it is a C-sharp file. And the idea of this one is to be your application or your project entry point. So this is the file that has all of the application startup logic. And really the whole purpose of this program CS file is to set up the host of your application. And that host is encapsulated in this app object over here, which is of type web application. So web application is the host. And the purpose of the host is to encapsulate all of the application resources. So things like the HTTP server implementation, middleware components, login, dependency injection services, configuration, all of these things are essential for your application and they are going to be needed by multiple pieces across the application, right? And so this file is really split into two main sections. The, main, uh, the first section here 
is going to start in line three and perhaps in, until line seven. And the idea is that we create this builder object, which is the one that we can use to register all of the services that are going to be needed by the application. So this uses the dependency injection pattern across the application, which we're going to be learning more about uh, later in the course. But for now, what you can see is that we are just adding one service here, which is, a, which is add Razor components. And this is needed so that your application actually knows how to use Razor components in the application. We're going to dive more into the Razor components in a moment, uh, but that's the only service that we can see that is being registered here. But just by calling create builder on web application, there are other services that are going to be also enabled into the application. Now, as we keep going down, you're going to see that we go ahead and invoke build in builder to produce the, the instance of the web application object. So by invoking build, that's going to go ahead and actually set up things like what is going to be the web server, which in this case is going to be the Kestrel web server for an SPNet core application. It's going to load configuration from app says the JSON, environment variables, command line arguments, and perhaps other configuration sources. It's going to also set up a login, the login output for the console and even any other login providers. And so all of that's going to be set up for you by just invoking build and preparing this application object. And then from here on, what we're going to do is to configure what is known as the HTTP request pipeline, right? So everything that goes from line 10 all the way to the end to line 25 is configuration of the request pipeline, which means that we have to decide how we're going to be handling the different requests that come into the application uh, and so and what to do about them, right? And for that, what we do is we use this concept of middleware. So middleware are pieces uh, or services in your application that can handle different cross-cutting concerns uh, in the application. So for instance, as you can see here, we have a section here that says that if we are not in development, that well, we are kind of in production, we're going to go ahead and use the exception handle middleware to set up what is going to be the route to send a request or to send the, the user if there is an expected error in the application. We also have these other two pieces of middleware, this HSTS middleware, where H STS stands for Strict Transfer uh, Security. And we also have the HTTPS redirection middleware here, right? So these two middlewares we're going to, are going to work uh, together to make sure that your application can only work uh, with HTTPS and not with standard HTTP. Now, in this course, we're not really going to be using uh, HTTPS. It's not going to be needed for the purpose of this course. But by default, as you can see, it is being added into your application if you need those. Now, going down, you're going to see that we have the uh, static files middleware which is the one that's going to be needed to serve static files in your application. So things like your HTML files, CSS, images, JavaScript. So things that are not dynamically generated by your application, but are just static, right? So they need to be provided into the browser as they are. We also have the anti-forgery middleware over here, which is the one that's going to be protect your website across, against cross-site request forgery uh, threats, right? We're not going to dive uh, into this, but know that this is needed later on as we start working with forms, this is going to be needed to make sure that your, uh, your site is uh, safe against these uh, traits that I just mentioned. Then as you're going to see, we invoke the map razor components method over here, which is going to, again, configure middleware to be able to discover all of the components, the razor components that you have created for your Blazor app. And it's also going to make it so that this app component here, which we're going to take a look in a second, uh, this is going to be your root component. And from there, we're going to be discovering all of the other components for your application. Okay, so as you can see, at the very end, we just invoke app.run, which is going to start the host of the application and makes it so the application is ready to start receiving requests. Now, it would be good to dive in more into what is this app component here, right? So what is this app? So if you go ahead and go back into the Explorer, we're going to see that we have this components folder over here, there's components. So if you open up that, you're going to find that we have a series of Razor files and a few folders over there, right? So this app component that we saw in Problem.cs actually is this app.razor file that we can see on the left side. So we click on app.razor and we collapse this. We're going to notice that this is, uh, well, like I said, the root component. So this defines the main layout of your application. I mentioned that a Blazor application is kind of a single page application because always there's going to be just one page. And that page is this one that you can see right here. Notice that uh, for the most part, this is just the standard way to define an HTML application, uh, an HTML page, right? So you have the declaration of the HTML page. You have the head, the head section here, right? 
head section with a bunch of meta, base, and link uh, elements over there. And then uh, you also have a body section down here, and then it just closes HTML, right? So it looks very standard, except for a couple of things, right? So this head outlet and these routes uh, elements here are a bit different. So what's going on there? So really those are two of the components or Razor components that are enabled in your Blazor application. Head outlet is a component that is, is, can be used by other components in your application to render things into the head section of your application. So for instance, if you want to render a page title into your, into your head, then another component will declare page title and that page title will be rendered into where we have declared this head outlet component over here. And we're going to take a look at that page title later on. And then down here, we have this other routes component. So what is this route component about? So routes is actually another component that is declared over here. Notice this, routes.razor, right? So this starts uh, revealing the fact that you can start nesting components uh, one into another, right? So inside this app.razor, we're going to be nesting this routes component that is defined over here in routes.razor. Now, riser razor is a very important component that you're going to find in really any Blazor application. And the idea is that this is going to set up the routing for your Blazor application, right? So this is going to allow to render the page that matches the requested address in the browser, right? So as you can see, so this uses the router, right? And the router is going to just find the assembly where we are running right now. And then we have this section that says found. So found means, that, okay, so we found the page or we found the component that we need to render, right? So context is going to provide this route data. Route data includes everything about the component that has been requested. Right, and then it's going to send that over into this route view component over here. Right, now the idea of the route, route view is that it receives all of the data about that uh, component that needs to be rendered, and it's going to well actually go ahead and render that component dynamically. It decides what component to render depending on this route data that has been received, but it also provides what is known as the default layout. Right, so the layout is going to be the component that wraps your actual uh, component that you want to render uh, inside this main, main layout, all right? Now, moving on, and what you're going to see is that we also have this other component here known Focus on Navigate, which is just a component that is used to set up the initial focus uh, inside uh, the component that's been created. Now, it is very interesting to actually see, well, where is this main layout? And what's the idea of this main layout component here? So if you go back uh, into Explorer, you're going to see that we also have this layout directory over here. Okay, if you click over there, you're going to see that we have this main layout.razor file here. So the idea of main layout.razor is that this is the this is a component that inherits from layout component base, which turns this component, I mean, it makes it a layout component, and it is a component that can actually render the content of any other component that has been passed in, right? So as you can see, we're using razor syntax here with this add element here, add body. So add body, is going to be the, the, the fragment of HTML that's going to be rendered inside this layout here. Okay, you can add many things to this layout. Right now, it really has nothing other than the body. But because we are defining it as a layout component base, uh, we are able to set the body, and that body is going to be populated, if we just go back into routes, it's going to be populated based on the route data that was passed in into route view, right? Now, but what is the actual the actual component or the actual page that we're going to show inside the main layout? Well, that's going to be defined actually if we go into pages, right? We go into pages over here, open up. That's going to show right now we only have two pages, and the main one is going to be home.razor, right? So home.razor is kind of the main page at this point of your application, which as you can see, it defines the route, which in this case is just a route. It defines the route that it's going to respond to. Right when the when somebody looks for it in the in the browser, it defines what is going to be the page title, right? The page title for the application, which, like I said, page title is going to work in combination with the head outlet here in app.razor to render that actual page title in the head section of your application. All right, and then all we have here is just uh, well a hello world with an h1 and then some content over there, right? And just like as we have this, this home.razor, we also have an error.razor component here, which can be used when somebody, when the application redirects into the slash error uh, route over here to render any unexpected error in the application. Notice that this works in conjunction with what we said in program.cs. Remember that we said that if we are not in, in development, right, we are not in development, we are going to be using the uh, exception handle middleware 
to redirect into a slash error. And that slash error maps into error over here, right? Error that razor, right? So that's that's mostly it about components, uh, eraser components in your, in your application. And but there's one more thing here. We also have this imports that razor file. And the idea of this file is to define uh, many common uh, using statements across the entire application, just so that you don't have to be importing these namespaces over and over again in multiple uh, in multiple components. Right? It's a nice way to centralize uh, different different namespaces. Right? Now let me close this. Now another thing to notice is that uh, if it's is that main layout that razor also has another file next to it, this one here, main layout that razor that CSS, right? Which is kind of the uh, cascade style sheets or styles for this specific component. So you can specify styles for each individual component, or if you wanted to, you can also go in this case into WW root over here, WW root. You can go ahead and expand this, and you're going to notice that we have this app.css file. So the idea of app.css is that this defines all of the global styles that you can apply across any of the components in your Blazor application. You can see we have a bunch of them by default, right? But you can add as many as you want either here for, for, uh, for the global application, or you can define, like I said, uh, like in main layout CSS, you could have a CSS for any specific Razor file. Now, that's pretty much it in terms of uh, Blazor or Razor components. But there are a few other things in your application. So for instance, a very important file is this gamestore.frontend.csproc file. So if you open this file, this is known as the, the project file for your application. And the idea of this file is to define, well, what kind of application is that you're building here? As you can see at the very top, this is using the Microsoft.net.sdk.web SDK, which what it does is by default, it imports a bunch of dependencies that are specifically needed for web projects in ASP.NET Core. And then we have a few other things, like for instance, we have here the target framework, which is in this case is .NET 8.0. So this defines what are going to be the APIs from the .NET SDK that are going to be available for your application, right? So if you had here uh, something like .NET 7.0, then, then that means that you have APIs only up to .NET 7. Or if you have .NET 9.0, it means that you have even more APIs available, right? So it really depends on what uh, version of the SDK you want to target here. And you always get the default version that is aligns with the SDK that you have installed. So I'm going to, not going to go into more details about these other settings right now, but another thing to know about this file is that this is the file where you're going to declare any other dependencies that this project have with any other project in your application, or perhaps with NuGet packages for libraries that you want to import into your project, right? So that's the file. What else we have here? We also have these two files here. So appsets.json and appsets.development.json. And the idea of these files here is to define a series of configurations for your application that you don't want to just hard code into the C-sharp code, right? So for instance, you can see by default, you have configured what is going to be the login levels or what are going to be the login levels for your application, right? That you don't want to be hard coding directly into the C-sharp code, right? And so you have one file here that's going to be used by default, right? So upside that JSON, but you could have another one like this one that in this case is specifically used by for the development environment. Right? I'm saying that develop that JSON does this would override whatever you have in the other file if you're working in your machine development environment. Now, talking about the environment, uh, where is that development environment defined really? So if you go into the properties directory over here, so go into properties, you're going to find this launch settings JSON file. So this file here is specifically used for development purposes, right? And this, the main thing about this file is going to define what is known as profiles, right? And uh, the profiles that you have defined here are the HTTP profile and the HTTPS profile over here, right? And each of these profiles are going to define a few settings about your project that are going to be activated in your development environment. So for instance, uh, this setting here defines that you want to launch a browser whenever you start executing your, uh, your project. It defines very importantly, it defines the application URL, which is the host and port that your application is going to be responding to when you work uh, with it in your machine. In this case is localhost 5002. Now the port is dynamic, so you likely got a different port uh, when you created your own project. And like I said, there is this concept of the development environment. As you can see here, we, we can define environment variables for the local, uh, the local execution. And in this case, we're defining the well-known ASP.NET Core environment variable that in this case, it is set as development, which makes it so that we are running uh, in development environment in our box. Now, when you go into production, this file is not going to exist and it's not going to be used. 
And because of that, this is going to default into production, right? And that changes a little bit how the application behaves as, as you go into production. Now, just like we have the HTTP profile, we also have the HTTPS profile over here. With the only difference is that now we have another URL here for HTTPS purposes, if you want to serve your, your application in HTTPS. And then, but then other than that, it's pretty much the same thing. Now, like I said, we're not going to be using HTTPS across this, this course, but this is the URL that you would use if you wanted to use this profile, All right? So that's launch.json. Let's see what else we have here. Yeah, so other things that we have not covered just yet are really only these two other directories. Uh, let me collapse this. Uh, we have the bin directory and the OBJ directory, which are meant for the, the production of the output of your application, right? So in this case, OBJ is for intermediate files that are generated as we are preparing the final DLL or assembly for your application. And bin is where you're going to see that the actual final DLL is generated for the application. We're going to take a look at how to actually build this project in a moment. And well, of course, finally, we have the solution file down here, which is the one that activates uh, or that uh, defines how the solution explorer is going to be showing uh, your project in, well, in the solution aspect. All right. And so, yeah, so I get that it is a lot of information at this point as you're starting with your Blazor, uh, Blazor journey, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what you got here. And trust me, things are going to be way, way clearer as you start coding your application. As with any C Sharp or .NET based project, we need to find a way to turn our source code, our C Sharp code into binaries that our machine can understand and that can execute. And for that, all we have to do is just to build our project. Now in Visual Studio Code, there are a few ways to do this. And since we have the C Sharp Dev Kit and the Solution Explorer, we can actually start over there. So let's go ahead and switch from our file explorer into our solution explorer down here. So let's open up solution explorer. Let's collapse this. And really to build the project, all you have to do is just right click in the project name right here. So right click on the project name and here you're going to find your build option right there. So really all you have to do is click on build and then the .next SDK is going to take over and it's going to go ahead and turn your C Sharp code for, for your project into the corresponding DLL. And you can see that it got generated right here. It says exactly where it output that DLL. And so we can actually go ahead and see that if we switch briefly into our file explorer, you're going to see that now we have this brand new bin debug net a zero directory populated with a bunch of files. And among, among them, we have our game store.frontend.dll. All right, there are a few other files like for instance, our apps install JSON and apps install development JSON that we said, these are the files that can have the configurations that we don't want to hard code into the C-sharp code, right? And there are a few other files that we're not going to cover right now, but basically that is the build process, right? So you just go ahead and turn your C-sharp code into DLL or also is uh, known as assembly in the .NET world. Now that's one way to do it. Now, another way to do it is by using the .NET command line interface or CLI. So let me show you how to do that. Let me, for that, let me collapse this for a moment. And what I'm going to do is just click on this plus sign over here to open a brand new terminal over here. And I'm going to switch into my game store that front end directory. All right, let me actually kill the other terminal. I'm going to just click over here in this delete to delete that previous terminal. So we have more screen. And here, in order to build the project using the CLI, all you have to do is just say .NET, build, enter and that will go ahead and produce your DLL. Okay, the process is going to be faster depending on how many changes you have in your code since the last time that you built, or it may be super fast if there's nothing really to rebuild in there, All right? But you can see it's the same, pretty much the same idea. And then the last way that you can do this is by using the built-in integration of Visual Studio Code with the build task. So how does that work? So what you can do is just go ahead and go into your menu. So go into your menu and then let's go into terminal and then into this one here that says run build task. Okay, if you click on that one, you're going to see that VS Code already understand what is going to be the right uh, build task for our .NET project, right? In this case, it is .NET build, just like the one that we just executed. And if you just click there, you're going to see that it will go ahead and kick off the building of your project, just like, like we did a moment ago. Now this you can also do via shortcuts. So what you can do now is just say 
use the Control Shift B combination in your keyboard, and that's going to go ahead and pop up that the dialog that you can click, and they will go ahead and build the project. Okay, so this is one of the fastest ways to go ahead and build a project whenever you want. Just like there are multiple ways to build your project in VS Code, there are also a few ways to run your project. But really, the simplest way to do this in VS Code and on Windows at least is by using the F5 key. So if you just press F5 in your keyboard, you're going to see this dialog showing up, which is pretty much asking you to choose what is going to be the debugger for your application. Since our application is a C-sharp application, we're going to go ahead and select C-sharp. So click on C-sharp. And next, VS Code is going to ask you, well, what is going to be the profile that you're going to use to run your application? Remember that we have at least an HTTP and an HTTPS profile defined in our launch settings at JSON file, right? So now we have to choose which one to use, or we can just go for the default configuration, which is going to map into the HTTP profile. So let's go ahead and just pick the default configuration here. And at this point, VS Code is going to go ahead and first build the project. And once it is built, the debugger is going to start. And as you can see, it even goes ahead and opens uh, the website in your browser. Okay. And as you can see, uh, we are seeing here our Hello World title over there. And welcome to your new account. Now, why are we getting this Hello World and this message over here? Well, if you remember going back to VS Code over here, that is exactly what we had inside pages in home.racer, right? And let me collapse this for a moment. That is exactly what we had here, right? So we have a hello world, an H1 hello world, and we have welcome to your new, which is what we are seeing right now in the browser. Okay. Now, one thing to notice here is that you're not just running the application. You're actually in a debug session. And how, how we can confirm that? I mean, that actually means that you can start breaking into the execution of the application to inspect live what's going on with the different variables of the application. But can, how can we explore more about that? So let's go back into VS Code. And what I'm going to do now is just to stop it temporarily. You can use this bar at the top, this stop button over there. So let's click on stop. And that's going to just stop the, the debugger right now. And what I want to do right now is just go back into program.cs over here. And I'm going to close this for a moment. And I'm going to place a breakpoint perhaps just before the application runs over here in line 25, right? So that the application stops right there so we can evaluate what's going on at that point in time as we debug the application. So now I'm going to hit F5 once again. Same process, builds application, runs application, but as you can see, now we have stopped right there just before launching the application and going into the browser. And as you can see, now we have uh, the ability to just hover over some variables over here, for instance, over app, and you can see live the different uh, set of objects that are uh, running behind the application, like the configuration object here. And you can see, well, endpoints, environment, and well, a bunch of variables that are part of the web application object, right? We also have access to the uh, locals on the left side. You can see locals, the different local vari variables that we have here, like the builder, for instance, is also available there. You could add watches here if you want to watch a specific variable. You have the call stack over there, and well, a few things that are expected of a debugging session. So indeed, our application is in a debug session right now, right? So let me just remove this breakpoint and let's click. You can go ahead and click on this play button to keep running the application. And then as you can see, we just go back into the browser. Now, not all the time you're going to be needing to be debugging the application because debugging is actually a bit slower than just running the application. So if you just want to run it, here's what you can do. Let's go back to VS Code. And let's stop the debugging session. So stop that. And so, yeah, I'm going to collapse this for a moment. And let's go back into the terminal. And I'm going to go into my first terminal over here. Perhaps I'm going to delete the other one so, so that we have more space. OK, let's clean this. And then here we're going back into the .NET CLI. Right? So just like you can build a project, you can also run the project from here. So you, all you have to do is just say, and notice, of course, what a directory we are in right now. So we are in game store that front end. Okay, so that's the directory. And being here, you can do .NET run. So that will go ahead and it will first build the project if it needs to be built, right? And otherwise, it will just go ahead and start running. Notice that this tells us right away what is the location of our application, right? So host and port. And you can actually go ahead and click on that to immediately go into your web page, as you can see. Now, going back into VS Code, if we just scroll down a little bit, 
you're going to see that there's a bit of a warning down here, right? This warning here. And this warning, what it's saying is that uh, the .NET runtime was not able to switch into HTTPS in our machine. And that makes sense because we are not using the HTTPS profile. We're just using normal HTTP and we will keep doing so across this course. So in order to, I mean, I don't like to have this warning just uh, hanging around every single time that I run the application. So to actually get rid of this, we're going to do the following. So let me do Control C. So Control C to stop the process right now. And then I'm going to collapse this. And here in program CS, all we're going to do is to uh, remove this use HTTPS redirection call over here. Okay, so let's remove that, all right? So that the application is not going to try to redirect us into HTTPS anymore. And with that, if we just go ahead and uh, reopen the terminal, Control J, and we do .NET run, you're going to see that that warning is gone. So the warning is no longer here. Okay, normally as you go into production, HTTPS is actually handled, or SSL is, is handled in an API gateway that can do this thing called TLS termination, right? And your application can just happily keep running on HTTP, so no need for HTTPS at this point. Now, another thing that you can do here is to use another facility of .NET that allows you to kind of perform live changes in your application and let the browser automatically refresh as you make those changes so that you don't have to restart the application every single time. And that tool is known as .NET Watch. So let me show you how that works. So I'm going to clean this once again, right? And I stop the application. So instead of doing .NET Run, and also I'm going to close this from CS, I'm going to do .NET Watch, right? .NET Watch. So hit Enter. So once again, the application is built, and we're going to be starting the application, right? So as you can see here, and I'm going to actually close the other tabs so we can focus on this one. And what's going to happen is that we can actually make changes into this page, I mean, the code behind this page, and make it automatically change without having to restart the application. Now, just so that we can notice this better, let's see if we can put this into a screen. So let me put this on the right side, perhaps, and then VS Code on the left side. Now, it's going to be a little bit hard to manage these screens here, but I want to do this just for this part of the video uh, so we can see how things change on the browser. So now what we're going to do is the following. So let's go into Explorer. And before doing that, let me actually go ahead and collapse this terminal for a moment. Yeah, let's go here and let's go under components, pages, and home.race. Remember that this is the place, right, where we have defined a, a few things about this homepage, right, including the hello world and this welcome to your new. So let's say that we want to change this from hello world into uh, perhaps hello blazer, right? And well, for that, actually, it should be nice to be able to see the terminal here. So let's do this. So for this, let's do hello blazer, right? So notice that as the file is changed, right, .NET Watch has detected the change. So notice here, file change it, home.razor, and then it prefer is known as hot reload, right? So that the changes to the application are reloaded, and then the page, as you can see on the right side, has already changed and without us having to do any sort of stop and restart of the application, okay? And same thing that we just did here, we could do, for instance, with the page title. Notice that the page title right now, it says home over there, it's home over here. And we could say, let's say we don't want to say home, we want to say game store, for instance, right? And notice that hot reload happened once again, and now our title is game store, okay? So yeah, that is .NET Watch, it's a handy tool. Uh, it is not perfect. There are going to be many more uh, major changes that you may want to do across your application that .NET Watch is not going to be able to handle. So you will have to restart the entire application, uh, but we will try to use it in a few places across this course, whatever it makes sense and the changes are not that, that complicated. Now, since we're running the application, one more thing that I wanted to highlight here is how the structure of your web page is actually related to the structure of your Blazor application, right? So I think that's very interesting to understand. And for that, I'll have to actually, well, go ahead and maximize my screen here just to see better, right? I'm going to perhaps collapse the terminal for a moment. Now, let's go back into, into the layout of our application. So remember that we said that app.racer is the root component, right? So this is root component. Now, how is this app.racer reflected in the page that we were seeing a moment ago, right? So if we go back into the browser, I'm going to maximize my browser now. 
what we can do to inspect what is the actual HTML behind this browser page here is um, just press the F12 key. So go ahead and press F12 in your browser, and this is going to open up the browser developer tools. So this is a uh, uh, this is common both in Chrome and in Microsoft Edge. It should open this screen here, although you may land in a different tab. But let me go into the home tab over here. You may be seeing this here. But what I'd like you to actually look at right now is into this section here, this one here, which is going to show the elements. Okay, and it is a bit big for me here. Let me do this. Yeah, and so what you're seeing here is the developer tools that allow you as a developer to inspect what's going on with this page over here. And it's going to be very handy and you should get familiar with this because for front-end developers, this is a, an essential tool. And what you're seeing here is that we are looking at a structure very, very similar to the one that we have in our app.razor file, right? So we have the HTML, we have the head, we have all of these meta elements, right? Over here, we have this here, including the imports of the CSS, and we even have the body over here, right? So things are very similar, but notice one difference. So at the point where we should have the head outlet over here in the head, if we go back into the browser, we're going to see that what we have is the, the title, right? The title that later it is reflected over there in the title of, of the tab in the browser, right? And also, if we go back into VS Code, at the point where we should have this routes a component over here, if we go back into the browser, what we actually have is this H1 here that, has, that says, hello, Blazor, and also welcome to your new app, right? So why is this happening? Well, Blazor is using the root component to replace what is in there with the, the actual contents of the component that we want to show here. Since we navigated into the into the root on, or the home of the application, what happened is that, okay, so it said, uh, first it went into app.razor, right? So this is our root, uh, root page and root component, right? And so then it noticed that it had to go and use the routes component over here, right? So it goes into routes over here, and then route says, okay, I'm supposed to be using the layout, main layout as the layout for my page. So that will map into this main layout component here, which pretty much has nothing other than the body. So not that relevant. Uh, but then you will go ahead and figure out what is the route data to show uh, in, the, in the requested location. Now the requested location is just the root, right? So it's like, as, as we did this, it's just the root. If it's just a the root, then it means that it has to find a component that maps to that location. So that component happens to be home.razor because home.razor is the one that maps to the root. So it takes the contents of this component over here and it takes a page title, right? Page title, and it will go ahead and put it inside the head outlet that corresponds to the head element in our HTML over here, our app.razor. And then it goes again, goes for home.razor and takes everything else, right? Everything else becomes the body of the page. So in main layout, that's going to be the body here, right? And that is going to be set into the route via the router, right? So with routes, it's going to be set into our route view. And that means that it's going to be replaced exactly where we have defined routes inside the body, right? So that is how our home.razor gets, home.razor actually lands into the location where we had routes, right? And that's what shows the page here. Because otherwise, notice that the rest is just what we had at that razor, but some pieces have been replaced. And this is a key mechanism of, of Blazor, you're going to see that anytime we browse to different locations in the browser, you're not going to see the entire page reload, but since it is just a single page, only the elements that need to change, like this one and this one and that one, are going to be changing depending on where we navigate, right? So that is one of the essential aspects of Blazor. You may have noticed that anytime we start a debugging session or when we use .NET Watch, Visual Studio Code is going to open a brand new browser window. Right, so for instance, if I just go back into VS Code over here, and I'm going to just do Control C to stop my .NET Watch, and I'm just going to go ahead and hit F5. So F5 to start a debugging session. You're going to see that now we have a brand new browser tab, right? So now we have two tabs here. Same thing if I just stop my debugging session and go back to my terminal, and I just do .NET Watch again, right? So this opens a brand new browser window, as you can see. And so I find this not really ideal, 
because usually I just have one browser window, one tab, and in that tab, I see all of the changes that are being applied into my application as I start coding it. So how can we prevent VS Code from opening one more and more uh, browser windows over there? So it's actually very straightforward. All you have to do is the following. So if you just go back into VS Code and let me do Control C to stop my, my server. And then um, let me close this and let's go into our properties directory. So let's go into properties and into our launch settings.json file. Launch settings.json. Plug and I'll close that. And all you have to do is just go down here into the profile that you're using for running your application. In this case, that will be our HTTP profile over here. And then all you have to do is modify this one setting over here, launch browser. So all you have to do is change this into false over there. And that is going to prevent VS Code from opening the browser anytime you debug or use .NET Watch. In fact, I'm going to do the same thing for my other, uh, for my other profile for HTTPS. You, we're not going to be using it, but in any case, I like to have this consistent across uh, the different profiles. So I'll just do false here, right? And with that, we are going to see that if we do .NET Watch once again, right? So .NET Watch, then VS Code is not going to open any other browser window. As you can see, server has started, but no browser has opened. We still have the three tabs over there. In fact, I can close this and just go back to one tab and it is not uh, opening any browser windows. All right. So now that you know what is the structure of a Blazor project and how it maps, into the browser and also how to build, run, and debug your application. Let's move on into the next topic where we're going to go ahead and implement our actual game store Blazor application. Let's start the implementation of our game store frontend by defining the page where we're going to show all of the games that are part of our game catalog. And for that, we're going to go into our homepage. So let's go ahead and open up that homepage here in components and into pages and into home.racer, right? And let me collapse this for a moment. And here we're going to do just two things right now. The first thing is going to be, uh, we're going to change the title here. Instead of being game store, this is going to be actually the game catalog. So let's name it game catalog. And next, instead of having this H1 and this welcome to your new app, which we are going to delete right now, just delete it we're going to be defining the table where we're going to render the list of our games, right? So this is going to be a very standard HTML table, nothing fancy really. So we're just going to say table, all right? And then this table is going to have a bunch of headers. So here we're going to define the headers that we're going to need. So here's our T head. And then we're going to define a few headers for the different properties that we want to show, or the different columns that we want to show in our table. So this is going to be TH, First one is going to be, let's show the ID. And perhaps to make this faster, let me add a few of these TH. We're going to need this many, all right? Second one is going to be the game name, the genre, the price, the release date. And we're going to leave just one more for a few actions that the user will be able to use for each of the rows, all right? And after this, this head, uh, of course, we want to define the table body. So let's open up a section for the table body. And that is going to define the initial structure of our table. Now to see how this actually looks like uh, in a browser, let's go ahead and open up our terminal over here. And I'm going to switch once again into game store that front end, right? And I'll do that and watch just to see how this looks like initially. Okay, so it is running right now. So I'm going to switch back into my browser where I'm already in localhost 5002. All right, I'm going to just refresh this. And as you can see, now we can see our of our headers right there, right? And of course, down here is where we're going to see the table when we actually have data for it. All right, so back to VS Code. And let's now define what is going to be the model that's going to represent the games that we want to show in our game catalog page. Okay, and I'm going to collapse my terminal for a moment. Perhaps I can just do this. And now I'm going to go ahead and open my Explorer. And you can do that with Control Shift E. Control Shift E is going to open up your Explorer over here. And what we're going to do is to create a brand new directory, um, which is going to contain our models, our C-sharp models. So for that, it's actually going to be easier to do in the Solution Explorer. So let's switch into Solutions for over here. 
And this is the best way to create either folders or uh, files in your c -sharp projects. So let's right click at the root or at, at the project name over there. So right click new folder and let's create models. And then in models, we're going to right click and add a new file. And here what you're going to see is that you have the option to create different types of files that are supported for your project, right? So in this case, what we really want to do is to create a class. So let's click on class. And the name of this class is going to be game, game summary. Okay, and this is game summary because it's going to represent a summary view of our game that we want to display in our game catalog. Okay, now let's collapse this for a moment. The first thing that I'd like to do in this class is actually to fix the namespace because notice that the namespace here is game stored at frontend. But however, this class actually lives under, under our models directory. Because of that, I like to always uh, keep a consistency between the names um, the, the name the namespaces and the folders or the physical directory where that uh, this file lives. So to make this consistent, what I would like to do is to rename this into gamestore.frontend.models. Okay. Now another way to do this, if you don't want to do it manually, is by using this light bulb over here. So this light bulb is going to contain several code actions that are going to make your life easier as you, as you go through your code. So what you can do is just click over here. You can use this option that says change the space to then store that front end that models, right? So this makes it that it matches the structure that we have in the file system, All right? Let's close this. Now let's define the properties for our game summary. So this is going to kind of match what we did already in home.racer. So first thing is going to be an ID. So prop int. ID. Next property is going to be our name, game name. So prop string name. And here you're going to get a kind of a warning over here, which is very common when you define these string properties. And that is because the compiler is complaining about the fact that we have defined a string a property over here, but we have not defined any value for it, right? So it cannot just have a null value because it is not a nullable property. And there are a few ways to deal with this. Like for instance, you could, uh, for instance, define a default value for this property. You could say that this is a string that empty, for instance, and that will take care of it, right? Or another way to deal with this, and I'm going to remove this, is to, well, if you wanted to make it nullable, you could say that this is a string nullable like this, right? That will make the compiler also happy. However, we don't want uh, this name to be nullable. We should always have a name for, uh, for a game, right? So let's not do that. And instead of that, we're going to make it so that this property is going to be a required property. So required like this. This means that anywhere we try to instantiate or create an instance of the game summary, that piece of code has to define some value for the name, right? Either be, be the constructor or any way we define uh, the objects of the type game summary, a value has to be provided for name, right? And with that, as you can see, the compiler is, is happy, right? So let's keep going. Now we're going to be defining our genre. genre. And just like before, we have to define this as required like that. Let me scroll down a little bit here. Next is going to be our price. And this is of, it's going to be of type decimal because we're going to have, going to have a dollar values in there. And lastly, we have our date only release date. Okay, and I'm making it so that it is a date only because we don't really care about time, the time when the game is created. We only care about the date when the game is actually released, All right? And with that, we have defined the model that represents our games in our application. So next, we're going to see how to take advantage of this game summary model in our home.racer component. So let's start by going back into home.racer. And what we're going to do now is to take advantage of a feature of Racer components that allow you to have a section of C -sharp code directly in the same file where you have declared your HTML, right? So remember that here we have our table, but now what we're going to do is just go down. So let's go down over here. And just after table, what we can do is introduce a code section. You can do that by saying add code like this. And now everything that goes inside these curly racers is going to be a standard C sharp. Okay. And you can declare variables, you can declare functions, you can write really any kind of C sharp code that you need to. So we're going to take advantage of this section to declare our list of kings, right? So what we're going to do now is to 
declare an in-memory list of games using our game summary that we're later going to be using in our HTML to render that list. Now, keep in mind that the code that we're going to write now is just an initial version of the code, and this code is going to be changing as we refactor the application towards the final version where the list of games is no longer going to be in memory, but it's actually going to be pulled from the backend, right? So this is just a start. Now let's go ahead and declare that list. So we're going to declare it as private game summary. It's going to be a game summary array. Now, of course, it's not going to recognize game summary just like that because game summary lives in a different namespace, right? Remember that it lives in the game store, that front end, that models namespace. So to make it so that this component can recognize that class, what we have to do is just import the missing namespace. And we're going to do that all the way to the top by just importing the models namespace. Now you could go ahead and import the entire thing, right? So game store that front end that models, right? But you don't really have to do this. And that is because when we created this project, the .NET SDK template took care of defining this initial root namespace in our imports file. So if we go back, I'm going to do Ctrl Shift E to go to my explorer and notice this underscore imports that razor file that we have inside components, right? So imports that razor. This is a file that's importing a bunch of common namespaces that we may find super useful across different components. And notice that here we already have an import for game store that front end and even for game store that front end that components. So because of this, we don't have to be defining this part of the namespaces across any of our files because it is already understood, right? So it's good enough for us to just import models. Okay, and now that we have that, as you can see, the code section now recognizes the game summary class and we can proceed to declare our games array. So games equals, and so now we're going to go ahead and define our first element in the array and perhaps I'm going to leave, send this to the next line, okay. So it's going to be a new, all right, and so let's define the value. So the ID is going to be one. The name is going to be one of my favorite games of all time, Street Fighter Two. And then uh, for the genre, so this is going to be fighting. And then we have our price is going to be in this case, let's say it's going to be 19.99. And one thing that we're going to have to do here is to specify the proper modifier to tell the compiler, what kind of number is this, right? Is it a decimal? Is it a double? What kind of number is this? So that is why we see these squiggles here. And so an easy way to do this is by just introducing the M here, which makes the number uh, to be a, a decimal, right? Just so that the compiler does not get confused. And lastly, well, the release date, which it's going to be in this case for this game, is going to be a new date only to be 1992, 750, right? So that is our first game. And I'm actually going to close this array definition over there. And then of course we want to have not just one game. I mean, we want to see something in the patient in one, just one row is not going to be good enough. So I'm going to add two more games here. And for this, I'm going to be using my cheat sheet that we have in my other screen, just so that I don't spend too much time typing here. So I'm going to just paste that down here. All right. And so as you can see, now we have a second game here, Final Fantasy 14. I know it's my favorites, role-playing, uh, price $59.99, and here's the release date. And finally, we have the last game, FIFA 23, which is a sports game. Here's the price and the release date, All right? And so with that, we have concluded the definition of our games array. But really the more interesting thing is, well, how do we use this games array to render our list in our HTML table? So for that, let's go back into here, where we we're defining the table body, right? So here's the T body. And what we can do here is to use what is known as razor syntax to combine HTML with C sharp on the fly, right? So notice that so far, all of this section is really just standard HTML, right? This is just standard HTML. There's nothing fancy there. But what we're going to do is that by using the uh, add symbol, we are switching into C sharp, right? Directly from here. So by doing that, what we can do is the following. We can now introduce a control structure, right? Like for each, for each, in this case, we're going to say var game in games, right? Where these games is really the games object that we have defined in the code section. You can reference anything that you have in the code section inside your HTML over here that is now in Razor syntax. And from here, we can go ahead and start laying out uh, the actual table. 
So as you may know, for a table, we're going to need first a TR for each row. And then we have to declare each of the columns, right? So our first column is going to be, well, a TD. And in this TD, what we want to display is the game ID. Remember that we have in the headers, we have the first thing is going to be the ID. So that's the first thing that we want to display down here. So how to display that ID? So here's what we're going to do is use the, the what is known as an implicit razor expression, right? Which means that we can just type the at here and then notice, I mean, we went from HTML in T-Body, HTML into C-Sharp, then back into HTML, and then we're going to go back into C-Sharp by using implicit an implicit razor expression that allows us to just say here, game. Game, in this case, the ID, right? So we can use any of the of the properties of the game object that we have declared here or even of the games array that we have already, all right? So that's how we can define the ID. And then let's move on to the next one. And in fact, let me declare a few TD sections here for the rest of the elements. Provide just that much. And then um, we want to use the game.name and then the game.genre, the game.price, and the game.release date. Okay, and we'll leave this one empty here for, like I said, for a few actions that we're going to be introducing into our rows later on. All right, so, well, that should be good enough for us to see actually some data in our page. So what we're going to do is just, well, let's, let's go ahead and back into the terminal. And one thing that I wanted to show you here is that remember that we were doing .NET Watch before, right? So we were watching the changes, but this is something that you're going to notice uh, from time to time as you're working with .NET Watch if you decide to use it. And it is that sometimes the changes that you make to your code is really too much for .NET Watch and it cannot just on the fly re-render things uh, on the page. So in those cases, you may see this prompt here that says, hey, do you want to restart your application so that we can actually see the changes, right? And so you have the option to say yes, you say no, or always or never. In my case, I'm going to just say always uh, because I find that handy. So what is going to happen is that .NET Watch exits, as you can see here, the project is rebuilt and .NET Watch is going to restart. Right, and so if you go back into our page now, here, and I'm going to just refresh this. There you go, and perhaps I'm going to make it this a bit bigger so we can see better. Uh, here you can see that we have uh, our columns, and then now we have the ID, name, generate, price, and release date for each of our apps. Right. So as you can see, you can mix a C sharp with HTML in each of your Razor components to render the data that you have to render, and this is it is very dynamic. Right. However, one thing that you can notice about this page and about this table, of course, is that it is really ugly, right? So it's not really what you want to show. So before we start adding any more functionality to this page, what I'd like to do is to actually introduce some sort of styling here so that this actually looks like a nice table. So, well, before doing that, let me just go back into the original size. And next, we're going to see how to introduce the Bootstrap framework, the UI framework, to style much better this table. A great thing about Razor components is that they can use not just HTML and C Sharp, but also they can use CSS, right? Or cascade style sheets. And if you are familiar with CSS, you know that that's the right way to style all of your HTML pages, right? So what we want to do now is to use some CSS to improve the styling of this table. However, uh, we don't have to write that CSS by hand because there are great uh, styling frameworks already available that you can just uh, plug in into your website to get it looking much better in just seconds, right? Or minutes. So in this case, we're going to be using the Bootstrap Web UI framework, which you can find in the following page. Let me show you this, this page over here, getbootstrap.com. So this is the page for Bootstrap. You don't have to use Bootstrap. You could use any other uh, Web UI framework, but this is the one that you're going to find in most of the, or in the normal Blazor template, you're going to see that the site comes with Bootstrap. So I find it handy that you actually learn a little bit about this framework so you get more familiar with what you're going to find with a typical Blazor project, right? So how do we start using Bootstrap in our site? It's actually very, very straightforward. So from this page, what we're going to do is just go into the docs page, to the docs section over here. Let's go to docs. And here in the documentation page, what you're going to do is just scroll down into this section where it gives you the quick start. And in this case, in the second step is where it tells you how to introduce Bootstrap into your project. And really, all you have to do is just to import a couple of elements into your site. And the first one is this link here, which is the one that is going to import 
the bootstrap framework into your site, right? Uh, specifically, the cascade style sheet of, of, of bootstrap into your site. So what we're going to do is just copy, copy that line, and then let's go back into VS Code. And well, where should we put this? And let me collapse this terminal for a moment. Well, if you remember, Ctrl Shift E, let's go into, and let me collapse Fluxions for, for a moment. I like to do this in File Explorer yeah, here. Uh, remember that we have our app.razor file, which pretty much represents the root or the single page of our uh, single page application, right? Our Blazor site. So this is where we have the root HTML. So this is the right place for us to introduce a Bootstrap framework. You can see that we already are importing some style sheets here, right? The global style sheet and also the style sheet for game store that front end that styles. Uh, but now we can go ahead and also import one more thing here, which is the one that we just copied. I'm going to paste right here. So paste it there, right? So now we are importing all of the styles available in bootstrap.min.css, which are a lot, right? And so, of course, this, this, uh, this framework is versioned. So right now I'm using version 5.3.3. Uh, there may be a newer version uh, at the time that you take this course, uh, but for now we're going to be using this version 5.3.3. And then the next thing is that, well, Bootstrap also has some dynamic behaviors that are activated via JavaScript. So if you go back into the Bootstrap page, you're going to see that it also asks you to introduce the Bootstrap JavaScript. So I'm going to also do that. So I'm going to copy all of this. So I'm going to copy that back here. And the right place to introduce this is going to be just under our place or that web.js import inside the, inside the body here. We're going to go ahead and introduce that uh, other JavaScript, right? So this is the bootstrap, that bundle, that mean that JS that we're introducing here. So now all of our components in our Blazor application have access to both all of the styles available in Bootstrap plus any of the JavaScript functions uh, that are also available uh, in Bootstrap. All right. So now what I want to do is just go back into home.razor and we can start giving styles to our table. Now you may be wondering, well, how do I know what styles are available in Bootstrap? Well, that's very easy. You just have to go back into this same page. And well, the documentation is, is really pretty good. So you're going to find on the left side, there is documentation for everything that you can do with Bootstrap uh, across your site. Uh, now in our case, the main thing that we're interested in is tables. So I'm going to go into the table section over here. And this is going to tell you well, everything about the different ways that you can lay out and customize your tables uh, using Bootstrap. And as you can see, there are many, many things that you can do uh, with, with your tables. Now, I already know exactly how I want my table to look like, so I'm not going to be copying things from here, but if you want to get a better idea of where I got all the styles that I'm going to be using across this course, everything, everything really comes from here. So just take a look at this page when you get a chance. So let's go back over here. And what we're going to do is, well, let's start with the table styles. So we're going to go into the table element over here at the very top, and we're just going to say the following. So we're going to give it a class, and the class we're going to be using is table, because it is a table. And then we want to be using the table striped style. Let's also add some borders with table bordered. And also let's use the table hover to add some nice small animations as we hover across the table. Now let's also add a different header. Let's make it so that the header is actually a darker. So we're going to be using for the T head, we're going to be using class table dark, right? So let's start with that and let's see. Yep, so dotnet watch is doing this, its job. So if we go back to the site now, over here, you're going to notice that the, the, the page has already changed, right? So notice that this is now uh, a table, a, a striped table, right? So it is it has a stripes. Now the header is all black, right? It's all black over there. And so it's really looking like, like a table now. So this is, this is what we wanted to, to see. Now, a couple of other improvements that we can also do in this table is that, for instance, uh, the prices, I like the prices to actually be aligned into to the right side, right? Because these are prices. And if we have a price more than 100, uh, this is going to start looking a bit off. So how do we make the price to go into the right side? Well, all we have to do is just use a, another bootstrap a style. So if we go into the price header, so let's start with the price header. Over here, what we're going to do is just add a class of uh, it's going to be text end. And again, all everything about these this styles is available in the Bootstrap documentation page if you want to know more about it. Uh, and let's use the exact same 
style for the actual uh, rows, right? So a price DD class is going to be text end. And not only that, let's make it so that when we render the price, we want to see it uh, with the with the currency symbol, right? So so that it's very clear that this is actually a, a price that somebody has to pay, as opposed to just a random number. So for that, what we can do is just use the standard facilities of C# -sharp to format this number. So we're going to do to string, and then we're going to do in this case C2 to format this as a currency, right? And so if you go back here, you're going to see that indeed the price is now is now on the right side, right, of the column, and we have the currency symbol for every each of the elements, right? Okay, very straightforward. And then, well, one more thing uh, that we may want to do here is to add perhaps a little bit of space right between this table and the browser, right? So it's just completely attached to the left side and, and to the top and even to the right side, right? So perhaps we can add a little bit of space. So what we're going to do now is not touch the table itself, but let's actually go into our main layout. So let me do Ctrl Shift E. So you're going to find your main layout under layout, main layout that racer over here. And remember that this is the component that wraps the current active component that you're trying to show, right? So what we want to do is just to always have some sort of container element around our active component. Now for that, all we have to do is just define div, right? And this div is going to wrap the body just like that. And then for this one, we're going to be defining the container class, which is a class, again, a standard of a bootstrap that's going to be defining a div, a, a, a nice div with some nice uh, spacing around our body. So if you go back into the page now, you're going to see that now we have some space uh, on the left side there and also here on the right side. Let's now create the new Razor component that is going to act as the header for our page. So as you can see, here is our table and well, we don't have any sort of header right now other than the header of the table, but we want to have something that's going to show on top of every single page that we're going to be creating. So how do we introduce that header? So for this, we're going to be using what is known as a nav bar in terms of Bootstrap. But what is a nav bar and how do you create one of those? Well, really, if we go back into the Bootstrap documentation over here, I remember that, like I said, everything is uh, described over here. And so if we take a look at all of the documentation, we should be able to find a place that talks about the nav bar over here. Here's a nav bar, and this is going to give you all the information about how to declare these nav bars, like this one over here, right? So this is a nav bar, and this is the kind of stuff that we want to uh, show in our case. It's not going to be that complicated. We're not going to have menu items, but at least we want to have something that shows the name of our application, right? The game store, and that's going to be clearly separated from the rest of the of the data. Now, if we keep scrolling down a little bit. Um, the style I'd like to start with is actually this one here that says uh, as a heading, because we, all we want to show is something like this, right? Uh, just a title for our site. So how do we do that? Okay, so we know wh what content we want there. But first, of course, what we have to do is to create the actual uh, Razor component. So let's go back into VS Code and let's call Control Shift E to show the Explorer. In this case, we're going to be switching once again into Solution Explorer because it's the best way to create this, these new files. And the place where we want to place this uh, component is probably going to be inside layout because this uh, nav bar is going to show or it's going to be part of the layout for the entire site. So I'm going to right click on layout. I'm going to say new file. And if we scroll down in this list, you should be able to find one element that says razor component. Okay, so let's pick razor component. And the name we're going to give to this component is just nav menu, right? So nav menu. So let's go ahead and collapse this. And here's our, our component. Now notice that, uh, I mean, it's very similar to the one that we have already, right? To home.razor. Uh, it has an H3 here for the title and then it has a code section, but it does not have um, page directing, right? So if we go back into home.razor, we're going to see that home actually has a page directive here with a slash here, meaning that you can get to this component by just going to this route. In this case, it's just the, the root of the, of the site. But in the case of nav menu, we don't have that page directive. So this means that this is, is going to be a non-routable component, right? You cannot navigate to it, but you can define it and reuse it or, or nest it into any other component as you're going to see. 
Okay, so what is going to be the content of this tab menu? Well, we already saw that, right? So it's over here. So I'm going to just copy this from Bootstrap and I'm going to come back here. And well, we don't really need anything, anything that we already have here. So I'm going to just delete all of this and I'm just going to paste what we just got. All right. And so I'm just going to make one small change into this because I'd like to actually do a kind of a dark theme for our navbar. So for that, what you want, what you want to do is just say here, data BS theme is going to be dark. And again, all the documentation about this is in back in that bootstrap page. Also, I don't like to use container fluid. It's not going to render really well for our site. I'm going to just use container right here. And we want to change navbar into game store, right? That's going to be our, our title for the, for the navbar. Now, what we want to use, what we want to do is to reuse this component somewhere else. And that somewhere else is going to be our main layout that race. Remember, this is the, the one that represents the layout of the application. So to use that other component over here, all you have to do is just to declare it like this. So in this case, nap menu like that. And that should be good enough for us to be able to reuse that component in this other component. So you're just nesting that component. All right. And so, yeah, with that, we should be able to see the changes that got applied. So hot reload uh, already did the job. So let's go back into the page over here. And as you can see, our navbar is right there, game store, right on top of the, of the homepage. And it will show uh, for every single page that we create without us having to do anything else because it is part of the main layout. And uh, yeah, that's looking much better. Uh, one thing that I don't like is that, well, the table is completely connected to that header. So I'd like to have some space between that uh, navbar and my table. So to fix that, all I'm going to do is just go back here and actually, let's go into home.racer. And at the place where we declare our table over here, we're going to be using one more bootstrap style that allows us to, to have some margin uh, from, the, from the top element, right? So in this case, I'm going to use the margin top or empty. And then you can assign a few numbers here. I'm going to be doing empty three, which means use three, three spaces from the top element, which in this case is going to be the number. So you go back to the site. Over here, you're going to see that now we have this a base right there. Okay. So you could add more or less depending on uh, how much space you want to see there. But I think this is looking fairly good so far. Okay. Now, if you go back into our code over here, I mean, you saw that we have all of this uh, C sharp code to define our data or our in memory uh, array of games here. So in order to have a better separation between the code that we use to render our home component and the data itself, and also to prevent this file to just be too big, what we're going to do is to introduce a brand new c -sharp class that's going to act as a client that can be used by our home component. So let's see how to do that. Let's go ahead and open up our Explorer view, Ctrl Shift E. And while being in Solution Explorer, Solution Explorer, we're going to go ahead and just right click on game store that front end. We're going to say new folder, and this one we're going to name clients. Right, so this is the place where we're going to be declaring this type of client classes. And the first client we're going to need here is of course the client to manage our list of games. So add new file, this is going to be a class and let's name this one games client. All right, and then let's collapse this. And just like we did before, the first thing to do is to fix this thing space. So I'm going to use a light bulb here to say, and perhaps I actually need to step into the namespace so then let's click again and yeah, change the space to game store that front end that clients. Great. And well, what we're going to do here is to uh, introduce our games list into games client, right? So for that, let's go into home.racer and let's go ahead and copy, copy this array to copy it into games client. Okay. Now, just like before, uh, this file is not recognizing game summary because it is in a different namespace. So I'm going to do control dot here, control dot, uh, which is a way to access the code actions and without having to click on the light bulb. So control dot. And so what you can do is just select using game store dot front end dot models, click on that. And now notice that namespace has been imported at the top of the file. Now, one change that we're going to make here, we want to turn this, uh, this array into a list. And that is because 
this class is going to be dynamically changing the contents of this uh, collection of games, which is not going to be a static anymore, right? So with an array, it's going to be a bit more complicated. So what we're going to do is just to turn this into a list. The home component is going to still use an array, but inside here, we want to use a list. So let's switch this from game summary array into list of game summary, just like this. And then what we want to do is to define some sort of method in this class that our home component can use to fetch this list of games. Because notice that it is a private member here. It cannot be accessed from the outside. So how do we access this list? We don't want to grant direct access to that, to that list. Uh, we always want to have some sort of a method that provides kind of curated access to the, to the data that we have in this client. So for that, we're going to be declaring just one simple function. So public, now this is going to return actually a game summary array because the array is working just fine for our home component. Uh, and then the name is going to be get games. And we're going to just directly point into games dot games dot to array. Right now, there are a couple of things that we can improve here also. Uh, first thing is that you can notice that there is a little suggestion here that says that the collection initialization can be simplified. And that is true. What I'm going to do is actually just click on these three dots and then just do control dot. And we're going to be switching into using a collection expression, okay? Which is another way to uh, go from your list into an array by using this expression that you can see here, right? Little improvement on C sharp. Another thing that we may want to improve here. So let me see these three dots here. Uh, it is suggesting that we should make the field read only, which makes sense because there is not going to be any place uh, across our code here where we reconstruct the entire list, right? We are not going to be assigning anything, a new value into this list. We will be adding and removing elements from the list, but we're not going to be destroying and reconstructing the list. So because of that, we want to add the read only modifier into this list, which protects it from being modified later on. Again, this, this prevents the modification of the actual games object as opposed to the modification of the elements inside the list. Awesome. So now that we have this games client ready, what we're going to do next is uh, see, well, how can we use this games client to populate our list of games when our home component is getting initialized? So let's go back into home.racer. And what we want to do is, well, well being in the code section, well, we want to declare an instance of our games client. Like I said, there are different ways to do this, and we're going to see more about that later in the course. But for now, we're going to just declare it as a standard variable in the code section. So it's going to be a private games client. It's going to be the client. And of course, uh, notice that uh, it is not recognizing the client because it is in a different namespace. So let's go back over here and let's use, let's import the namespace clients like that. Okay, let's go back here. So now it can recognize the games client. And this is just going to be a new instance, just like that. Now our game summary array is now coming from the client, right? It's going to come from there. So there is no need to keep having this, this entire array declared here. So I'm going to use remove all of this, right? It's now just game summary games. Okay, I'm going to just close it here. And well, since we're not going to have an instance of this game summary array when the component is initially created, I'm going to see in a second where we're going to create the instance of this. Uh, what we have to do here to avoid this warning is to actually define it as null. Because it is expected that it's going to be null when the component is just created. But well, where do we actually uh, initialize uh, this array? Well, that's going to require the use of one of the lifecycle uh, events and methods uh, in Blazor. So there is a specific life cycle of events in Blazor applications. And I can actually show you a little bit about that here. So I'm going to pull up this page from the Blazor documentation over here. And what I want to show you is that if, uh, well, this, what page is this? Let me show you. This is a page, ASP.NET Core Razor Component Lifecycle, right? So this is the this part of Blazor documentation. And so what I'm going to show you is that there are a series of events that occur for every single Blazor component, right? So as you, as you can see right here, when your component is instantiated, right? So it is created and then it's going to go through the set parameters async uh, method. So that's a method that you can use to receive parameters into your component, which is something we're going to learn 
uh, a little bit down the discourse, but we're going to explore that later. Uh, but after those parameters are set, if you have any parameters, then this method uninitialize async is the method that is going to be invoked. Right? And there's also this concept of first render and uh, and after render here, which we're not going to talk about uh, right now. But uh, as you can see, there's an entire life cycle and you can learn more about that life cycle over here. But the method that we care about right now is this one called uninitialized. Not async yet because we have not learned about asynchronous parameters just yet. It's just going to be uninitialized. So let's get back into our code. And what you can do now is just override that method. So we're going to say override, and then we want to use, uh, so void on initialized, right? So right there. So this method is guaranteed to execute after your component has received parameters. If it has any parameters, it, it just have to execute. Blazor knows about that. So this is a, a right time for us to go ahead and initialize or populate our games array. So what we're going to do is just say, well, games equals client.getGames. There. All right. Now, uh, you may also notice that there is some sort of a warning in our HTML. So let's go up here. So yeah, we do have a bit of a warning here about games. So what's going on there? Well, going back to the fact that uh, now games is a nullable, right? So remember that game summary is a nullable array. So what this is doing, and the compiler is alerting us saying, hey, uh, if I happen to come through this code here and your games uh, array is null, uh, then well, we're going to have a problem here, right? Uh, so, and that's going to ha actually happen. So to prevent this, what we can do is to add a conditional statement to do something uh, in the page when the games array has not yet been initialized, right? So to do that, all we have to do is the following. So let's once again use Razor syntax to introduce a conditional here. So we're going to say just on the top of table, we're going to say that if games is null, if our games array is null, we're going to be displaying something special. Here. Um, we're going to take a look at that in a second. Uh, but uh, if not, if it is not null, then we're going to go ahead and actually show our table. Okay, so I'm going to just close this down here under table. There. Okay, and perhaps we can move the table a little bit. Just one tap there, so it looks better, All right? So only if games has a, has a, an instance, we're going to go into this section. Otherwise, we are going to have this if over there. Now notice that the warning is gone, right? So we don't have any more warnings that we have over here. It's gone because there's no way to get into this section with the games being, right? Because we are preventing that over here. So one um, conventional thing to do here is to present some sort of status of what's going on to the user, right? To saying, hey, I am kind of loading the page, so just give me a second until I get all the data ready. So for that, well, there are many ways you can do this. Perhaps what we can do is something like this. So it's going to be a paragraph, and perhaps with an EM like that, we're going to just say loading, right? So if the games is not is, uh, instance is not there, we're going to show loading. Otherwise, we actually render the table. Awesome. So with that done, well, let's see if yeah, hold reload has been working for us in the background. So let's go back into our page over here, and we can see that the data is right there. And then, well, what we can do is just refresh the page to make sure that everything is working as expected. So it is, right? Everything is working as expected, no issues. About component initialization, what we may want to do is just, just for the sake of, of being um, safe, let's stop uh, .NET Watch so that we can see the very, very first time when the component boots, make sure that it is working properly. So I'm going to go ahead and do .NET Watch once again. All right, and then I'm going to go ahead and just refresh my page and it is there. Now, of course, we cannot see this loading screen just yet because it is too fast, right? It, everything is working in my machine. And so there's nothing to be waiting for. The instance is created right away. But later on, as we start integrating with the backend, that is going to become much more interesting and important, right? But for now, we are done with this part. We are done with the rendering of the list. And what we want to do now and next is to figure out a way to allow the user to create new games in our application. Let's go back into Visual Studio Code. I'm going to collapse my terminal for now. And what we're going to do is to create a brand new Razor component that we're going to be using both for creating new games and also later for editing existing games. So let's go into our explorer, so Control shift e and I'm going to be doing this in our solution explorer. And by the way, let me just close all these tabs. So let's collapse this and let's collapse the layout. We're going to be doing this in our pages uh, directory. 
just next to home.racer. Let's right click on pages. Let's say add new file. And just like before, we're going to be using a racer component. And this component is going to be named edit, edit game. Okay. Now let's go ahead and collapse this. And in this, uh, in this new component, we're going to first set up a few basic things. And the very first thing is going to be, well, how is that our users are going to reach this component? So this has to be a routable component. So we need to specify the page directive to tell place or what is the route that can be used to reach the component. So we're going to say page, and then the route that we're going to use here is going to be edit, edit game, right? So now our users can go into that location and Blazor will render this component. Next thing we want to specify here is some sort of page title, right? So we'll do, we'll use a page title component. And for now, this is just going to say new game. Later, we're going to see how we can change this so that it dynamically either shows new game or edit game, uh, depending on if the user wants to create or edit. Game. And then for our H3, we're actually going to change this into new, new game. Okay. Now, the next thing we're going to need is some sort of model that we can use to bind to the form that we're going to be using here to capture the user input, right? And we cannot quite use the model that we have already. So if you go back into our model folder, we have the game summary uh, model already. And it is actually very similar to the one that we need here, but the, the key difference with this model and the model we actually need for editing is that we're not going to be capturing the genre uh, as a simple string, but the user is actually going to select the genre from a drop-down list. And for that, we want to capture the genre ID, not the genre string. So because of that, we're going to be creating a brand new model that is going to be slightly different from game summary, but it will be able to capture the genre ID. So to do that, let's go back into Explorer. In this case, I'm going to actually use, use the File Explorer because in File Explorer, I can just right-click game summary and I'm going to right click in models and I'm going to say paste. So copy paste. So I'm creating a copy of game summary and this is going to be game, let's call it game details, All right? So this is game details. Let me collapse this, game details. Okay, now game details, like I said, is very similar to game summary, but let's see. So we have an ID, that's correct. We have a name, but we don't want to have a string generate. Like I said, we want the generate ID. So let's rename this into Generate ID. And even when the generate ID is actually going to be a number uh, in integer, in this case, we're going to leave it as a string because the string type is going to tie very well into the way that we bind things into our input select component uh, in the next set of steps. But we don't actually need it to have a, a value all the time. So this one can be nullable and, it, and there's no need for it to make it required. We could make this guy as an int, all right? Uh, however, we're going to have problems where we want to present the initial value for that drawdown list, which is going to be really empty. And the int is only going to translate into a number of perhaps zero and zero is not going to map well into the drawdown list. Because of that, we want to use a string, a nullable string that is going to allow us to have an initial null value in that drawdown. And later the user can select the value that they want to use, right? And the rest is going to be the same in these uh, game details. Now with this game details uh, model ready, we want to go back into edit game. And then in the code section, we're going to define what is going to be the instance of the game details object that we're going to be binding into the form that we're going to be defining very soon. So let's define private game details game. Okay, and let's define a get and set for this one. And this is going to be a new, we're going to create an initial instance of these game details. And of course, I mean, uh, it is not getting recognized here. So we have to make sure that we import the right namespace. I'm going to say here, add using models, right? So it recognizes game details. And then we do need to specify some initial values, at least for the name and the release date, uh, and specifically for the name, because the name required, remember that it is a required string, right? If we don't uh, specify any initial value, look at what happens here. So if we do this, we're going to have a problem here. Right, it's going to say, hey, non-null level property game must contain a non-null value when exiting constructor. So we have to set this as new, but it's not enough to just say new because we have to specify something for game details.name, right? 
So let's go and specify something for the name. So the name, well, it's just going to be good enough to say string.empty. And then we probably don't want to start with a release date that is just a random date. We probably want to start at least with the current date, the day of today. So release date is going to be date only from date time. And it's going to be date time, actually date time, that UTC now, right? So that is going to be the initial uh, object that we're going to be using in the form that our user is going to fill in, right? With an empty name and a release date of the day of today. So next, we're going to see how to actually define this form that the user is going to use to input the values. Now, how do you define a form in HTML? Well, that we can actually take a quick look at that from the Bootstrap documentation once again. So here I'm back in Bootstrap in the documentation page, and I, I am in the form section here, the forms overview section. And you can take a quick look at how you normally define the forms by looking at the examples here. For instance, here's a very simple form to, that captures email address and password, right? And there's a button and a checkbox here. How is it defined in a normal HTML? It is right here, right? And so as you can see, it's a standard form element, and there's a bunch of divs to define uh, each of the uh, inputs that are going to be captured from the user and even a button at the very end. So what we're going to do is to just copy this, and we're going to go from this into an actual form that uses Blazor controls to capture data, right? So I'm going to just go ahead and copy this to clipboard, copy everything from the clip to the clipboard, and then back in our Razor components, I'm going to paste that right here, right? Now, from this example, I'm just going to keep one of these divs here to start and not even the button. So just going to keep one of the divs and then we are going to be replicating what we're going to do for one of our input controls. We're going to be doing the same for the others. Now, as you can see, in the standard HTML, we start with the form element over here. However, in Blazor, there is a much better option, which is known as the edit form component, right? So that component is great because you can actually bind that component into your game object that we have, we have over here in such a way that whatever the user enters is going to be stored directly in our game variable. And on top of that, we can perform nice validation on the inputs of the user before they send the data back into the server, right? So let's go ahead and change this form clause into edit form, okay? So we should also close down here, edit form. And then there are a couple of things that you should specify for all of your Blazor forms. The first thing is going to be, of course, the model. What is going to be the model object that's going to be bound to this form? So model is going to be, in this case, we have to use Razor syntax to point to our game object over here. So we're going to say add game, okay? And the next thing is that you have to specify what, you have to give it a, a name, some name for this form. But this is because there could be multiple forms uh, in your page at any given time, and you want to make sure that Blazor does not get confused with which form you are posting back into the server. So we're going to do form name, and let's just name it edit game. So now we have the form, and we have to start specifying what are going to be the input controls in that form. So what we have here is just a new div that starts with some margin bottom, so three spaces in the bottom, just so that it's not completely tied to the next control, right? And then we have a label, standard label. Now. Uh, we're going to give it a, a name to the input that we're going to be creating here. So this is going to be for our name input, okay? And the a actual text is going to be just name. Well, this is going to be the name. And then we're going to make, make a few changes here. First, we're going to get rid of this last tip. We're not going to use that. And then instead of using input here, we're going to be using another component provided by Blazor, right? So this one is name input, input text, right? So this is the control that you can use to capture just standard text in your form. Now, let's also close this at the very end, like this, okay? So it's an input text. And then we don't need a type here, but we do need an ID. So let me actually grab the ID from here and into just overwrite type with ID. And the ID for this one is going to be name, okay? So now for this to work properly, uh, just make sure that this name that you have here, right, the ID that you have here, it matches the label that you specified here, right? So this is the label for the name that you, the, the control that's named name, right? With 48, right? So those have to match. Okay, now we're not also not going to use uh, this one right now, uh, but the last thing that is very important to use here is 
the bound property because we know that we are bound into the game uh, model over here. But we need to tell it uh, to which property on that game object we are going to be binding this input text control uh, or input text component. So for that, what you want to do is use the bind value attribute here. And for that one, you're going to specify in this case, game dot just like that. And with that, you have specified your very first uh, input, uh, input component for your edit form. Now, just like this, let's go ahead and define a few more components for all of the data that we have to capture from the user. So I'm going to add three more of these. So one, two, three, by just copying the first one, right? And so let's fill in the value. So the next one is going to be the genre. Now the genre is interesting. This is not going to be an input text. This is going to be an input select, right? So this is input select. And then this is going to be, the ID is going to be genre, right? Let's make sure that we use the ID here over there too for the label. The bind value is going to be into game dot genre ID, right? Remember that we're using this model specifically because we need the ID. We don't need the, the name of the genre, but the ID. And the class for this one is actually going to be form select. Now for this input select co uh, component, we're actually going to have to have something inside the input select. I mean, the options for the input select, right? But for now, uh, we're going to just leave it empty and we're going to look into how to fill in the, the values for this input select later on. Uh, for now, let's just define that and let's keep, keep moving on so that we can finish all of the components for this form and we can see how they render in the page. So next one is going to be ID price. So it's going to be the price. Let's make sure we use price here and there. Let's put price here. This is going to be not input text, but this input number, this input number, and it binds into game.price. Okay, and for the last one, this is going to be our release date. Okay, release date over here. We're going to put also release date. The bind value is going to be, again, game dot release date. And uh, the actual control is not going to be a date. It's going to be a, a, an input text, sorry. Uh, it's going to be an input date. So input date is the right type to use here because we're dealing with a date object. Okay, and so by doing that, I mean, we have some basic layout for our four control. And I think it's a good time to go ahead and test and see how this control actually looks like in our front end. So let's go ahead and, well, let's see. Okay, so .NET Watch at this point is asking us to actually restart the entire application because the changes were just too hard. So let's go ahead and say, I'm going to say A for always. So it's rebuilding and .NET Watch is going to restart now. Okay, so it restarted. And let's head back into a page. Well, there's nothing really different here. And well, the thing is that we have created a brand new component, right? So now we have to navigate into that new component. Now, what, what is the address of this new component? Well, if we remember, and let me collapse this for a moment, the address is slash edit game. So let me copy that. Let's go to the portal and let's put that here. So edit game. So I'll hit enter. And as you can see, now we are in our brand new page where we are able to collect the name, the genre, the price, and the release date. And notice that for the price, there's even uh, facilities to move up and down the, the numbers and the release date is able to, I mean, you can select from this nice calendar over here, right? These are nice facilities that come by default with Blazor. Now, I think that uh, the width of, of the controls here is just a bit excessive, right? I don't think we want to have a form that just goes all the way to the right. So let's make a small change to, to make it so that this lays out a little bit better. So let's go back here. And all we're going to do really is just to use both the row and the call elements of Bootstrap to lay out things a little bit better. So I'm going to add a div uh, just at the top here, which is going to have a class of row. Okay, so these rows are the standard way that you lay out rows uh, in your Bootstrap layout. Okay. And then under the row, we're going to add one more thing, which is going to be another div with a class, which is going to be uh, a call. But not just a normal column, it's going to be a column, um, a medium column of size four, right? So I'm going to close that and let me close the div over here, there. And let's move, let's tap this edit form a little bit to the right, there. So I, it not, not reads better. Um, now, one thing to notice is that in Bootstrap, you can have up to 12 columns, if I'm not wrong, 12 columns. 
Uh, and so by using four here, I'm saying that I want pretty much less than half of the page, right? Thinking of the horizontal page uh, to render my form. So now let's go back into the, the portal. And as you can see, now our form is only using this left side of the page, right? So this will be the four columns that we're using right now. If we set something like six, perhaps it would be all the way to this mark over here, right? Or, and if you don't do any numbers, well, it just goes all the way to the end. But this is looking uh, just fine for me. Okay. Now, but uh, as you can notice right now, uh, we don't have any values to select here for our generated drawdown list, right? So next we're going to learn how to go ahead and populate the values for our generous. In order to populate our generated drop-down list that we have here, we're going to need one a brand new model that we can use to represent our generous with an ID and a name. And then we can create a, a list of those uh, generous that we can bind to the drop-down list. So let's go ahead and start by defining our brand new model. So back in Visual Studio Code, we're going to go ahead and do Ctrl Shift E to open our explorer. And in this case, we're going to switch into our solution explorer because we're going to be creating a brand new file and it's going to be under models. We're going to right click and we're going to say add new file. This is going to be class and the class name is going to be genre. Okay. So this is genre. And then uh, uh, as with everything else, we want to fix the name space. So let's go ahead and select change name space to game store that front end that models like that. And then for our properties, we only really need just two properties. The first one is going to be our ID. And the other one is going to be a required string, which is going to be the name, right? Very simple model, but very useful for our drawdown list. Now, just like we did with our games, we also need some sort of client that our edit game component can use to retrieve that list of genres. So let's go back into Explorer and we're going to go ahead and create a brand new client. So let's right click on our client where we only, only have games client right now. We're going to right click, new file, class, and then this is going to be our generous client. Okay, let's collapse this. And then once again, let's click on the namespace and then let's click the light bulb and then change namespace to game store the front end dot clients. Now, just like with the other client, we're going to start with an in-memory list of generous. And later on, you're going to see how this client is going to evolve to be able to pull those generous from the back. So for now, this is going to be just a private read only. Generate this is going to be just a general array. And that is because we're not going to be modifying this list, really, at least not in memory. It's just going to be static for the process of the dropdown, right? So it's going to be named generous. And then here is where we're going to be defining the values for our list. So I'm going to start by saying, well, this is going to be a new genre, and this is going to be, let's say, ID1, and then uh, the name is going to be Fighting. That's going to be our first genre. Now, of course, we want to have a few of them, and I don't want to type all of them. So let me actually grab them from my cheat sheet on the other screen. Let me scroll down here. I'm going to just paste them under this first one there. Okay. And so now we have five genres, right? We have fighting, role-playing, sports, racing, kids and fun. Okay. Those are the first, uh, the five genres that we're going to be using for our purposes here. And then lastly, in this same class, we're going to be defining just one method, similar to the one that we did for the games client, which is going to be used to retrieve the list of genres, right? So public, and this is going to be turning a gener array, get generous, and then uh, we're going to go ahead and point this into generous. All right. So with this, we are pretty much ready to start taking advantage of this generous client in our edit game component. So let's head back into edit game and let's get down first into our code section here, where right now, as you remember, we all, we all, the only thing that we have is the definition of, of our game object that we're binding into our form. So now what I want to do is to define a few new things. First thing is going to be the instance of our generous client, right? So it's going to be private generous client, generous client, okay? And then we may need a 
uh, a namespace import for Jenner's client. So let's go all the way up here. And so of course we need to add here using clients, right? So now we're using that namespace, we can use the Jenner's client and we're going to just create a brand new instance of that client here. The next thing we're going to need is uh, some variable that can hold that list of generous so that we can bind it to the dropdown list, right? So let's go ahead and define our private genre generous. And just the same thing as with our home component, we want to make this genre array nullable because we will use a specific life cycle moment in the creation of our component to actually set a value for the genres. But initially it is just going to be null. Now, where do we initialize this? Was well, just like we did with our other component. That's going to happen in the uninitialized method. So let's go and define override void there. And here, well, all we have to do is just say that generous is going to be generous client dot get generous. Let's also define this as protected, okay? Because we are overriding the method that's defined in the base class. Great. So now we have our generous populated when the component is initialized, right? So now we have to take advantage of it in our HTML, specifically in our form, in our input select right here, where we're going to be letting, letting the user select the gender. So how do we take advantage of it? So as you may know, uh, the way that you define these, uh, the options or the values for your dropdown in HTML is by using uh, the option element. So that's exactly what we're going to do here, but we're going to do it a little bit dynamically. So first, let's define one option. The first option is really going to be the option for the initial value, just uh, so that we can tell the user to please go ahead and select some gender. So for that one, the value is actually going to be just an empty string so that it binds nicely into our null value of our game details object initially. Uh, but for the actual displayed string, let's, let's say select a gender, right? So that's that. But what we really want to do is to actually populate the drawdown list with the actual values. So for that, all we have to do is a, do a simple for each uh, loop here. So we're going to do for each, and then we're going to see var genre in generous there. And here we're going to be defining, well, one option for each of the available values there. So I'm going to actually just copy this option from here over here. And then the value for each option is going to be at generate.id, right? Because that's a value we want to capture in the, in the game model that we are using in this form. We want to capture the ID. Um, and for what we're going to be showing to the user is actually going to be the name. So generate that. Okay. So that's how you can dynamically populate in HTML the values for the genres by combining both C sharp and HTML, so it's just razor syntax. Now we have the same issue that we had with uh, the home component, right? So it is complaining here because it says, hey, you may run into a null reference here the very first time that the page is loaded. So, but we already know how to deal with this, right? So all we have to do is introduce some sort of if else here to deal with the case where the generous may be. Null. So we're going to say at the top here that if generous is null, we're going to do something here. We're going to just go ahead and say, uh, well, we're going to put another, well, a paragraph, just like we did before. Paragraph, and in the paragraph, we're going to go ahead and do an EM, and we're going to say loading. And otherwise, we're going to do else, and then here's where we're going to have the section to render the table. So I'm going to just take this closing curly brace all the way down here, there, and then I'll just take this tap to the right, so it hit bit better, and then with that, we should see that uh, our generous uh, object here is no longer displaying any sort of warning because we can only get here if generous actually has some value. All right. And yeah, I mean, with this, we should be ready to show those generous. So let's go ahead and let's see. Uh, looks like hot reload succeeded, right? After a few failures, uh, it has succeeded. So we can go back now into our page over here. Let's see if we can see those now. We may want to, we may need to reload this. Yeah, there it is. After reloading, we can see that we have the initial value of a select a genre right there. And then if we open this, uh, yeah, we can see that we have our five different genres that the, the user can see. 
right? There it is. Great. So this is great. Uh, and uh, if you go back to VS Code, um, one thing that we may want to do is to start figuring out a way to not have to declare the same namespaces uh, for every single Razor component. So here in editgate.razor, we have defined that we're using clients and models. And then if we go back into, let me go into our file explorer here, back into home.razor, you're going to see that all the way to the top, we are defining the same thing, right? So using clients and using models. So what we want to do is to not have to redefine this every single time. And there's a very nice file that we have already actually seen, but uh, we can actually start taking advantage of it uh, from here on to not have to do this. So all we have to do is just go to Explorer and then let's go into our imports.razor file, this file over here, right? So import.razor. So this is the file that contains the common imports uh, across the entire project. So anything that we add here, any namespace that we add here is going to be already defined for every single component across the project. So really all we have to do is to introduce the missing namespaces. So the first one here is going to be our client namespace, right? So I'm going to just add here, add using, and store, and actually intentionally going in this line 10, just so that things are in the right order, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be in the right order, but I think it's good to have things uh, sorted. So game store that front end that clients, and then the other one is going to be game store that front end that models, right? And just by doing this, what you're going to notice is that, well, Blazor is active, actually alerting us now, saying that, hey, this clients is already uh, defined. You don't have to define it again. Same thing for models. So, well, all we have to do now is to remove those two. Same thing for edit game. We can go ahead and remove those two. All right. And just by doing that, we can uh, now use uh, anything in the clients and models and spaces and in any component without having to uh, have this using directive at the top there. And if we go back into our page, and let me make sure that the yeah, hot reload is just fine. Let's go back into the page. Uh, we should see that everything is working as expected. So I reload and it's, it's still working just fine. So there are no issues here. Awesome. So with that in place, uh, what we want to do next, of course, is to, well, submit this data from the, from the browser back into the server, right? So that we can actually add this brand new game into our list of games. So for that, the first thing we're going to have to do is just go back into VS Code into our games client, right? So here is our, let's see, if we go into all the way up, clients, games, clean. Let's start here, all right? I'm actually going to close all the other files so we can focus on this one. Now, what we're going to need is to have some sort of method in our games client that we can use to add a new element into our games uh, list that we have here because it is private, right? So the only way that any component is going to be able to add something here is by having some public method that can uh, add a new element into this game list. So let's get down here and let's just at the very end, let's add a brand new method. So let's name this one uh, add game, all right? Now, the, the type of the game that we're going to receive here, remember that it is game details. It is not a game summary because game summary is one that we use at the home in the home com component. Uh, but in the edit component, we're using game details. So we're going to receive a game details game. Okay. And then what we want to do here is to, since, I mean, as you can see, what we have here in our list is, is a list of game summary. It is not a list of game details. So somehow we have to transform these game details into a game summary instance before before we can add it into the list. So let's go ahead and try to do that, right? So let's go ahead and say, well, var game summary. It's going to be a new well, game summary. Okay, and for this one, we have to define a few properties, right? So we need the ID. And so what ID are we going to be defining for this brand new game summary? Well, for now, since it's just um, an in-mode list and it's just a step towards later using some data from the backend, uh, for now, what we're going to do is just get the count of our games list, so games.count, and then we're just going to add plus one, right? Just to keep things very simple. And next property is going to be our name. So name is going to be from game.name. And then we have the genre. So genre. And then thing is, well, if we do game.genre, we're going to notice that here we have a bit of a problem, right? Because game summary uses the, uh, the genre as a string, because that makes sense to show in the homepage. 
but uh, the game details have the generate ID, which is what we captured from the user, the ID, and it makes sense. That's what we need. So before we can complete the definition of this game summary, we're going to have to find a way to take the, the ID of the generate that the user selected and transform it into the description of that genre or the name of that, that genre, right? So to do that, we're going to do a couple of things. The first thing is that here in this same class, we're going to be defining one more array. So not just the games array, but one more array, which is going to be for our genders. So just under our previous array for games, we're going to be defining the following. So file the read only, gender array, and then uh, this is going to be the genders. And then to retrieve the list of generous, which is pretty much static uh, at this point, it's just a simple list that comes from the games client. What we're going to do is just say, well, this is going to come from the new generous client, generous client. And then we're going to see dot get gems. Right? What this is doing is just creating an instance, a temporal instance of generous client. And then we invoke the get generous method to re retrieve all of the generous right away into this array here. And with that, what we can do is to well, use the list to find the corresponding generate to the one that has been specified by the user in the game details. So now in add game, what we're going to do is just say the following. So before we define, define the game summary, we're going to say var genre equals genre stat. Let's use a single in this case, genre single. And then we're going to say genre m, where genre.id should be the in that parse of game that generate ID. Okay, so that way we can go ahead and uh, find, right? So find the generate in this generous collection, the generate that matches the ID that has been specified in the game details that the user selected. Now there's one small problem here. Once again, this is about null levels, right? So this is saying that, well, generate ID may be null. So if you try to pass it as a null into in that parse, you may have a problem there. So there are a few ways to deal with this, but what we can do just to be safe is to, well, make sure and validate that generate ID is not new. And a very handy way to do this is by using the following. So you're going to do argument exception dot throw if null or white space. So here we're going to be passing in our game dot generate ID, right? And this single call is going to make sure that if generate ID is null, which it should never really be null, but if it is null, then uh, we're going to just throw an exception and then there's no way to get to the next line if that's the case. So if we do get here, the generate ID must have a value and that's why the warning has gone away. And with that, well, now we know the actual generate that was selected by the user. So we can go down here and say, okay, so this generate is not going to be game that generate ID, it's going to be game that uh, generate that me, right? So now we have the genre, and then we can continue with the price, which is the price and release date is game that release date. Awesome. And now that we have our game summary, all we have to do really is just add it to our list. So games.add, and then we add the game, the new game summary. Great. So now we have the ability to add new elements into our games collection. So now it's time to go back into our component and see how to take advantage of this method. So let's go Ctrl Shift E and let's go back into components, edit game that register over here. And the first thing that we're going to do is to define a method, a C-sharp method that we're going to be using in this component to invoke the add game method from the games client. So let's go down into our code section and perhaps at the very end, just after our, our uninitialize, we're going to define a method that we're going to call private void handle submit. Okay, when the user submits, this is a method that's going to be invoked. So, well, how do we use the client? All we have to do is just say games client, which by the way, let's see if we have defined client already. We don't have a games client here, right? So we should define it. Sure, it's not here yet. It's not here. So let's go ahead and define that. So private games client, games client equals New. Okay, so now we have an instance of the games client we can use here. So now we can say games client dot add game. And the game that we're going to add is the game that the user has been populating uh, via via binding uh, over here, right? It is this game instance here that is bound to the form, which is the model of the form. So we're going to put that here. Okay. Okay, so now this method is ready to go ahead and do the submit. 
but we need to tie or connect this method to our edit form. And doing that is actually very straightforward. All we have to do is go back into the definition of our edit form right here. And we're going to do is just say here, after the form name, we're going to see on submit, we're going to invoke handle, handle submit. Okay. So that's going to make it so that whenever we post this form back into the server, then the handle submit method has to be invoked. However, of course, to be able to post the form, we need some sort of uh, UI element, right? So basically a button or a link or something like that. So let's go ahead and add a button into our form so that the user has a way to actually submit his uh, inputs, his or her inputs. So down here, just before ending the edit form, we're going to be defining our button. So it's going to be a button. And then this is going to be of type submit. Okay, and let's close things like that. Uh, we may want to add a little bit of styling here so it, the, that it looks nicer. So let's do it. Class is going to be button btm primary. And once again, all this styling is uh, well documented in the bootstrap page. So you can go there and there are many variations of the buttons that you can use to show different colors and styles, right? Okay, so we are almost done here. So we have the button, we have the logic to add the game. All of that is great. But there's one missing piece, which is the one that we have to add in our code section. And it is that we have to tell Blazor what is going to be the object that's going to contain all of the data entered by the user, right? And so, I mean, yes, we have bound uh, the game object into the form. So it knows that game is the model. However, it doesn't know how that, that data is going to arrive into the server when the user submits, right? And let me actually fix this a little bit like that. And so since we're posting this via a form, we have to tell Blazor that this object here is going to contain all of the populated data. And the way to do that is by using the following attribute on top of your game declaration here. We're going to say supply parameter from form. Okay. Otherwise, if you don't do this and you just post a form, Blazor is not going to know that game should have all of the values that have been posted uh, as a form into the server, right? So when this arrives to the server, because we have this attribute, players are going to populate this game object with all of the data entered by the user, all right? And so, yeah, that is the last piece, really. And we are ready to go ahead and test out uh, this edit game component. So to do that, what I'd like to do is actually to set a breakpoint so we can do a, a little debug session here, just to confirm that the game can be added to the list. So I'm going to go all the way to the end, Line 63, I'm adding a breakpoint there. And I'm going to open up my terminal. I'm going to stop my .NET watch. And instead of that, I'm just going to, well, I'm going to close my terminal. And I'm going to do F5 so that we enter debugging. And I'm going to do this because uh, we want to just make sure that the elements, uh, the new game is getting added to the list, right? You don't have a good way to verify that otherwise. So yeah, we are running right now. I'm going to go back into my page over here. I'm going to just go ahead and refresh it, refresh it. And I can tell, tell right away that we missed one small thing over here, right? So the button is there, but it has not. So let's go ahead and fix that quickly. Let me go ahead and just stop debugging for a second so that we can add the actual text, text to the button, right? So right here on line 37, all we need to do is say, say, that's all it is. So I'll do F5 again, okay? And I'll go back into my page over here. I'm going to refresh this. And notice that the button now says save. Great. Now I'm going to enter some data, right? So let's say I'm going to add a new game here. It's going to be Super Mario Bros. 3. It's going to be a kids and family game. Let's say that the price is $9.99. And let's say that the date, uh, yes, we may want to go a few years back, right? Let's say 1995, February 13. So let's hit on save. And let's see what happens. So now, as you may notice here, VS Code has stopped into our handle submit method right there. So that's awesome. And then let me collapse this for a moment. Let's see that the game object actually was able to receive from the form. It received all the values right into the gender ID. We have, we don't have an ID, uh, an ID that makes sense. Uh, we have the name, we have the price, and we have a release date. Everything as we entered in the form. So that's great. So I'm going to go ahead and step in into against client so we can see that we can go to the next step. We already find that it's not null. We should be able to find the generator here. 
Yeah, so we found that this is Kitson family, and then we define our game summary, and the game summary has been added into our games. So as you can see, now we have four elements where the last element, number three, is the one that we just added. So yeah, so the element has been added. It is part of our list. So the logic is working as expected. So I'm going to go ahead and just hit on continue and then going back into the browser. Well, uh, sadly, nothing else is really going to happen at this point because we don't have any more logic to say, for instance, go back to the home page or do something else after the zoom. But that is okay. Uh, and I think that what we should do next and what we're going to see next is, well, how do we add uh, some perhaps a button into our home page to a home component so that we can navigate from that home page and into this, uh, this edit game component so that the user can enter a brand new game. So if you go back into home, so let me just clear the URL here, just, just go to home. What we want to do is to start with is to have some sort of a button here, right? That allows us to just jump into that edit game component. So how to do that? Well, that's actually very straightforward. If we go back into our VS Code over here, what I'm going to do is just to stop our debug session. I'm going to clear this breakpoint. And I'm going to, well, let's go ahead and just close all of our documents. And let's go into home.racer. Okay, let's start here. And really, all we have, what we have to do is to uh, find a good spot in the page to add a button with a link to go into the other page. So right here, I'm going to add a brand new div, okay? So it's going to be a new div and let's make sure that this has some good styling just so that uh, it is not completely touching the top of the page. So we're going to say margin top, let's use uh, two spaces or two points in there. And then what we're going to do is use a simple anchor, standard HTML anchor like this. And this anchor is going to have the text of new game, but we're going to also style this anchor Right, so it's going to be a class with the button class, so that it shows like a button and not just a simple anchor. So PTN primary, and we're also going to give it the role of a, a button, and finally we're going to give it the href so that it knows that it has to go into our slash edit game component. All right, and so with that, that should be good enough for us to just at least be able to go from home to edit game. So let me go ahead and open my terminal once again. I'll go into terminal, I'll delete this one here, and I'll do .NET watch in the game store that front end directory. Right, website started. Let's go over here. I'm going to refresh this. And sure enough, we now have our brand new new game button over there. So we can click on that. And now we are in the edit game, page, which is great. Now, before we add the logic into this page to be able to just go back to home after we save, one thing that I'd like to highlight is what's really going on behind the scenes in Blazor because it's a bit unconventional. So, and to demonstrate that, what I'd like to do is just to open our browser dev console. So for that, let's just hit F12. So F12 key in the browser. And then as you remember, this tab here, this elements tab over here is the one that's going to show us uh, what is the, well, the HTML that is, is being shown for the current page. Now, one thing that I want to highlight here is that we are not really reloading pages as we go from one page to the other. Everything is really happening in the same page, or at least looks like it is happening in the same page. So let me show you this. Let's go to back to home. Okay, so here we are in home, and I'm going to open up this element here, and then we have the body there. So if I just click on new game, notice, that the only elements that change it were the title here and the, 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 the data that was inside this container, right? So let's go back into home, right? And notice how these elements flash, right? So it's going to flash this and it's going to flash also this here. So once again, I'm going to click on new game and these two flash, and if I go back, they flash again. So what's really happening is that the page is not reloading and this is a built-in feature of Blazor. What's happening is that Blazor is intercepting our request to go and get a new page. And instead it's just sending a fetch request into the server. So to retrieve the HTML of the updated page and merge it into the current HTML of the current page. And perhaps if we go into the network tab over here, if we go into network tab over there, that might be a little bit clearer. So let me see if I can expand this a little bit. And what I'm going to do is just, well, let's clear everything here. So the network tab is the one that's going to show every request that goes from your browser and into the server. 
So yes, I just go refresh this, right? I'm going to reload this. Um, that is showing all of the, re the, th the things that got requested from the server to load the very first time, right? Once again, I'm going to clean this, refresh, and notice that everything is loading. Right? So see here we have our actual get to retrieve the home page, then the get to retrieve the CSS, this other CSS, the JavaScript, the browser refresh, which is for .NET Watch, and then even more uh, CSS and JS, right? So all of this had to happen to load the initial page, the home page. However, if we now, let me close this. If we now click on new game, so click on new game, notice that we did not have to reload all of the files, right? We don't see a bunch of new requests for all the files. Really the main thing that we see here, let me see if I can expand this a little bit to the right, is this call over here, this one here. So this is the one that got added as we navigated from home and into this new page, plus a little bit of SVG changes here, but really this is the main one. And this, as you can see, is a fetch request. It is a fetch request into the location that's going to, that we have asked, right? If we click on edit game, we're going to see that this is actually taking us into the new page, right? Into edit game, as it says right there, but it's a fetch request. So we are not trying to reload the entire page. And instead we're just saying, hey, just bring me back the HTML of that other component, and I'm going to merge it into the current page. So that is a very nice feature of Blazor. That allows you to have a website that behaves as a single page application and with less reloads. And it's going to be way more evident as you have an application that's actually deployed, right, in the web, and you want to see how it behaves much better than a traditional website, All right? So yeah, that's something I wanted to show you there. It's very interesting to understand. Now let's go ahead and close this. And well, let's see how to uh, modify this page here so that we can go back to the home when we are done with saving the changes. So what we want to do now is just go back into edit game. So let me go ahead and open up this and close that. So back into Explorer, we're going to go into edit game that racer. And what we want to do now is to use one of these built-in services of Blazor that have been automatically registered for you just because, well, you're using Blazor components. And one thing I wanted to show you there uh, before moving on is this page over here. So this is the documentation page for Blazor uh, Dependency Injection. And we're going to be talking more in detail about Dependency Injection in just a few minutes. But uh, in this page, what I want to show you is that there are a few services that are very common and that you, can, and that you want to use uh, across your different components, right? And between them, you have the HTTP client, you have the, I mean, the HTTP client, which is the one that you can use to talk to external services from your application. And then you have the IES from time, which is the one that you can use to uh, interact with JavaScript from your Blazor application in the client if you need to. And we also have this one here known as the navigation manager. So this is a built-in component that is registered for you by the Blazor framework. And then, well, of course, you can use to navigate from one component to the other, okay? And so if you go back into our application, that component is actually registered when you go down into Program CS. Remember, in Program CS, we're doing a bunch of things, but among them, we are doing this line here, which says Add Razor Components. So, because we're doing this, we have the ability to take advantage of that navigation manager, right? So, how do we use it? Well, let's just go back into Educating that Razor over here, and what we can do is use this directive that is named as Inject. Right, inject, and once again, we're going to be talking about the base injection in just a few minutes because I want to show you one more thing. But uh, here you can just say, well, I want to use the navigation manager component and let's just name our local instance navigation manager, right? And um, just by the, by, by the fact that we're declaring it here, Blazor is going to take care of creating an instance or making an instance available for us at runtime and so we can just go ahead and use it without having to construct it explicitly. So because of that, what we can do now is just go all the way down into handle submit. Remember that this is the method that we use to add the game to the list. And now after this line, what we can say is navigation manager that navigate to, and then you can go into any other component into in your application. In this case, we just want to go to the root. So I'm going to put that over there. All right, so that should make it so that when we click the save button, uh, we want to go into the home page. Uh, now going back into our edit form over here, just after the submit button, what we probably want to do is also have some sort of cancel button, right? Because what if the user doesn't want to save and just want to go back to home? 
So because of that, we're going to be adding a second button over here. And this one's actually going to be just an anchor, a simple anchor, just like this. Let's name this one cancel, but let's make it so that it looks like a button, right? So it's going to be row equals button. And then the class, well, it's also going to be a button, but this is going to be a button secondary, right? Just so that it looks a little bit different than our primary. All right. And so with that done, we should be able to, well, go back into our homepage after the user clicks on save or clicks on cancel. So let's see that we have Yard .net Watch is up and running. Let's go back into the page over here. And sure enough, now we have our uh, cancel button here and our save button should also be able to go back to the home. So if I just click on cancel, let's try cancel. And I think I forgot something important about that cancel button here, which is the uh, the link where it should go. So in fact, yeah, we should add here after the class, we're going to say href equals, which is going to be just the root, right? So href equals that. So with that done, let's go back now into our page and let's try the cancel button here. Yeah, sure enough, it takes it back into the home page, And then, well, let's see if we can actually save a game, right? So let's go back into new game and I'm going to enter once again, Super Mario 3. And then uh, it's going to be Kids and Family. Let's say price $9.99. And then let's just keep the current date uh, because why not? And let's click on save to see what happens. I'll click on save. And if this happens to you, right, which is very unexpected, and it, ha it has happened to me in the past, this is because really our .NET watch tooling and the whole reload of of .NET was not able to handle the fact that we have injected a brand new service into our page, right? So there's nothing wrong with the code. And really all we have to do is just go back to VS Code. Then let's open up our terminal. Let's go ahead and do Control C, Control C to stop .NET Watch. And then we're just going to do .NET Watch once again, restarting the entire thing. And so that's going to make it so that ASP.NET Core and Blazor understands the brand new service that has been injected into our edit game component. So now we're going to go back into this page. Perhaps we can do back. Let's see if we can do back. Yeah. So we are back here. And now let's try saving this once again. So hit on save. And sure enough, the error is gone. Right. And so now that is great. We went back to the home page. But of course, one thing that you're noticing here is that in this uh, table here, we don't see the new game. So where is Super Mario 3? We still have the first or initial three games. So something is going on here, and that something is absolutely related to the dependency injection feature of, a, of Blazor and APNet Core that we are not taking advantage fully just in our application just yet. So it is time to go and go back into slides and understand much better what is dependency injection and how is it going to work in Blazor and in ASP.NET Core? To understand what dependency injection is, let's start by looking at two classes, my service and my logger. My service uses the log this method of my logger to log messages to a file anytime my service performs an important operation. Since my service uses some of the functionalities of my logger, like the log this method, we say that my logger is a dependency of my service. Now, in order for my service to start using my logger, it creates an instance of my logger in its constructor. And after that, you can start calling the log this method. At first glance, it doesn't look like this presents any problems. But consider what happens when the authors of my logger decide to slightly modify it so that a new my file writer object needs to be passed on this constructor, because that's where the output file is now defined. The required changes look simple to implement, but they reveal a few important problems. My service is tightly coupled to my logger in such a way that anytime my logger changes, there's the need to also change my service, as it happened here when the constructor started requiring a my file writer instance. My service needs to know how to construct and configure the my logger dependency, like is the case here with the my file writer object, which needs to be configured with an appropriate file to send the output logs. This makes it hard to test my service since unit tests 
won't be able to mock or stop my logger. An output.log file will always be created, which would slow down tests and this assuming that the tests have access to a place to write files to. Fortunately, there's a better way to do this using what is known as dependency injection. Let's go back to my service and it's my logger dependency. My service it still uses the log this method, but this time my logger is not explicitly constructed by my service. Instead, my logger is passed in as a constructor parameter. My logger is injected into the my service constructor. This way, my service doesn't need to know how to construct or configure the logger. It just receives it and can start using it right away. But if my service doesn't construct the logger, who does it? Well, SVNet Core provides the iService provider, which is what is known as the service container. Your application can register my logger and any other dependencies with iService provider during startup, which is typically done in your program.cs file. Then later, when a new HTTP request arrives and your web app needs an instance of my service, the service container will notice its dependencies and it will go ahead and resolve construct and inject those dependencies into a new instance of my service via its constructor. This enables multiple benefits for your application. To start with, my service won't be affected by changes to its dependencies. It doesn't matter how many times the constructor of my logger changes, there is no need to change my service. Moreover, my service won't be creating instances of my logger, so it doesn't need to know how to construct or configure it. If your application uses minimal APIs, dependencies can also be injected as parameters to your minimal API endpoints. Finally, dependency injection opens the door to using dependency inversion. But what is dependency inversion? The dependency inversion principle states that code should depend on abstractions as opposed to concrete implementations. Let's bring again our my service class and its my logger dependency. Currently, my service depends directly on my logger, which allows it to write logs to an output file. But let's say that now we are moving to the cloud and we need to start sending logs to some sort of cloud service. For this, we would like my service to start using a new cloud logger class. We could modify my service to receive and use a cloud logger instance instead of a my logger instance. However, what we can do instead is modify my service so that it depends on a new iLogger interface instead, which provides all the required login functionality. Then we can have both MyLogger and CloudLogger implement this new interface. With this, we are decoupling my service from the logger dependency, allowing it to use MyLogger, CloudLogger, and any future logger implementations without ever having to modify my service. The only thing that the different loggers need to do is to implement the interface that my service depends on. In terms of the code, this is how you would now inject the logger into my service. So the main benefit of using the dependency inversion principle is that dependencies can be swapped out without having to modify the class that uses them. But also, it is now much easier to test my service since the logger dependency can easily be mocked out or stopped. And finally, your code is now cleaner easier to modify and easier to reuse. Now, before we start using dependency injection in our code, there is one more important concept to understand, which is the service lifetime. We now know the basics of dependency injection in ASP.NET Core. We know that on startup, your application will register the dependencies, like my logger here, and later, when an HTTP request arrives, iService provider will resolve, construct, and inject an instance of my logger into a new instance of your class, my service in this example. What is not clear is what happens when a new request comes in. Should iService provider create a brand new my logger instance for the new request, or should it reuse the same instance? What if another service that also has a dependency on my logger needs to be created in response to a new request? Same my logger instance or new my logger instance? The answer to this lies in the service lifetime, which you configure when you register my logger with iService provider. There are three available service lifetimes, 
So let's take a look at each of them. Let's say that my logger is a very lightweight and stateless service. So it's okay to create a new instance every single time any class needs it. In that case, you would register my logger with the add transient method. When the first HTTP request arrives, the iService provider, as usual, will resolve, construct, and inject a new instance of my logger into my service. However, when a new HTTP request arrives, iService provider will construct and inject a brand new instance of my logger, which has nothing to do with the first instance. Furthermore, if there's any other service that participates in any of these HTTP requests and also has a dependency on my logger, it will also receive a brand new instance of it. So transient lifetime services are created each time they are requested from iService provider. What if my logger is a class that keeps track of some sort of state that needs to be shared across multiple classes that participate in an HTTP request? In that case, you would register my logger with the add scope method. Here, when an HTTP request arrives, the iService provider will again resolve, construct, and inject a new instance of my logger into my service. But if there's any other service that participates in that same HTTP request and that also has a dependency on my logger, it will receive the exact same instance of this dependency. However, if a new HTTP request arrives, the service container will create and inject a brand new instance of my logger instead, totally unrelated to the previous instance. So, scope lifetime services are created once per HTTP request and reused within that request. Finally, let's say that my logger is not cheap to instantiate and it keeps track of a state that should be shared with all classes that request it during the entire lifetime of your application. Then you would register my logger with the add singleton method. As usual, when an HTTP request arrives, the iService provider will resolve, construct, and inject a new instance of my logger into my service. And if there is any other service that participates in that same HTTP request and that also has a dependency on my logger, it will receive the exact same instance of this dependency. But furthermore, if a new HTTP request arrives, the service container will once again provide the same instance of my logger to any of the classes that request it. And it will keep doing so until the application is shut down. So singleton lifetime services are created the first time they are requested and reused across the application lifetime. Now that you understand the dependency injection pattern and the different service lifetimes, let's get back to the code and see how we can use these concepts to reuse a single games client instance across our Blazor components. With our new understanding of dependency injection and service lifetimes, let's see if we can fix our Blazor frontend so that each of the games that we create in the edit component actually become part of the list that we are showing in our home component. So let's understand better what's going on uh, currently. So here we are in the home component. And what I'm going to do is go down into our code section where we are populating our games list right here, right? So here I'm going to just place a breakpoint right there. And let's do the same thing into edit game where, well, we actually already have a breakpoint at line 65, which is where we add a game, right? Into the games game. So now let's go ahead and start a debugging session. So I'm going to do control J. Uh, it's currently in a .NET Watch session. I'm going to do Control C to stop the .NET Watch. I'm going to close this and I'm going to do F5 to actually start the debugger. All right, so debugger started. And now let's go back into our front end and let's see what happens when I go to a new game. So let's go to new game and then let's enter something, right? So Super Mario 3 and then uh, yeah, we said Kiss and Family 999 and just the current day. So I click on save and if you go into VS code, okay, so of course, here's where we're going to add that, uh, that game. Let's see if we can see inside games client. So yeah, notice that currently we have a list of three games over here, right? And so if I just step over this line, step over, now games client is going to have, of course, four elements, right? So zero, one, two, and three, the four games. So this looks fine. 
And now we're going to navigate back into the home component, right? So I'm going to hit play. And never mind this exception, this is totally normal uh, currently. Uh, let me collapse this so you can see better. This is a normal navigation exception that happens when you go from one page into another page. And it's more evident when you're not doing asynchronous programming. So this is fine. So I'm going to just hit a uh, continue. And now we are back into home.razor, right? And in the on initialize because we are initializing the home component at this point. However, if I look into client here, you will notice that games only has three elements, right? Where is the fourth element? Why is it not there? Well, the reason is because notice that we are defining one instance of the games client right here in home.razor, we are creating an instance and in edit game.razor, we are declaring, well, another instance, games client over here. So the instances that we're using in each component are different. And because of that, we are never going to be able to actually reuse the instance that we need that has all the data from one component to the other. So this is never going to work, right? So let me hit play. And then, well, as expected, if we go back here, it, it is not going to be there. So here is where we want to start using the dependency injection pattern so that we can reuse the same instance of that game client across the multiple components, right? And so we have already actually looked at how to use dependency injection uh, in, a, in, in one place already. So let me actually stop this, stop this. And so if you remember, we are doing it in edit game all the way here. We are doing it for the navigation manager, right? Like I said, navigation manager is getting registered in program CS when we do add razor components. So underneath, this is adding services, including that navigation manager so that we can use it in edit game. But now what we want to do is to register our own game client via dependency injection, right? So how to do that? So all we have to do, and let's start with home.razor, right? So home.razor, let's go all the way up. And what we're going to do is just use the uh, inject directive to say that we want to inject an instance of games client over here. Let's just name it client in this case, right? And then if we go down here into the code section, the change that we're going to make here is that we're no longer going to be creating an instance of game client. So let's remove these lines, right? And instead of that, we are going to be using the injected client. So I'm going to be using client here. And by the way, a convention that, I'm, that I have seen so far uh, for everything that, that you inject is that it will follow this thing is Pascal case uh, casing for the injected objects here. So that's what I named this client with a capital C, right? So the client has been injected here and we are using it in this. But of course, we want to do the same thing now in edit game. And let me actually just copy this injection into edit game. And let's do it just under navigation manager, right? I think in this case, we're going to have to name it actually games client, right? So games client. And so this games client is the one that we want to use down here. Okay. Instead of creating the games client here, we're going to remove that. And when we do handle submit, we're going to be using our new injected games client. Great. So that allows us to inject the services into these components, but we also have to register the services, right? It's not enough to just inject them. Somehow these have to be registered so that the service container, i service provider knows about them. So let's go into program CS. And just like we're doing this line here to add a razor components, we're going to be using the .NET APIs to register our games client. So for that, all you have to do really is just say builder that services, and then you have to choose what is going to be the, the lifetime scope that you want to use for this specific type. Now, since this is just in memory, and since we want to use it across the entire application, right? Uh, we're going to just go for a singleton, right? So meaning that the same instance is going to be available, just one instance across the entire lifetime of the application. So we're going to say add singleton and then games client. Okay, the type of scope that you use here, as you know by now, is going to depend on what you want to do, what kind of object you want to register here. Uh, but in this case, the singleton is going to go work great. All right, so with that in place, well, let's go ahead and uh, let's see if we still have those breakpoints. So let's see, do we have the breakpoint? Yeah, so we have the breakpoint here and we have the breakpoint there. So, well, let's try this again. So let's start a debugging session, five. All right, let's go back here. And let's create a new game. Again, Super Mario Bros. 3, Kids and Family, 999, let's say 1995. And then let's hit on save. Okay. And notice that this time, and I'm going to close this, 
this time we have an instance of games client here. It's still with the count three, right? Count three. But notice that we have not created it explicitly, right? It was registered in program CS when the application started. And then the service container is taking care of constructing and making that instance available for us in edit game when we have requested it, right? So as we go into the next line, I'm going to just step over here, step over. Games client now have four, well, kind of, count of four. Let me see this once again. Count of four, makes sense. And now we're going to navigate back to the home components. So I'll click on continue. So again, this exception is expected, that's fine. And then we're going back into the home component and let's inspect this client now. So this client actually has count of four, right? Count of four, because it is the exact same instance that we use in the other component. It is a singleton, so it lives across the lifetime of the entire application, regardless of what component you are. Of course, that as long as the application is alive. Okay, so if we just hit continue now and we go back into our browser, we're going to notice that our brand new game is now showing up right here. Okay, so that is how you can take advantage of the dependency injection uh, pattern in your Blazor applications and really in every ASP.NET Core application. It's a key component that is used all over the place in ASP.NET Core and that you should take advantage of it all over the place too. And so, well, just like we did that with our games client, we also probably want to do the same thing with our generous client, right? We should follow the same pattern. So let's go back into here. Let me stop our debugging. I'm going to go into edit game now. And let's go ahead and also inject our generous, generous client like this into edit game. And then let's go down here. Today we are declaring a generous client here. We're going to remove that. And now here where we are initializing the component, we're going to be using that generous. Now we're also uh, using an instance of generous client, of course, over here in our games client, right? So in games client, you can see that we are currently doing this, right? To get the, to get the collection of generous in games client. Uh, we could fix this. I mean, we could inject an instance of generous client into games client, but I don't think it's that relevant really, because like I said, eventually we're going to modify this entire client so that all the data really comes from the backend. So we're not going to worry about this. Uh, really, it doesn't make any difference. So let's just leave that as is, and let's see how things are working with our injected generous client in edit game. So at this point, I'm just going to do .NET watch as usual. So let me delete this and then um, let's do .NET watch in our game store that front end directory. All right, application started. And then of course, if I refresh this, notice that the game is gone, which makes sense because it is just an in-memory list, right? So there's nothing holding in the backend for, for, with that list. But if we say new game, we are getting this, which makes total sense because we forgot to register generous client in program CS, right? So let's go back here and let's go into program CS and let's do exactly the same thing that we did with games client. Let's copy this down here. It's going to say generous client, right? Generous client. And then we may need to restart our .NET watch uh, session here because like I said, it can get a little bit confused when we just start playing with injected services. So let me start .NET watch once again. All right, so let's go back into our browser over here. So back to the home. Now let's go to new game. Notice that this is working properly. We can see all the genres here, right? And we do Super Mario Bros. 3. Okay, Kids and Family, 999, uh, any date, save. And notice that the game has been added. So everything is working as just. All right. So that is working just fine. But well, there's one, one other thing that we should consider when we go into our edit uh, component here. And this is the fact that we're not currently validating what happens if the user uh, just decides to have invalid data here. So if you just hit save here, so this is going to actually fail because we are not entering any values for the name. We have not selected a gender and, and a bunch of uh, things that make no sense. So next, we're going to see how to add proper client-side validation into our edit form. So if you go back into Visual Studio Code over here, and let me close this for a moment. Uh, if you go back into EditGame.Racer, you'll remember that the moment when we actually add our brand new game into our uh, collection of games is right here, right in handle some bit, when we use the games client to add the game to the collection. And of course, we could come here and start checking what are the values for the different properties of this game over here. But in Blazor, there's a better way to do this, and it's a very simple way actually to do this, which is by using what is known as data annotations. 
And for that, what we're going to do is just open up our Explorer and let's head back into our game details model. Okay. And so the idea of data notations is that you can annotate the different properties of your model with the specific rules that are relevant for that property. For instance, in the case of the name, we probably want to make sure that it is always entered, right? So it is a required property. So in that case, what you can do is just add a new line on top of it and just add the following attribute, required. That's all you need to add. Now, this attribute lives in the different namespace. So I'm going to do control dot here, so control dot, and then I'll do using system.componentModel.data annotations. Okay, so that new namespace has been imported at the top, as you can see. And so from here on, anywhere you bind this model in, into any form, um, Blazor is going to make sure that the user enters a value for the name, right? And probably we want to do the same thing for our gender ID, right? We want a gender associated, so I'm going to paste that over here. Now, there are multiple possible data annotations that you can use uh, in your Blazor applications. Uh, for instance, another thing that we could require is that the name should have some specific uh, length, the string length. And so for that, what you can do is use the string length data annotation. So string length, and let's say that the name should be no more than perhaps 50 characters, right? So no more than that. And if there's a more enter into the field, it's not going to be a valid form. And lastly, let's do something about our price. So the price, let's say that our, our rules says that we're never going to really have a video game that costs more than $100, right? And so we want to make sure that the users do not enter a number greater than that. So for that, we can use the range attribute. So what we can do here is to enter what is going to be the range that is a valid or allowed for this property. In this case, of course, we don't want negative numbers either or even a zero. So there's not going to be free games. So the range is going to be from one and into 100, right? So that defines what is going to be the valid range for the price. All right. So that is what you have to do in terms of your model. And then, uh, well, let's head back into ADGame.Razor. So there are a couple of things that we also have to do in the form itself. I'm not going to remove this breakpoint. We don't need it anymore. So let's go up into the form and let's locate our edit form, which is right here. So in the form, you have to do a couple of things. The first thing is that you have to let the form know that it has to perform this validation when the user is trying to submit the form into the server. And to do that, we have to change this uh, member here that says on submit. This had to be changed into on, on valid submit. And let me do the right casing, on valid submit. Okay. So this here is going to make sure that handle submit, the, the handle submit method that, that is in our, on our component is only going to be invoked if all of the data in the form is valid. However, for this to actually work, it has to be combined, oh, has to be combined with a, another element here, which I'm going to add right here, which is known as the data annotations validator. All right. So you have to add both the, the data annotation validator and uh, you have to use on valid submit for that validation logic to kick in. All right. Now let's see how we're doing with uh, Donet Watch. Okay, it's good. So let's go now into the form and let's see if this is actually working, right? So here we're back in the form. And now let's try to go ahead and save this form once again, now that we have the validations in place. So I'm going to click on save. And as you can see, now the form is highlighting all of these fields in red because they don't have any valid values, right? And so if we do want to go ahead and submit something, we do have to start entering something, let's say my, my game. And if I click on save again, notice that the red is gone from here, right? Meaning that this is now a valid, a valid field, right? Now, one more thing that we may want to do here is to actually show some sort of uh, text that describes what is wrong uh, with the field in the case that, well, we are not entering valid data, right? So what is wrong with this field? What is wrong with the gender? What is wrong with the price? And so for that, we can do the following. So let's go back into the form over here. And what we're going to do in this case, just after input text for the case of the name, we're going to enter a validation message. And for this validation message, you have to specify for which field this validation message is for. So in this case, we're going to do, we're going to say for. And here you want to use, you want to use a lambda expression like this. And this is going to be for game.name. Okay. So that specifies that 
we are going to have a validation message that's going to trigger if the name is not passing the, the data notation, the rules that we define for the, for the name. Now I'm going to copy this one because we're going to do the same thing, in this case for the generate ID, and we're going to put that just after the input select here, but you have to change this into game that generated. And same thing for the price. Okay, just after our input number, I'm going to put it over here, game dot price. All right. Now in this case, uh, Blazor is alerting us that yeah, this change was just too much. So do we want to restart the app? I'm going to say A for always. So that's that's fine. Okay, so the app is going to restart now. All right. So restart it. And so now I'm going to go back into our form. Okay, and perhaps let's see if we can, yeah, it's refreshed. And so now if I try to go ahead and just save, notice that uh, all of the actual error messages start showing up, right? And also notice that we did not have to write the text for these messages, right? They just they just were inferred based on the uh, validations that were set for the different fields. So the name field is required, general ID field is required, and the field price uh, must be between one and a hundred. Okay, so yeah, that is looking great. And uh, one more thing to notice here is that perhaps this message that we have here uh, is not it's not the best message because it talks about a general ID, right? But but for a user, like what is a general ID, right? So we are really trying to set the general here and pick one of these values. But general ID does not really make mo much sense for the user. So what we can do is just to customize this message a little bit so that it makes more sense. So for that, really, all we have to do is if we just go back into our game details, is that here for the required uh, attribute in general ID, we're going to add an error message. So we're going to say the error message has to be what we type in here. So this is going to be generate general field is required. Okay, just that simple. All right. And so let's go back to the browser. And then if we now try to save this, yeah, looks like it is not just not working. So this has to be .NET Watch. It's not catching up with the changes. So I'm going to do stop and restart .NET Watch. All right. And so let's refresh the page and do continue. And so sure enough, now the message is correct, right? So the gender field is required. That's what I was saying that .NET Watch sometimes may not work as expected. So, so keep an eye on that. Uh, so yeah, so now we have to write a message over there. And the last thing that we may want to add here is some, some, some sort of summary of all of the validation errors in the form, because this form is simple, right? It has just four, four inputs, uh, but what if you have 20 or 30 or a lot of inputs, right? So you may want to have a central place in this form to tell the user everything that's not working properly. And for that, what we can do is use the a, the validation summary element. So let's go back into the form over here and let's go into edit game. And we're going to put this just under data annotations validator. We can put our validation summary element. Okay. And with that in place, let's see if we try now to save this. Notice that besides the individual uh, texts, the alerts for each field, now we also have this nice summary at the top that clearly tells us uh, about everything that is going on and this is just wrong with this with this form. All right, and so and then well, is, is just to confirm that everything is working uh, properly now, what we can do is actually to enter the right uh, values, right? So let's say Super Mario, Mario Three, okay, get some family, nine ninety nine, and then uh, we was going to do nineteen eighty five, right? Why not? And so I'm going to hit save now and notice that the game was successfully added. So the submission only worked at the point where all of the data was valid. Okay. So with that, uh, I think we have our creation or game creation experience in good shape. And what we want to look at next is on how we can enable editing one of these existing games uh, also in the same place or form. The first thing that we need to figure out is how to open up our editing form with some data already populated, right, for the specified game. And the first step towards that is going to be to work uh, once again in our game client so we can retrieve the details of one specific game. So let's go back into VS Code 
And at this time, we're going to work with our games client. So let me close a few other tabs so, so that this is not so much crowded. All right, so games client. What I want to do is to add a brand new method here that based on a game ID, it can return the game details for that game ID. All right, so we're going to go all the way to the end. And let's define this method as public game details get game in ID. Okay, so to find uh, the, the game itself, is, it should be pretty straightforward. So all we have to do is just say var game equals games. We can use the find method in the collection, find. And for find, we're going to say that we want the game where game.id equals the ID that was passed in, right? Now, the next thing that we're going to need is the generate that corresponds to this game. Because remember that this one here is going to be a game summary object. And the game summary does not have the generate ID. And we do need to return the generate ID as part of the, of the game details uh, back to the, to the caller. So for that, what we're going to do is the following. So generate is generous that in this case, we're going to be using single. And we're going to say that we want the generate that matches the name of the genre of the found game, right? So it's going to be string that equals, and we're going to use equals because it is uh, easier to do a case insensitive comparison by using the equals method here. So genre that name is going to be compared to game that genre. And we also want to specify here our string comparison ordinal ignore case, all right? And perhaps I, I should do this in a next line. So let me do this so we can see better. There, okay? Notice that um, by doing ordinal ignore case, we're making sure that we can compare the string that is currently in the genre, in the name, with the string that comes with the genre in the, in the game, in the found game, without regardless of the, the casing that that, uh, that the string has. And we have to search things by string because the string is what we have uh, currently in the game. Also, we are not using find here in this case because generous is a simple, uh, a simple array. Right? So it's an array of uh, generous as opposed to games, which is a proper list, right? So for the array, really what we want to do in this case, we could use single, we could use first or first or default, but I mean, we are pretty much sure that there has to be a generous that matches this string in this uh, in this array. So that's what we're saying single. And if we cannot find it, this is going to throw an exception, of course. We should really never happen. Now, there is a warning here, right? It says here the difference, the reference of a possibly null reference. And that is because find is returning, as you can see, find returns a game summary uh, nullable, right? Perhaps I can just, if you want to just turn your vars into a, the, the current, the actual type, you can always just use the light bulb and use the explicit type. So now you realize that game is really a game summary nullable, right? And because it is nullable, well, we have this warning down here saying, hey, it could be null. So you may run into an exception there. So what we're going to do is just to make sure that we never actually end up with a null in there. So what we're going to do is just say argument null exception, throw this null, and that's going to be our game, all right? So if it ever, if it ever is null, which should not really happen, uh, but if it is, it's still an exception, otherwise, uh, game is always going to have a value down here. And you see that the warning is gone. All right. And so with the validations in place, we can go ahead now and actually return what we need to return, which is the game details. So we're going to go into say, return new game details. All right. And so very straightforward. ID equals game.id. Name equals game name. Now for the generate ID, we can now use our found generate object here. ID, and I remember that this, this one is a string, so we have to do to a string over here. Price is the game.price, and release date is game release date. Okay? And yeah, that's pretty much what we have to, uh, to do for this method. And I mean, yeah, I mean, bear with me. I know that this, this logic is, is not great uh, to have to do this kind of search by string here, uh, but uh, sure enough, we are going to be switching away from this logic uh, pretty soon as we move into talking to the backend. But for now, this is going to be good enough for uh, us to refine what we want to do in our Razor components, which is the point of, of this part of the course. Okay, so our games client is ready. And now we have to switch our attention into editgame.razor, where we want to make a few changes to allow for editing our games. 
the first thing is that uh, in this form, now we have to introduce the ability to be able to receive parameters, right? Because we're going to come from the home component into this edit game component, but we need to tell the component what is the ID of the game that we want to display by default here. So for that, we're going to go all the way to the top. And remember that we have this page directive at the top, right? I'm going to separate it perhaps like that. So the thing is that your racer components, your routable racer components like this one, can have more than one route uh, if needed. And in this case, what we want to do is to add a second route that actually has the game ID. So all you have to do really is say, I'm going to actually copy the route from the top and I'm going to modify it so that we also receive the ID. But not just ID, what we also want to do is to make sure that uh, this is an integer, right? Because remember that all of our IDs are integer uh, in this application. So what we can do is just make sure that it is always an integer by specifying that it has to be an int like this. Okay, so that's a way to prevent the client or the browser to send from sending us anything that is not going to be a, an integer. That's great. Now, if you're going to be receiving the ID like, like this, where well, we have to capture it somewhere, right? So that is why we're going to go down into our code section. And perhaps at the top here of the code section, we're going to be adding uh, our int ID. So I'm going to just say public int. It's going to be the ID. I'm going to be a, a, going to have a getter and a setter. Now, as, as everything else in these racer components, uh, it may be null when the component is just getting created, but eventually it's going to receive the value for the ID, right, from the parameter. Now, to account for that, we're going to make this component, I mean, it has to be nullable, right? So that initially it can be created as a null object, but then the parameter is going to populate. And for that to happen, what you have to do is to specify that this one here is a parameter by specifying the, the parameter attribute right there, okay? So first thing that's going to happen when the component gets created is that the parameter is going to be populated into the, into the ID. Now, since we are doing this, we're going to have to change a little bit our logic on how we uh, create the default instance of, of this game that we have here. Because right now, as you can see, it always creates a, uh, an empty uh, game. But now we're going to have cases where the, we will need an empty game. Some other cases we need to, to have a game that's populated from the data that we already have. Because of that, we are not going to have this logic anymore here. And instead, we're going to be introducing a brand new method here, uh, which is part also of the life cycle of the Blazor components. And perhaps before initialize it, we are going to go ahead and define our protected override void on parameters set. Okay, let me align this a bit better, like that. So here, what we're going to do is to introduce uh, some new logic that determines what to do depending on if we have an ID or not. So we're going to do this. If ID is not null, okay, it means that we have to go ahead and uh, retrieve the game from our games client. So what we can do is just say game equals games client dot get game, the brand new method that we just created. So I did that value. And then, uh, well, otherwise, otherwise that is when we have to go ahead and create a brand new instance of our, uh, of our game. So we're going to have to say game equals new. And here we will have to construct our object. Now that construction, I think we already have it over here. Yeah, so let me just copy this. I'm going to copy this from there over here, there, okay. And so this is going to be the new logic to decide how to uh, instantiate our game, okay? Now, uh, since we now have this logic, there is no reason to also instantiate the game over here in supply parameter from form. So what we're going to do is to change this so that now our game details is going to be a game details uh, nullable, nullable game details, because it's going to initialize as null and then it's going to be populated in on parameters set. And then uh, we're going to remove everything else from here. Now, because game can, can now be null, we're going to get a few warnings across this file, right? So let's take a look at this one here that says, hey, a game could be null, so you may have a problem here. So as we have done before, we're going to just do a quick check. Argument, null exception, throw it null, and then we just put the game here. Okay, so that's going to make sure that we can never get to line 87 if the game is null. So that's a quick check over there. Now, one more thing that we have to check here, if we go all the way up here, right, is that when we're trying to use the game now in the form, now the game could be nullable too. So what we're going to do is to go up here 
into our uh, if and say that we don't want to just check for generous is null, but also or game is null. In both cases, we're going to be just displaying the loading. Right? And otherwise, we proceed to render the form. And notice that there are no more warnings over here. Now, one last thing that we need to account for over here, which is not very obvious, is on parameter set. And it is that we need to know if we are on a point where the user has already submitted the form so that we can go ahead and, uh, and save the game. And the thing is that on parameter set is going to be uh, invoked both the very first time that you go into the form so that the user starts entering the data, but also it's going to be invoked when the user sends the data or submits the data uh, into the server. So if we keep the logic as it is right now and the user submits the game, we're going to right away immediately just destroy where the user entered by either doing this logic here or this logic here, right? This method is going to be invoked before we get to handle submit, right? So that logic is not going to work. And it's, it's something that is not very obvious uh, I know, uh, but it's actually very easy to control. What we're going to say is that, well, you know, if game is not null, right? So if the game is not null, it means that uh, it means that it was uh, posted, right? Posted by the user because we are using, remember, supply parameter from form. So it came from the form. So the game is not null. So if it is not null, it means that there is no need to load or to prepare a new instance of the game. We just have to uh, let it get submitted. So we're just going to, going to say here, return. There's nothing else to do here. Okay, so that will let uh, the logic continue into our handle submit, and the game is going to be added to the collection. All right. And well, with that in place, I think we are ready to test this out. Uh, we have a couple of, uh, well, one more change to do, but let's test this out and see how it goes. And so, yeah, so Hot Reload is asking us to restart the application. So I'm going to say A. So yeah, go ahead and restart it. All right. Let's go back to our browser over here. Perhaps I'm going to refresh this. Yeah, so we are fresh. So now if I go to new game, so uh, yeah, it works as expected. So it's just an empty form. But what I can do now is to actually specify that I want to load one specific game. So if you go click cancel, remember that we have games with ID one, two, and three, right? So I can go to my edit game form and now say slash perhaps one, right? Slash one. I notice that immediately it loads all of the details for our first game, right? Street Fighter, here's the genre, the price, and even the release date. Everything is loaded because we're using the new route that we specified for our form. And furthermore, I could go ahead and change this ID, let's say ID2, and now we're looking at a different game with all the details loaded. So yeah, so that logic is working great. And well, one last thing that we may want to do here is to, uh, well, do something about the form title, right? Because notice that it says new game, over here it just says new game, even when we're editing an existing game. So what can we do so that perhaps we can show here that we are editing some specific game as opposed to say new game? So that's actually very straightforward to do by combining C Sharp with a little bit of HTML. So let's go back into our form over here. Let's collapse this. And what we can do is to introduce a brand new variable over here, perhaps after the definition of generous in the code section, we're going to define our private string title. Okay. And it, that's going to be initialized with string.empty. Okay. It's just going to be an empty title. But what we're going to do is uh, to use our logic in on parameter set, we're going to expand this logic a little bit so that in the case where we are able to find the game, we're going to say, well, we're going to say, that the title is going to be perhaps, and we're, going to, we're going to use a little bit of string interpolation here, is going to say edit game dot name, right? So it says edit Street Fighter 2 or edit Final Fantasy 14, something like that, if the game is known. Otherwise, we're going to go into the other uh, section. We're going to say that title should be just, set a new line, title should be perhaps new game, all right? So now this is a, a dynamic variable that will change according to what we have in the form. And so finally, we have to take advantage of this variable somewhere in the HTML, right? And that somewhere is just going to be up here for our page title and our H3. We are just going to go ahead and replace this with add title, right? Add title and then add title over here. So now, and let me just check quick on hot reloads, working great. So if you go back into our form, you're going to notice that, I mean, right away, the title changed, right? So now it says editing Final Fantasy 14. So because we're loading that game, if I change game back to perhaps game one, 
Now it says, well, editing Street Fighter 2, right? Which is great. If I say cancel and I say new game, now it once again, it says new game. So yeah, all that logic is working uh, as expected. So yeah, so this is working great. And then of course, what we have to do next is to figure out where, how we're going to be submitting that, those changes back to the server. Because if you just hit cancel and we go, let's go, let's say that we go actually to game number one, and we say Street Fighter 2. If we just go ahead and save this right now, what it's going to do is to create a brand new, a, a brand new row over here, as you can see, it creates a new row when we already had Street Fighter 2. So we need to introduce some sort of logic for a, for submitting the changes to an existing game. So for this, we're going to have to go back into our uh, games client over here. And we're going to be introducing a brand new method that is going to allow us to update an existing game. But before doing that, let's go ahead and do a couple of refactorings because we are going to end up reusing some of the code that we have already here. So perhaps we can extract some of that code into helper functions so we don't end up writing the same code over and over again. So if we go back into add game over here, we have here this logic that allows us to really get a, a genre, a genre object based on the genre ID. So what we want to do is to extract this logic into a new method. And for that, I'm going to be using this light bulb over here. And I'm going to select the, the function at, at the close to the end that says extract method. So I'm going to click on that. And as you can see, that immediately uh, took all that code into this new method, which by the way, if you go all the way down here, it's going to be right here. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do here is to, well, rename this method into something that makes more sense. So I'm going to hit the F2 key, so F2, to rename the method into uh, get genre by ID. Okay, notice that that is going to rename the method right here and also it's going to rename any of the calls to this method across the entire file. Okay, so it's now named get genre by ID. Now we don't need to receive the entire game details object here. Really all we need is the ID, which is going to be a string in this case. And in fact, it could be a nullable string. So I'm going to just, just receive an ID as a string nullable there. And then we are going to keep this check, but the check is going to be just on the ID. And then lastly, we're just going to go ahead and return. Okay, we're going to return in that parse on that ID. Okay, so that is going to be our final get journey by ID method. So if you go back into add game, we can now invoke get journey by ID by just saying game dot generate ID. Now let's, uh, well, that's the first thing. And the next thing is, uh, well, to start with, let's just move this private method all the way to the end because uh, it is a good convention to keep all of your helper methods, private methods, all the way to the end because they are not really important. They are not relevant. What really matters is the public methods. So just keep all of those at the top. And what I want to do now is in get game, we want to have a similar logic, but for this uh, uh, couple of lines here, that what they are doing is to find a game or a game summary based on the game ID, right? So once again, we're going to use a light bulb here to extract the method. Okay, so let's go to the new method over here and right away, uh, yeah, it is at the end. And let's go ahead and hit F2. This is going to be named get game summary by ID. Okay, and I think the logic stays pretty much as it is right now because it is going to be able to return the game. It's going to check that the game is not null and then it's going to be returning us back that game. So now if we go up into get game. Oh, one thing that we may want to check here. Yeah, so it is not returning a nullable, so that's great. So uh, get game summary by ID, it is going to be returning just a standard game object up there. Awesome. And with those two new helper functions, we can now move forward to the creation of the brand new method to update an existing. So let's name this new method public void update of the game. And this is going to be receiving our game details that's going to come from our edit game component, Razor component, uh, updated, updated game. Okay. So let's focus on this new method. So in order to update the game, the first thing that we're going to need is the genre, because we're going to need the, the name of the genre to associate to our uh, existing game summary. So let's do bar genre. It's going to be get generate by ID, right? We are reusing our helper function here with updated, updated game dot generate ID. And next, what we want to do is to retrieve that existing game summary object. 
so that we can update its values. So game summary, existing game is going to be get game summary by ID, our new helper method with updated game dot ID. And with those two in place, we can now proceed to update the properties, right? So now we're going to say existing game dot name equals updated game dot name. And same thing really for the other properties, right? So existing game dot genre is this case, when this case is genre dot name, right? And then uh, existing game dot price is daily game dot price. Finally, existing game dot release date is updated game dot release date. Okay. And yeah, that's pretty much all we have to do uh, in our games client to have this new logic to update an existing game. So now it is time to go back to our edit game component and add the logic that it is needed to use this new uh, method in games client. So what I want to do is to go into the code section into our handle submit method over here. And we want to do the following. So we're going to open up a section here and we're going to say that, well, if the ID is null, it means that, well, we're trying to create a brand new game, right? So in that case, we're going to grab this logic that we have already. We're going to put it right here for the case where the ID is not. Otherwise, otherwise, here is where we have to update an existing game. So we're going to say games client dot update game with the game that has been passed in. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that this game object that we are passing in over here does not yet have an ID. Right, because this is an, a game that a game object that has been posted, right, but posted by the user. Remember that we have here submit parameter from form, right? It has been posted by, by the user into the server. And, but when they post the game, they don't post the ID. They post the name, the, the genre, the price, the release date, but there's nowhere else in the form that but we have the ID, right? So it's not posting it. So we have to make sure that we actually populate the ID manually here. Um, or I guess in this piece of code before we actually update it in our list. So for that, all we have to do is just say, well, game.id is going to be id.value. Okay, so that should be all the logic that we need uh, to enable this. So let's go ahead and see how Hot Reload is doing. So looking good. Let's go back into our game catalog and let's see if we refresh this. Yeah, I don't like to have this guy repeated there. So let's actually restart the application in this case, right? So we start application so that the data is cleared. So to that watch once again, back here, I'm going to refresh. Okay, so we are fresh now. And so let's say that we actually want to modify Street Fighter 2 now. So I'm going to go into edit game one, edit game one. And so now we're going to say that this is a Street Fighter 2 turbo. Okay, and that the price is going to be 9.99 or 9.97, let's say. And uh, yeah, that's how it is. I'm going to hit save. And well, this time it actually worked, right? So Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and then the price is 997. There's no repetition, right? The existing game has been modified. So yeah, so that is working great. Awesome. And uh, of course, the next thing that we want to do here is to, well, somehow introduce some sort of UI into this table so that we don't have to be playing with the browser uh, address bar all the time, right? Just to go and edit it again. So next we're going to see how to add an edit button into this table here so that you, you can jump into editing a specific game. Now that button is going to live over here in this uh, last column, right? So we're going to want to have some way to display a button for each of these rows. And just to make it look nicer, we're not going to be using just a standard button. We want to use kind of an icon to represent the act of edit. So how do we introduce an icon into this table here? Well, what we can do is to actually extend the, our use of Bootstrap to also use Bootstrap icons, right? So if you go back into the Bootstrap page over here, you're going to notice that there is actually a section for icons. So Bootstrap also provides you a series of icons that you can use uh, to represent different actions in your application, right? As you can see, it's a, there's a very long list of icons over here that you can choose and you can easily just incorporate into your application. Now, how do we start using these icons? If we go almost to the top, uh, if you just click on this install uh, link over there, so click on install, you're going to go into this section. And as you can see, there are a few ways to install the buttons into the application. In my case, I'm just going to be using the CDN to keep things simple. Uh, that's going to provide me a link that's going to uh, immediately make the buttons available to my application. So I'm just going to click 
copy to clipboard over here. And now I'm going to go back into our VS Code instance. So where do you think that we're going to be adding this style sheet for the bottoms? Uh, well, in the same place where we have been putting uh, all of these CSS, JavaScript, and stuff like that, that will be in our app.razor file over here. Okay, so we scroll a little bit up. Remember that here's where we define the main layout for the HTML for our page, right? And so we have the import for two style sheets here. We also have the import for Bootstrap over here. And so right here under this is where we're going to just go ahead and paste uh, this new style sheet that includes all of those Bootstrap icons, okay? And so as you can see, it's just a bunch of CSS, right? That we can, that we can take advantage of in our application. And now that we have that, we can just go back into edit game. Sorry, we can go back into our home component actually, home component like that. And let me close this other one so we don't get confused. And we want to go into the location where we render our rows, right? So it's going to be over here. Here's our for each. And of course, here is a section that we have prepared uh, to introduce our uh, button actions. And we're going to start by adding a new div here. Okay, it's going to be a div. And inside this div, we're going to add just an anchor. Okay, it's going to be an anchor that we want to style, right? So let's go ahead and do so to class. And then uh, we are going to make it look like a button, right? So like we have done so far with other buttons in Bootstrap. And perhaps since we are here, we may want to also add a little bit of spacing. So with ME2, a little bit of spacing on the right side of the button because we're going to have another button coming on uh, later on for deletion, right? So might as well just add that spacing right now. Now, the next thing is that we're going to make this anchor act or, or show as a button. So let's do role equals button. And uh, inside this button is where we want to use our icon, right? Now, what icon we want to use here? So if you go back into Bootstrap, uh, the icon that I like to use for this is actually a pencil, right? So let me see, let's go up a little bit. Let me see if we have some sort of search here. Okay, so let me type pencil. Okay, as you can see, there are three variations of pencil that we could use here. So let's say we want to use uh, this one, the first one, pencil over here. Okay, so how do we use it? Well, it is actually right here. So you see, this is the code that you have to add to render your pencil. So I'm just going to copy this and back to VS Code. I'm going to paste that over here. So if I now go back into our page and let me just check on yeah, that reload, let's go back into our page and perhaps we refresh this, you're going to see that, well, the, the, well, the button is right there. As you can see, we have now an edit button right there and we didn't have to do much to uh, make it look like, like a nice icon for editing. Okay. So yeah, so that is great. Uh, but of course this button is not doing anything right now, right? So we need to tell the button where is that we want to go when we click on the button. So for that, let's go back into VS Code. And what we want to do is to provide uh, the location where we want to navigate. And usually if for an anchor, what you would do is just do an href, right? So it's going to be an href. And here's where we're going to put the location. However, that location is going to be a little bit dynamic, right? You, we know that we have to go into slash edit game and slash the ID of the game. But for that, we're going to have to calculate what is going to be that URL, right? It's not static and it's going to depend on the game. Because of that, I think one nice way to do this is to actually define a function in our code section. I'm going to remove this breakpoint. In our code section, I'm going to define a function that's going to return the URL that we want to navigate into, okay? So let's go ahead and define a private static and static because we're not going to be using any instance variable in this in this function, it's going to be a string. Let's name it game URL. Okay, int ID. All right. And so all we're going to do here is just say that, oh, in fact, we don't need this, uh, yeah, these curly braces. What we can do is just point to, now this is going to use string interpolation. So we're going to point into slash edit game and then slash ID. All right. And so now that we have this function, what we can do is go back into that location where we want to define the href at the right side. And we're going to invoke the function by using add. So we switch into C sharp, right? So game URL. And then we're going to be using our game variable. 
and do game.id. Yep. And yeah, just by doing that, we have modified uh, this, this uh, button so that it has a link to the corresponding game in, in our table. So let's go back to our page here. And as you can see, notice the, notice the address uh, at the lower side, right? So notice the address over here. So by, by just selecting one of these buttons, that address is now changing because the button is now clickable. So if I click on the second button here, notice that we browse immediately into the Final Fantasy XIV. Click on cancel and I click on the last one. Now we are in FIFA 23 and so and so, right? So just by doing that, we have enabled a very nice experience that allows us to uh, navigate into any of these things. So yeah, that completes our editing experience and of course, what comes next is that we want to figure out a way to also allow our users to delete one of these games. So next, we're going to see how to introduce this delete experience. And what we want to do is to, once again, add one more button over here in our Actions column that is going to allow us to, well, delete the game that the user uh, chooses. So the idea is that the user is going to click on the button and we're going to have some sort of dialogue show up over here that is going to say, hey, do you actually want to delete this game? Yes or no, right? And that is what is going to allow us to delete the game. And so as with everything else, we're going to be developing a brand new component that is going to be the one that's going to represent this delete dialog. So let's go back into Visual Studio Code. And what we're going to do is just, well, open up our Explorer. Let's go into Solution Explorer. And perhaps let's close all the tabs here and let's go into our component section. And I'm going to right click on pages. I'm going to say add new file. I'm going to add razor component. And let's name this one delete game. All right. So like I said, this component is going to be a pretty much a dialogue, a pop-up dialogue. But how do we represent these dialogues on Bootstrap? And so just so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel, we're going to just go back into Bootstrap, the Bootstrap documentation, right? And in, on the left side, if you keep looking, you're going to find this model dialog section. And this is under the component section. You're going to find the model. So the model is a built-in element in Bootstrap. And so really all you have to do is to learn how to make it work and just combine it with your Blazor application. So what I'm going to do is just scroll down into this section that says live demo. And I'm going to copy. I mean, you can actually see a demo of this so you can see. Click on the button and then you get this model here. So this is exactly the experience that we want to show uh, in, our, uh, in our application, right? And so, so to start, we're going to copy this section here that represents the model, right? So let's just copy this. And let's go back into VS Code. And we're going to just replace this delete game with the code that we just got, right? We're going to leave the code section down there, but the rest is replaced by, by, by we just copied, okay? So we are going to keep most of this dialogue and you are going to notice that we have a few sections here, right? So we have, uh, so here's the model dialogue. We have the content then we have a header. This is a header section Then we have a body section and then we have a footer. Now for our model, we, since all it's going to say is that, well, do you want to delete a game one, two, three? And then uh, just a couple of buttons. We don't really need a body for that. We can just use the title and the footer. So I'm going to get rid of the body. We're not going to be using the body. Now, the key thing about this model dialog is that we don't just need one of these. We're going to need one of these dialogues for each of the games that we have in our game list, right? And each of these dialogues have to have a unique identifier. So, of course, the identifier is going to be tied to the game that we want to delete. So because of that, we're going to add a little bit of code here to have a good way to get an ID for the current model. So the first thing that we're going to need, of course, is to, well, know what is the game to delete. So, and for that, we're going to be using a parameter, just like we did before. So we're going to add our public, and this is going to be a game summary, it's going to be nullable. Let's name it just game, and we're going to add the getter and the setter, all right? And this is going to be our parameter, right? So whoever invokes this component has to pass in the actual game, right? And the next thing that we're going to do is to introduce a function that based on the pass in game is going to provide the ID for the, for the model that we have just opened. So let's scroll down a little bit and let's go ahead and declare our public static string get model ID. 
So we're going to pass in the game, the game summary instance, which is going to be nullable, right? And then we are passing in actually a parameter here as opposed to just using uh, the, 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 the one instance that got assigned into the parameter, because you're going to see that later we have to use this function, this public function, we're going to be using it directly from another component, right? So we need this to be a public function that's going to be reused across two components. Now, uh, what do we do here? Well, first thing, let's just go ahead and uh, make sure that, I mean, we check that the game is an instance. It is not null. So throw if null game, right? Just to avoid any nasty warnings. And then what we're going to do is the following. We're going to return, and this is going to be string interpolation. We're going to do, let's name it delete model dash, and then we're going to use the game ID. So game dot ID. So this is going to represent the ID of the model that we are showing on screen. So now let's go up all the way to the top and notice that we have this ID section at the top there. So with our new function, what we're going to do is just replace this example model by switching to C sharp here. And we're going to just invoke our get model ID function. And we're going to be passing in our game instance. So in the case of this delete game component, this game instance is the one that comes from the parameter. Look at that, okay? And so when the component is getting rendered or is getting actually created, the parameter is going to come in, the game is going to be set, and it's going to be set for our model. And then we're going to be sending over that game into get model ID, and get model ID is going to provide us with the delete model. Okay, so that's great. Now, next, uh, we probably want to have uh, some text, perhaps over here, where it says model title. Perhaps we want to show there what is the game that we're trying to delete, if I just so that the user can confirm this. So for that, let's go down once again into our code section and let's define our private string title. It's going to start as a string.empty. And we're going to be once again overriding our uh, on parameter set method. So protected override void on parameter set. And well, we're going to set that title. It's going to be string interpolation, delete game dot name. And this is going to be a question, right? So question mark, just like that. Okay, so that way we have a quick way of, of showing what is a delay, the, the, the game that needs to be deleted. So now let's go ahead and use that new title variable. Well, where it says model title, we're just going to say title. All right, so that's most of what we need to code here. Uh, let's do a little bit more. So let's change these buttons over here. So this is the close button. So let's just rename this one. Since this is the secondary button, let's, let's actually call this cancel so that the user cancels. I don't want to delete it. And then the other one is going to be our actual delete. Now, one thing that we're missing here in this delete button is this attribute in data BS dismiss, uh, because this is the attribute that is understood by bootstrap that will allow the model to get dismissed or to disappear after the user clicks on the button. Okay, so let's let's make sure that we also add that attribute over there so that clicking any of the buttons is going to get the model to just disappear. All right, so I think that's all we need for now in our uh, delete game component. So now, how do we use this component from our other component, our home component? So let's go back into home.racer. Okay, here we are, home.racer. I'm going to put it on the left side. And what we want to do is just, well, we are already in this. Here's the section where we are rendering each game. Remember, this is our for each. We have the columns. We have our first button over here. Here's our first button. And what we want to do, of course, is to add a second button over here. So let's go ahead and define, define the, the, uh, the button here as an actual button. This is going to be an actual button here. Let's give it the, the class is going to be btn. Uh, in this case, we're going to be using BTN uh, danger. So BTN danger is for a kind of a, a red button, right? Which means danger. And then there are two important attributes here that we want to use that a bootstrap understands and that are specifically for the purposes of showing a model. The first one is data BS toggle, right? Which is going to make it so that this button is able to toggle a, a model dialog. And then there's another one, and I'm going to scroll a little bit to the right, it is data BS target, right? And perhaps I'm going to uh, send these things to the next slide so that we can see better. Data BS toggle and data BS target. 
Now we're going to see what do we need to put in database target in a moment, but for now, let me actually complete the definition of this button by actually adding, well, the, the button that we want to represent with an icon. Now, what icon we're going to use here? Well, let's just go back to Bootstrap, right? And so remember that we have this Bootstrap page where we can um, uh, search for icons. So let me just go back. I think, yeah, so this is again, our Bootstrap icons page. We were looking for a pencil before. Let's see if we can look for perhaps an X to represent a, a deletion. Uh, and yeah, I mean, yeah, this is going to show a lot of icons. And perhaps the one that we want to use is this one here, XLG uh, and a large X. Okay, so let me go ahead and just copy this one. And let's go back to VS Code. And inside the bottom, I'm going to just paste that uh, that code to represent the, the X to delete. Now, uh, the actual uh, act of showing the dialog is going to be triggered by this bootstrap uh, attribute here that, that says data BS target. And here is going to pass, we need to pass in the ID of the model that needs to be shown, right? Which is even going to be the model specifically for, for this game to delete. Now, to make that work, we're going to have to do two things. The first thing is that we need to nest one instance of our delete game component on each of the rows, right? And so to do that, all we have to do really, so I'm going to just scroll up a little bit, is that perhaps this div over here, uh, we're going to just declare or nest our delete game component, right? So we're going to just say delete game. Okay, so that's the, our nested delete game component. And as we know, delete game receives a parameter, which is the game. So we're going to just pass in for the game parameter, we're going to pass in at game. So this should make it so that when we render each of our rows for each game, we're also going to be rendering the HTML for the delete game dialog. Now, don't worry because the dialog by default is not going to show, right? It's going to be kind of hidden uh, in, the, in the page. It is going to be there, but the user is not going to be able to see it. So what we want to do now is to introduce the logic to actually make the specific dialog show up when the user makes a click. And for that, like I said, we have to fill in the the ID in data VS target. So since we already have a function over here, this get model ID function in a delete game, all we're going to do is to reuse that function from another small function that we're going to be creating over here. So let me go, just go down here. And at the very end of our home.razor in the code section, we're going to introduce in the following function. So private string get delete model ID is going to receive the game summary game. And here, let me go down. Here, we're going to just return. This is going to be a string interpolation. Uh, remember that in HTML, the way that you locate elements by ID is by using a pound. So we're going to be using a pound here. And now, inside these curly braces, we need to figure out what is the ID. And to do that, remember that we have this static function. It is static, so we don't need any instance of the delete game component to invoke this function. So what we can do is just say, well, delete game dot get model ID. And of course we want to pass in the game object. And now that we have this handy function, we can go back into our uh, HTML. And right here in data BS target, we're going to say that we're going to switch to C sharp and say, get delete model ID for the current game. All right. So once again, for each of our rows, we expect to have rendered one instance of our delete game component with all of the HTML, all of these HTML should show up for our, our um, for each row, uh, but it is not going to show until the user clicks on the button, right? Which is going to trigger the database target for the specific model ID that we are collecting, right? So let's see how this works. So let's see, uh, let's see. Okay, so hot reload is asking us to restart the app. I'm going to say A to always do it. Okay, so restart, restarting the application. And then let's go back into the page. We're here. And perhaps we have to restart it. There it is. So now we have, as you can see, we have our delete button on the, on the right side. Okay, and of course, if we click it, let's go ahead and click it. And as you can see, we get our model with the title for the specific game that we are trying to delete. In this case, Street Fighter 2 and with the two buttons, cancel and delete. We click another one. Let's see, we close this. We click another one, and you can see it changes, title changes depending on the 
the game that you have selected. Now, just to take a closer look at what's going on behind the scenes, let me just press F12 here. Let's see if we can look at it a little bit more. I'm going to move a little bit this to the left. Let's go into our elements view here. And let's see, let's use this, uh, this pointer here to go perhaps into this element and see what's going on behind the scenes. So here's our column. This is our TD, right? So this is the, the row. Here's the TD for each of the, of the cells. Here's the TD for the actions, uh, action buttons. Right? And notice that right here is the model, right? So here is the model for that specific game, right? It is right there, but it's not getting displayed, right? It says display none, but it is there. It's just waiting for us to show it up. Same way, if we go into another one down here, you're going to see that there's even another model, right? So all it is waiting is for us to show or to click on the button to show the, the model that corresponds to the ID that's specified in the model, right? So I click on this one and then it changes into show. Okay, I say cancel and then it changes into, into display none. Okay, and now that I'm seeing this, uh, one more thing that we may want to do is to, well, just fix the layout a little bit more so that the button never shows at the bottom, right? So it doesn't look great. The button should always show on the right side. So let's do a very small change here into our HTML. Collapse this. And perhaps in the div, the wrap, the both of the buttons, we're going to just change the class into the flex. So the flex should make it so that the, the buttons show uh, as a row as opposed to a, a column. So let's go back into the page and sure enough, the buttons should now always show as a row regardless of the resolution of the screen. All right. And one last thing, if we click on one of these and we click on cancel, the model goes away. And if we click on delete, the model also goes away. Awesome. So the model is working great so far. And of course, what we want to do next is to actually introduce that delete logic so that the game is actually deleted. So, well, let's go back into VS Code. And of course, we're going to go, uh, in this case, into our uh, clients. So let me actually switch to our file explorer. Let's go into our games client over here. And just like uh, we have done for get, uh, create, and update, it is time to add a function for deletion. So just after update came, I'm going to add a brand new function here. So let's name it public void delete game. Hint ID. Okay, so it receives the ID and then it's going to go ahead and delete the game. So let's scroll down this. Very simple function. All we're going to do is just say, well, var game equals get game summary by ID, right? Which is our helper function. Here's the ID. And then we're just going to say games.remove the game, All right? So that should go ahead and remove the game from our current list of games. Awesome. So now we have that function. What we want to do is to go back into our delete game component and I will take advantage of the dependency injection pattern that's supported in Blazor so that we can get an instance both of the games client and also the navigation manager to complete our delete experience. So let's go ahead and inject our games client. It's going to be named just client. And let's also inject the navigation manager. Let's name it navigation manager. Okay. And now what we want to do is to introduce a function in our code, perhaps at the end, private void. All right. So this is a function that's going to take care of removing the item from the collection, right? So all we have to do is just say client dot delete game, and we're going to pass in our game dot id. Now in this case, once again, uh, the compiler is complaining about uh, the the variable; it could be null, and so we could do an argument null exception check. Uh, but in this case, we are absolutely sure that the game has to have been set, right? Because it came as a parameter. So what we can also do is just use the null forgiving operator, which is this exclamation mark like that. And that will make it so that the compiler really doesn't care. We are saying, hey, I know that it will have an instance. It's not going to be null, so just don't worry about it, right? So that's another way that you can handle this depending on the situation. And well, after deleting the game, what we probably want to do is to just refresh the data in the page, in the home component, so that it doesn't show the deleted game anymore. And for that, what we're going to do is just say navigation manager dot refresh. Remember that our delete game component is really part of the, I mean, it's nested 
into the home component. So by doing refresh, we should be able to refresh uh, everything in the, in the entire page uh, right away. Now, lastly, uh, we have to use this confirm method. We have to use it uh, in our primary button, our delete button on the HTML. So I'm going to go into our primary button, which I can see that uh, there's a lot going on there. So let me actually send things to the next line so we can see better. Okay, so I'm going to add just one more attribute here, which is going to be the onClick, the on the onClick event. And we're going to say add confirm. Okay, so, so that should make it so that when we click the button, then our C sharp logic that is in confirm should go ahead and trigger and well delete the game and then refresh the page. All right. So with that done, uh, let's check hot reload, should be fine. And so let's go ahead and get back into our page over here. And just in case, I'm going to just refresh this. And let's try that deletion, right? So I'm going to say, well, I want to delete Street Fighter 2. I'm going to click on this. And then I'm going to click on Delete. Now, unfortunately, as you can see, it is not working currently, right? And if I try again, click on this, Delete, it's just not working. And um, this is actually expected at this point. And this leads us to understand uh, a bit better how interactivity works in Blazor. So I think it is a good time to switch to slides so that we can understand much better the Blazor render modes and Blazor interactivity. In this lesson, you will learn about the different render modes available for Blazor applications. Every component in a Blazor web application adopts a render mode to determine the hosting model that it uses where it's rendered, and whether or not it's interactive. Blazor currently supports four render modes. Static server-side rendering, interactive server-side rendering, client-side rendering via WebAssembly, and automatic rendering. Let's explore each render mode individually to understand how they work and when to use them. Static server-side rendering is the mode you have been using so far in this course. In this mode, after the browser sends an HTTP request to the server-side Blazor application, components just render HTML to the response stream. Components are statically rendered on the server and there is no interactivity enabled. So if, for instance, a component renders a button and the user clicks on it, nothing will happen since there can't be any event handlers for it. Static SSR is the default render mode for all components and is best used for websites where the content doesn't change frequently and there's no need for real-time user interaction. This mode is great for scale since it doesn't require any WebSocket connections with the server and it also doesn't require any WebAssembly downloads into the user's browser. But also, it enables enhanced navigation by default, which enables single-page navigation-like fast responsiveness even when it uses traditional server-rendered HTML. Interactive server-side rendering renders components from the server in a similar way to static SSR. However, components can process UI events interactively via C-sharp code, as opposed to needing JavaScript. To handle the UI interactions, Blazor will establish a WebSocket connection via SignalR between the browser and the Blazor server application. So if a component renders a button and the user clicks on it, the event will reach the server via the WebSocket and the response HTML will come back to the browser via the same channel. This mode is best suited for applications that require real-time interactivity, but events need to be processed on the server to take advantage of server-side resources. It's also ideal when WebAssembly is not practical due to the application size which could take a long time to download to the user's browser. Client-side rendering renders components on the client using Blazor WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a web technology that allows code reading in different languages to run in a browser, and Blazor WebAssembly includes a version of the .NET runtime that is downloaded and cached in the browser along with your application. Just like with interactive SSR, components can process UI events interactively via c -sharp code but here, all UI interactions are handled entirely in the browser, and your application can update the UI in real time in response to client-side events. In fact, your application can work offline once it has been downloaded and cached in the browser. 
Client-side rendering is best for applications that require rich real-time interactivity with the UI without constant server communication. The last render mode is automatic rendering, where the type of rendering to use for components is decided at runtime. In this mode, components are initially rendered with interactive server-side rendering or interactive SSR. However, while the user is already using the application in that mode, Blazor starts doing work in the background to download and cache the .NET runtime and your application into the browser. That way, the next time a page is visited, the components are rendered from the browser using Blazor WebAssembly. This mode takes the best of interactive SSR and client-side rendering and is ideal for applications that need to both optimize the initial load time but also require rich real-time interactivity in the browser, all without the user noticing the transition from one mode to the other. Now that you know about the different render modes available with Blazor, let's modify our delete dialog so that it enables user interactions. The reason why our delete dialog is not working properly is because we have been using the default static server-side rendering mode of Blazor. So when we go ahead and open the dialog, and then when we click on the delete button, there is not really any C-sharp code that can handle that event, that click event. So what we have to do is to enable a different render mode that allows us to have some sort of interactivity. And in this case, what we're going to do is to enable interactive server-side rendering. So let's see how to do that. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code. And the first thing that we have to do to enable this is to register the required services in Param CS. So let's go back into Explorer and let's go into program.cs. Remember that this is the file where we register all of the services that are required by the application. And to enable interactive server-side rendering, we need to add two things to this file. The first thing is, well, in this line seven, after our call to add Razor components, we're going to have to add one more call, which is going to be dot add interactive server components, add interactive server components. So this is a service that is in charge of enabling all of the Razor components where we have enabled interactive server-side rendering. But also we're going to have to go a little bit down here, all the way to, in this case, line 25, where we have map Razor components. We have to add one more call that is going to be add interactive server render mode, which is the line that is going to actually enable this, uh, this different uh, interactivity mode, right? Interactive server-side render. Now with those, those, those two things enabled, we can go back into our delete game uh, component. And really all we have to do is to tell the component what is going to be the render mode that we're going to be using, because these render modes can be specified per component. So you don't have to specify it for the entire application. You can if you wanted to, but ideally you just specify render modes that are specific for each component. In this case, we do need lead game to be interactive. So we're going to say add render mode. In this case, we're going to be using interactive, interactive server. Okay. And really that's all we have to do to enable interactive server-side rendering or interactive SSR. And then uh, let's see. One thing that I'd like to do is to actually stop and restart our dotted watch because this is kind of a, a very heavy change in the way that the application works. So just going with the current .NET Watch session may not, may not work. So I'm going to restart .NET Watch here. Okay, and back into our page here. So I'm just going to go ahead and refresh it. And this time, if we click on the delete button and then we click on delete, notice that it indeed deleted the first game, the one that we just uh, select. If I go ahead and click on another one, click on delete, it just works, right? And this is because the delete dialog now is interactive. Now, if you're curious, I mean, how, how, how does that work? How is it possible to run C sharp code directly in the browser? So, well, the truth is that in this mode in interactive SSR, we are not really running a C sharp code in the browser. The code is running in the server, but there's a little bit of magic happening behind the scenes. So let me go and do F12 here. So I'll just do F12 to open the browser dev console. And first thing I'm going to do is to just do a full refresh. So let me do a full refresh of the page. And the one thing that you're going to notice here, I mean, it may be a little bit hard to notice, but there is one new actor in this page now. 
which is actually this, this one at the very end. Notice this. This one here is, represents a web socket, right? Which is a real-time communication channel between the browser and the server, right? Which is powered by blazor.web.js, right? And it is in pending state. So this means that as soon as we loaded our delete dialog, which is part of our home component, right? It is nested. Blazor enabled this web socket of communication with the server, meaning that it has a way to react to our changes from the server side, right? So when we go ahead and click on delete, so we click on delete. If we click on the delete button, what happens is that Blazor, via that web socket, so which is right here now, via this web socket, you will go ahead and send that event to the server. The server runs your C# -sharp code that handles the delete event, right? And then uh, it obtains the updated HTML, and then it sends back that HTML back to the client, to the browser, where, uh, let me close this, where Blazor, the web.js, is going to capture that resulting HTML, and then it merges uh, with our current page, right? And in the end, well, we'll also go ahead and refresh it, right? So we we'll refresh the page with the updated list of games, and so, and that's how, well, in this case, we have no more games in there. So yeah, that's pretty much the magic behind interactive server-side red. Now, let me close this. And I think there's one more place where we can actually take advantage of interactivity. But for that, I think we're going to have to just restart our application because we deleted all of our games. Let me just recover those games by doing .NET Watch. Okay. And if you remember uh, over here, I'm going to refresh the page. Let's say that we want to edit, uh, or actually that we want to create a brand new game, right? So remember that if we click on save here, of course the validation is triggered and we cannot save the game. But if we enter some value here, right? Some, some game, hit tab. Uh, one thing that you may notice is that the, the, the red lines are not going away, right? So the text box and even the, the warning message is still there, even when we already feel this. So you would expect that, uh, that, that, that those warnings should just go away, right? Why are they not going away automatically? I think even if you try saving, let me see, try saving. Well, only if we try saving, then it, it goes away. But it does not go away as the user interacts with the form. And that is because we don't have interactivity enabled. So to fix that, all we have to do is just go back again over here. And let's go into Explorer and then Edit Game here. And then let's go all the way to the top. And we're going to just enable the same interactive server render mode for our Edit Game Razor component. So render mode interactive server, just like that. And with that change in place, uh, let me go ahead and go back to my terminal. I'm going to actually, again, stop stop this because I don't think .NET Watch is going to catch this change. So let's restart the application, .NET Watch. And then let's go back into the form. Uh, we may want to just hop out and get back in there. I'm going to even refresh this. So I'll try to save this. And of course, all the warnings kick in. Now I'm going to enter some value, right? So some game. I'll hit tap and notice by just hitting tap, immediately the warning goes away, right? You can see it is now green. And even before I hit submit or anything else. And that is because interactivity now is enabled for this form here, right? So that's the, the nice thing about interactivity. It just looks much, much nicer uh, for our end user. All right. And so yeah, I'm just going to cancel this. And with this, I think our UI is uh, mostly ready for our front end. And now it is time to properly integrate our front end with a back end so that we don't have to have all this data just running in memory, but instead we are going to be retrieving data from a back end and also sending data back as the user interacts with the front end. So next we're going to see how to get started with that back end integration. It's time to start the integration of our front end with a corresponding back end API which is going to be in charge of managing all of the data for the application. Now, where is the backend application that we're going to be using for this? Well, just under this video, you should be able to find a link to a zip file that contains the backend API that we're going to be using for this integration. Now, I explained everything about how to create that backend in a different course, which I have uh, also uh, linked under this video. So you can go ahead and check out that course if you want to know how exactly that backend was created. But at this point, all we're going to do is just to go ahead and run that backend in our box so we can start integration with the front end. So in my case, I already downloaded and extracted uh, that backend into my box. 
So let me go ahead and open that backend in this new Visual Studio Code instance that I have just opened here. So let me go into File, Open Folder, and I'm going to go into this directory. So I extracted the backend here, and I'm just going to click on Select Folder. And if we open up our Explorer, we're going to see that here is our, uh, our backend code, right? So it's a very standard ASP.NET Core backend API. And before we start integration with the front end, perhaps we want to just quickly uh, run it and see how it works so we can understand better what it can offer to our front end. Now, if you want to test this, one thing that you may need to install now is an extension that allows you to interact with the API. Now, that extension I, I have re installed in my box. If you go into your extensions view in Visual Studio Code, the extension that you're looking for is this one here called the REST client. So just look for that one in the marketplace. So it is REST client by Wachao Mao. It's the most popular extension of VS Code for a REST client. So this allows you to interact with your APIs directly in VS Code without having to use any other tool or even a client application. Okay, so I already installed this one here. And so let me show you how this works. So I'm going to go ahead and open up my terminal and while being directly in the game store API directory, I'm just going to do .NET run. And perhaps let me get a little bit more space by hiding the activity bar, just like that. And then uh, you're going to find that there, there are two HTTP files, this games.http and generous.http. So if you open games.http, what you're going to see is that we have a series of, and let me collapse this, a series of requests here that are ready for you to explore how to interact with the API. So for instance, let me go for the first one. So this first one, should allow me to retrieve all of the games that have been created in the backend API. So I can just go ahead and right click on this and then say send request, right? And what you're going to see on the right side is a response from the backend API saying that, yeah, so this was a success, 200 okay. And then down here, you're going to see the list in JSON format of all of the games that have been registered in the backend API. As you can see, we have four games right now, okay? And you can also click on this send request, uh, send request link over here. Although this one is a little bit unreliable, sometimes it doesn't work. So that's why I prefer to just right click and send the request. Okay, so you can also use this one here, for instance, if you wanted to just retrieve one game, so game with ID one, this will be the request to, to use. So I'll right click on this, send request. And as you can see on the right side, we get just one game, right? Final Fantasy XIV in this case. And well, just like that, you can see that we have uh, more requests for doing a post. If you wanted to post a new game into the backend API, put if you wanted to update or replace a game in the backend API, and finally, a delete. And then uh, if you go back on the left side, you're going to also find generous.http. So this one here uh, is just to interact with the generous API, because of course, remember that we need to also have the list of generous for the application. So if you right click on this one, we should be able to get uh, our list of genres. So right now we have one, two, three, four, five genres. We should match what we have been doing in the client right now. Uh, so these are the actual genres we're going to be using. And there are relationships in the backend, right? To make sure that anytime we use a gender, it has to come from this list. Otherwise the database is not going to accept it, all right? So yeah, so this is the backend API. And I guess for now, we're going to just to leave it running. So it is running right there but we're not going to be doing much more over here. We're going to be actually switching back into our Visual Studio Code instance where we have our frontend. And now we have to explore, well, how we're going to get our frontend to start sending those requests into the backend. And to get started, what we're going to do is just start going to perm.cs. Okay, perm.cs. Remember that this is, the, this is the place where we register all of the services for the application. And the key service that we are going to need now is this one known as the HTTP client. So the HTTP client is a standard class in ASP.NET Core and in Blazor applications that allows you to send requests outside of your, of your application and into any other external service, okay? And so to do that, we're going to do the following. The first thing, perhaps just before declaring our games client and generous client over here, we're going to be declaring a variable that represents the location or the URL of our backend. So what is that, that URL? So let me go briefly back into our API. And if you see down here in the console, we can see what is the location where the backend is listening. So it is listening in HTTP localhost 5274, right? So let me go ahead and copy this 
So just copy that. And let me go back into my front end. So I'm going to just declare a variable here that says game store API URL. It's going to be, and then we're going to paste that URL that we just copied. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is to use uh, the dependency injection uh, pattern in, in Blazor applications to actually inject or actually to register an instance of the, of the HTTP client uh, object for each of our clients. Remember that right now we have these two clients, right? So games client and generous client. And let me actually do F12 in games client so we remember what's going on here. So this is the class that today we are using to just manage all of the games in this in-memory list, right? What we want to do now is to update this class so that it can use an HTTP client instance, right, to interact with the backend instead, all right? So to do that, let's first register our HTTP client instance. And for that, there's actually a very handy uh, method in place of applications that you can use for that purpose. So what you can do is the following. Builder.services.addHttp client. And this method is going to receive the type of the client class that you're going to be using for uh, interacting with HTTP client. In this case, this is going to be, let's start with games client. So I'm just going to copy this like that. And then here you're going to need to pass a, a Lambda where you're going to be configuring what is going to be the base address for that HTTP client. So I'm going to say here, well, the client where the client that base address is a new URI. And that URI is going to have our game store API URL. Okay, perhaps I can uh, send this to the next line so that we can see better. So by doing this, we are registering an instance of an HTTP client object that is pre-configured with the game store API URL as the base address. Plus also we are registering a games client instance just like we are doing down here. But that is also going to be done uh, directly by this at HTTP client method over here, right? So both the HTTP client and the games client are getting registered here for dependency injection. Now, one, one thing to keep in mind is the, that the lifetime of both games client and the HTTP client is going to be scoped to the lifetime of that, of that WebSocket connection that is created between the browser and the server. So as long as you keep your browser open in the address of our PlaySource application, you will keep using the same games client and HTTP client instances. But as soon as you close that browser and you open a brand new one, then a new WebSocket or what is also known as a new circuit is created between the browser and the server. And that means that you're going to get a brand new instance of the client, the HTTP client and the games client, okay? And just like we did this, we should also register our generous client, right? So I'm going to just copy this and I'm going to send this down here. And in this case, it's going to be our generous client, which also needs to be configured with that, that same base address. And now that we have done this, we can actually get rid of these two lines, 18 and 19. We don't need this because like I said, at HTTP client is going to register both game client and generous client with the corresponding HTTP client. Now, since this is getting a, the HTTP client registered, we can now go into games client and actually receive that HTTP client via dependency injection, right? So now we can just say here, actually like this, HTTP client, let's just name it HTTP client. So by doing this, we are receiving that injected HTTP client via dependency injection. And we should probably do the same in our generous client. So let's go into generous client over here. Let's do that same thing, right? So let's open up parentheses like that. Now, if we do this, uh, of course, games client is going to complain because, well, we are creating an instance uh, over here, uh, which we're going to remove this line very soon. But for now, let's just pass in that HTTP client so that we don't get a built uh, one. Now, let's see if we can add perhaps a breakpoint, uh, perhaps in games client, just to see that we're actually receiving that instance over there, right? So I'm going to add some breakpoints here. Hopefully we can catch that. Now let's go ahead and start debugging the application. Right now I do have .NET Watch, so I'm going to do Control C in my terminal, like that. Okay, so stopped. And I'm going to do F5 to start my application. So I'll do just F5. Yep, so the debugger started. And I'm going to go back into my browser, which by the way, this screen that you can see here, 
this is what you, you can expect to see when you have stopped your server and the browser can no longer have that WebSocket connected back into the server, right? So this is expected and it's going to start happening now that we are using interactive server-side render. Now I'm going to just go ahead and refresh the, the browser. And what's going to happen is that back in VS Code, we are here stopping in the debug session. And let's see, if we hover over HTTP client, you're going to see that now we have an HTTP client ready to use. And notice that the base address is the, the address of our packet, right? So that, that HTTP client registration, it has worked successfully, right? So we are ready to start using that in our application. Now, before moving on, let me actually stop this, this debugging session. And before we move on into changing our games client to start using the HTTP client, one thing to notice if we go back into program CS, let me collapse this, is that it's probably not ideal to have our, uh, the URL of our backend just hard-coded here uh, in program CS, right? Uh, because at some point, we may want to deploy our frontend into some sort of server or to the cloud somewhere where the, also the backend is going to be deployed perhaps also into the cloud, and this URL is going to need to change, right? And we don't want to have to change this URL anytime we deploy this application to the cloud. So how can we avoid having to hard code this URL here and instead let it be configured for working with this URL in our box, but with a different URL at some point when we deploy this to production? So for that, what we want to do is to use what is known as the ASP.NET Core configuration system. So next, let's go into slides so that we can learn more about ASP.NET Core configuration. At this point, we have hard-coded the URL that our Blazor application will use to talk to the backend API. However, this is not ideal since eventually, when we move the application to a different environment, like in a cloud deployment, the API URL will be different and we would need to make code changes, which is not ideal. Fortunately, there are better places to store application configuration. One of the most popular options in ASP.NET Core, especially for local development, is the appsets.json file, which can store all sorts of configuration information in JSON format. Now, the appsets.json file is what is known as a configuration source. And just like that one, there are several other configuration sources supported in .NET applications like command line arguments, environment variables, user secrets, and even cloud-based configuration sources like Azure Key Vault. And the great thing about this is that the ASP.NET Core runtime takes care of combining information from all available configuration sources into a single configuration object that implements the iConfiguration interface. This configuration object is easily accessible to your Blazor application in such a way that it doesn't really need to know where the configuration data actually comes from. In this course, you will use the appsetting.json file to store the backend API URL for local development. Just keep in mind that appsetting.json is not the right place to store credentials or any kind of secret, because anybody that gets access to your project files will be able to read them and potentially leak them. If, for local development purposes, you need to store any kind of credentials, please use the user secrets configuration source instead, which is enabled by the ASP.NET Core secret manager. Let's now update our Blazor application to start reading the backend API URL from the appsetting.json file. Now we know that it is not ideal to have our backend API URL just hard-coded in our program.cs file. So let's see how to move it into appsetting.json so that our application is ready to read that URL from any configuration source in the future. So let's go ahead and open up our Explorer, Ctrl Shift E. And uh, as you know, we do have our appsetting.json file right here. Okay, so let's open appsetting.json. And all we have to do really here is just to open up a brand new, a brand new key in this JSON file that we're going to name game store API URL. Okay, could be named uh, any, anyways, uh, but that's the name that we're going to be using here. And the value that we're going to give this key is, well, the value that we already know, right? HTTP localhost 5274. Let's go ahead and paste that here. Let's put a comma at the end. 
And now, well, that URL has moved into object in that case. But the important thing or the interesting thing is, well, how do we read this from program.cs, right? We still need to read it. So fortunately, there are very simple APIs to read that configuration information in your Blazor application. So all we have to do is the following. We're going to do builder, and we're going to be using the configuration object from which we can obtain any of the keys that we have in our instance.json file. Now, in this case, the key that we want is this one called game store API URL, which I'm going to copy. I'm going to paste right here. Okay. And yeah, just like that, we will be able to read the game store API URL. Now, as you can see, we do have a couple of warnings here, uh, which are, well, alerting us that, well, game store API URL could be null, right? And which makes sense because if for some reason we forgot to add the URL in absence.json, or if we're not able to read it from any configuration source, it's just going to be null. So to prevent that, what we can do is just add an expression just after this that says that, and I'm going to go to the next line, that if it is null, well, we're going to just throw a new exception, okay? And perhaps for that exception, we are going to put here game store API URL is not set, okay? That way, if for any reason that, that key is not found and it returns null, then we are going to revert into this uh, other section where the exception is going to be thrown and there's no way to get to the next line. All right. So yeah, that's pretty much all we have to do. And I'm going to put a breakpoint perhaps at line 13 to see if we are actually able to read that game store API URL. And now I'm just going to hit F5 to start my debugger. So F5. Let's give it a second, debugger starts, and let's see what we got here. So if we hover over game store API URL, yep, as you can see, our API URL is right there, no longer hard-coded in C-sharp, but instead it is coming from absolute.json. And like I mentioned, if you eventually in the future just deploy this to somewhere in the cloud, you will be able to populate that configuration key from any other configuration source without having to touch your C-sharp code anymore. Right, so that's great. And at this time, we should start switching our attention out of the program CS. And let me close this and that. And what we want to go is into our games client. And let me remove these two breakpoints. So now it is time to start using our HTTP client object to start talking to our backend API. However, there is one more concept that we need to understand before we can start using the different methods available in HTTP client. And that concept is the asynchronous programming model available in Blazor and in ASP.NET Core and you're, that you're going to need anytime you need to use libraries that are going to talk to processes or to services that live outside of your application. So let's switch to slides for a moment so we can better understand the asynchronous programming model. To understand asynchronous programming, let's go through a common scenario you might be familiar with, which is making breakfast. Let's say you start by heating your pan for a few minutes, and then, when ready, you fry some eggs there. We would also like to have some bread for our breakfast. So after your eggs are ready, we bring up the toaster and toast our bread. Then, when the bread is ready, we add some jam on peanut butter on it. Finally, our breakfast would not be complete without some juice. So let's pour in some orange juice. In total, it took us about 30 minutes to complete our breakfast. But is that really how you would go about preparing your breakfast? If it is a weekday, when you are usually in a rush, perhaps you would like to do something like this instead. You start by heating your pan. And while that happens, you will also start toasting your bread. And while those two things happen, perhaps you can also pour your orange juice. Eventually, when the pan is ready, you go back to it and fry some eggs. And once the bread is toasted, you go and put the jam or peanut butter on it. Doing things this way, you can be done in much less time, say 15 minutes, and perhaps you can spend the rest of the time enjoying your breakfast. When comparing these two ways going about making your breakfast, we say that the first approach is synchronous since you won't start a new task until the previous one is complete. However, the second approach is asynchronous. Since you don't wait for a task to be complete, 
before starting your next task. Instead, you start as many tasks as you can and eventually you turn your attention to tasks that are ready for you so you can continue with the next task. In a similar way, you can perform asynchronous programming in your ASP.NET Core applications. When a client sends a request to your web server, you want to start handling the request in your Razor component in an asynchronous way so that your cook, the Kestrel web server, is immediately free to start handling the next request. So as your Razor component starts an asynchronous call, perhaps to your HTTP client, and the HTTP client in turn requests data asynchronously from the backend API, the web server has also started serving the next request also asynchronously. When the backend API eventually returns the requested data, the HTTP client will resume work and send the data back to the Razor component, which in turn resumes work, prepares the HTML to render, and sends the data back to the web server, who in turn responds to the original client request. After this, the application continues starting other tasks asynchronously and resumes work whenever necessary. As you can see, the asynchronous programming model brings in multiple benefits. Your application gets improved performance since you avoid blocking callers and free them up to perform other tasks, which also results in overall better responsiveness. You are able to scale your application better because it can handle more requests and users simultaneously without getting bogged down by waiting for I.O. operations to complete. And also, the use of task objects in combination with the async and await keywords provide a simple and intuitive way of writing asynchronous code as opposed to having to deal with threads and callbacks directly. Now that you understand the asynchronous programming model and its benefits, let's see how to put it to work in our Blazor application. Let's see how to use the HTTP client object to start sending requests to our backend API. So here we are in our games client where we have already injected our HTTP client instance. And we're going to start by using it to retrieve the full list of games from the backend. So for that, we're going to scroll down until we have our uh, get games method right now. So in order to retrieve that data or to send a request actually to the backend, what we're going to do is First, let's just send this to the next line so that it fits better into the screen. And then we're going to use HTTP client dot get from JSON async. And here we're going to be providing the type that we want to use to deserialize that JSON that's going to be coming back from the backend. And of course, that type here is going to be game summary. Okay, and not just game summary, but a game summary array. Okay, now the parameter for this method is going to be the route in the backend that we have to reach. Now, if we go back into the backend very quickly over here, we're going to remember that as we saw when we use games.http, and we'll have this for a moment, really all of our requests are going to go into slash games, at least for the games endpoints, right? So it's just slash games. So let's go ahead and use games back in our front end. That is going to be the parameter that we're going to be passing in into get from JSON async, right? And let's close this semicolon. Now, the reason why we get these red squiggles here is because get from JSON async is not going to just return that uh, game summary array. All of these async methods actually return tasks, right? So as you can see, it does return a task of game summary array. And that is expected because as we just talked about, the idea of asynchronous programming is that we go ahead and invoke this asynchronous method, and we're going to be handing over a task back to ASP.NET Core or Blazor so that it can keep performing other tasks and eventually just go back to our task to continue the work. Now, there are several ways to work with tasks in ASP.NET Core and in C Sharp in general, but really the simplest way to deal with these tasks without having to complicate too much our code is by using the async and await combination of keywords. So let me show you how that works. So the first thing we're going to do is to actually change this, this method to not just return the game summary, but actually return a task of game summary array. Okay, that's the first thing. 
The next thing we're going to do is to introduce async here as, the, as part of the return. And also we're going to be using await over here. Now, all that async and await are doing here is just adding a little bit of syntactic sugar so that it is easier to deal with the task that is going to come back from get from JSON async. And in general, it just makes it easier to work with asynchronous programming. Now, in this specific case where you have one method, one asynchronous method, that is going to just invoke immediately another asynchronous method. This is a case where you might get away with not using async and await at all, and that should work just fine. However, since we are new to the use of async and await, I recommend that to start with just use, always use it, right? Async and await if you are going to have this situation. And only later on, when you get more familiar with all the implications of async and await, you can decide if you just don't want to use them in some situations, okay? Now, the reason why we're getting here uh, this warning is, well, once again, because of nullables. Like get from JSON async is going to return a nullable collection of game summary array. While we're trying to return here uh, an actual just game summary array with not with non-nullables. So what we want to do here is to decide what's going to happen, what we're going to do, or what we're going to return if the, this returns a, a null. So in this case, what we can do, just to keep things simple, is to return an empty array like this. Okay, if for some reason get from JSON async just returns null, we're just going to return an empty array, which uh, the eraser component is going to be able to handle just fine. And then lastly, since this method is now an asynchronous method, get games is asynchronous, the convention across uh, C sharp is to add the async suffix. Okay, you don't have to do it, but it is the convention. So this signals the caller, right? Whoever is going to invoke this method that this method is actually asynchronous and is returning a task. That just makes it easier for whoever consumes your method to understand the implications of invoking it. All right. And so now we change that. Uh, let's go back into our home component, components, pages, home.racer. Okay, and let's see what kind of change we have to make to uh, account for the, for the change that we made in games client, right? And really it, the change that we have to make is very simple. So here we are in uninitialized, right? And well, of course, now we are invoking, we don't, we're not invoking get games, but get games async, right? So let's change that, get games async. But as you start moving into using an asynchronous method, just like we had to uh, accommodate things in games client, right? So that the method is async and returns to us, we have to do something similar over here, right? This is what is known as async all the way, right? So you can't just have some methods that are not async and some methods that are async in your call chain. You have to turn everything into async. So in this case, we have to make it so that this method is protected over, right? Async and then task. And then the method itself is going to be named uninitialized async. And finally, we should go ahead and here we use the await keyword. Okay, now this entire method is async. And yes, with these initial changes, we should be able to start testing out and see if we can actually talk to the backend API. Now, let me quickly go back to my uh, backend API actually over here and make sure it is running. So let me open up my terminal. So yeah, the API is running. If it is not running for you, make sure that you first run your API. Otherwise, there's not going to be not anything in the backend to talk to. And now let's go back into our application here, front end. Open the terminal and let me delete this. And let's go ahead and just do our familiar dot watch. Okay, never mind that warning. We're going to deal with that later. And let's head back into our browser over here. I'm going to just refresh this. Okay, and as you can see, now we are uh, listing data that is no longer coming from our in-memory list, right? So this data is actually coming from the backend. And notice that we only had to make minimal changes really to the Razor components because the main change really happened in the games client, which is where we have encapsulated all this logic to deal with the data. Okay, so yeah, so that is working great. And so now we're going to move ahead and start changing all of the other methods of games client so that they are all working asynchronously and talking to the backend. So let's go ahead and collapse this. And here in games client, let's start with the next method, which is at game which now is going to change into public async task at game async. Going to receive the same thing, but now it's not really going to have all of this body that we have here. 
All it's going to do, and in fact, we are going to just remove the, the body entirely. So we're going to point into await HTTP client that post as JSON async, right? And then, well, the, the route we're going to be using is the same one as before, it's just games. So we're going to put here games. And then we want to pass in uh, the, the body, right? What is going to be the payload that we send into this post request? Well, in this case, it's going to be the game, right? The game that we just prepared, okay? So this method is going to receive our game details, a object from the Razor component, the form, and then it's going to just hand it over to post as JSON async. And this method is going to take care of transforming this game object into JSON, and then just send it over, over the wire into our bucket. Next, let's move on into get game, which now has to be transformed into public async task of game details. And it's going to be get game async. Now, again, it is not going to have any of this body. And we're going to say await HTTP client get from JSON async with type game details. Now, what is the route that we have to use? Of course, it is going to start with games. But remember, in this case, we want to return an element by ID. And for that, we're going to be using perhaps a string interpolation here so that we can do games slash and then the ID, the ID that was provided in the parameter. And then if for any reason, this method actually returns null, we're going to treat this as a really bad, uh, bad scenario because we should be able to find the game that the user has just clicked in the front end, right? So what we're going to do is just say, well, if it returns no, we're going to be throwing a new exception that perhaps is going to just say, could not find game, okay? Next, let's move on into update game, which as you might guess, is going to be transformed into public async task update game async. And then we're going to remove all of this body and point to await HTTP client. In this case, we're going to be doing put as JSON async. Okay. And then again, we're going to be using string interpolation here to say games slash. And then we want to use the updated game dot ID. Okay. So that is the route. And then we actually need to send the payload, right? And the payload for this is just going to be our updated game. And finally, probably the simplest one is going to be our delete method. So public async task, delete game async, just passing the ID. And then we're going to be sending this over to await HTTP client, delete async. And then once again, string interpolation, we're going to go into games slash ID. And that will do it. Now, notice that in none of these cases, we have to specify the, the host and port, right? We always just start with this, uh, with this route, with the, with the games pack. And that is because if you remember, and I'm going to go quickly into program CS, we have registered the base URL when we configure the HTTP client right here, right? So we retrieve that, uh, that game store API URL, which in fact comes from app Upsetting that JSON, right? We have HTTP localhost 5274. We read it from here. We configure it when we register the HTTP client into games client. And then games client just receives the HTTP client. It already knows the base address. And all it has to do is just to append the games path. Okay. So this class is pretty much ready. And then as you can notice, and we, we don't need really a bunch of things that we were using before in games client. So I'm going, just going to go ahead and clean up all of that, that code here no longer needed. And of course, we can finally get rid of this in-memory list of games. So get rid of that there. And this is all that we have now in our HTTP client for now. We're going to deal with this generous. Um, actually, we can deal with this right away. Not needed. Okay. So that is what we have in our HTTP client, in our games client, sorry. Now let's go ahead and look at another case Razor component that we have to fix which is going to be our edit game that razor. So let me go into edit game that razor over here, because of course this one is using our games client and we're going to need to make a few changes. So first thing is that on parameter set is going to have to change into an asynchronous method. So pull protected override 
async task on parameters set async, which by the way, will present a warning if we are not doing the corresponding await operator, right? So down here, we'll have to start making changes so that when we invoke games client get game, we have to change this into await games client dot get game AC. Okay, so that should do it for that one method. Then coming down into handle submit, we have to change this into async task, handle submit async, right? Now this method, I mean, as, as it, it just changed the name, we actually have to go ahead all the way up to the HTML, make sure that we change it in on valid submit, right? We have to make it so that it uses handle submit async. All right, so that will take care of that. Now let's come down into handle submit async because of course we have to change the code so that we do await games client dot add game async and then games client dot update game async with the await in front. Okay, so that is edit game, right? And the next thing that we probably have to take a look at is delete game dot racer, right? Let's see what has to change here. So let's scroll down. And of course, this is where we do our confirm where we are going to delete the game. So we're going to have to do private async task, confirm async, and we're going to do await client.delete game async. Now this confirm async method is being used in our HTML resource. Make sure that we replace that here. All right. So yeah, so that should do it for the uh, for all of our ga uh, game data information. Now the only thing though to finish off here is to uh, also update our generous client, right? Because that should also retrieve the data from the backend. So let's do that quickly by going into generous client over here where we have our HTTP client. And really all we have to do is just change this method here, get generous. It's going to be a public async task of generate array. It's going to be named get generous async. And then it is going to no longer use this generous array. It's going to say await HTTP client that get from JSON async is going to deserialize into a generate array. And the path that it has to use in our backend, if we go back very quickly to the API, in this case, let's look at generous.http. The, the path or the endpoint is generous. So make sure we copy this. That is the path that has to be invoked from the front end. And just like we did with games client, if this returns null, we're just going to return an empty array. And with that done, we don't need, we no longer need this hard-coded in-memory array. We can get rid of that. And this is all we're going to need from our generous client. Now, of course, we use this generous client in our edit game that racer. So let's go into uninitialized where we have to make sure that we change this into protected override async task on initialized async. And then this is going to be await generous client that get, get generous async. All right. So that should be all of the changes that we need uh, to do here to start using our HTTP client and interact with the backend. Let's see what's going on. Yeah, so our Hot reload uh, was not super happy. So let's just do A to restart the application. Okay, restart it. Let's now go back into our client, right? And let's see if we can do a couple of things. So first thing is going to be, let's try creating a brand new game. So I'm going to click on new game. Let's create Mario Kart 8 looks. And then this is going to be a racing game. Notice that the generous here should be coming now from the uh, backend API, right? It's no longer an in-memory data. Now the price is going to be $49.99 and then uh, the date is going to be 05 2014 Okay, let's go ahead and hit save. And as you can see, the game was successfully saved in the backend. Now, if you wanted to confirm that this data is actually now stored in the backend, one way to do it would be to just go to the API over here and we can go into games.http. Let me collapse this. And we could go ahead and execute the request over here. Send a request to the backend directly from VS Code. And we should be able to see our brand new, yep, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe game is right here. So it just got created in the backend with ID 27. Okay, which is what we have here, ID 27. So yeah, the game is 
is coming from the backend. And then, uh, well, one more thing that we can try here is let's go ahead and before we test uh, edits, let's just test the deletion very quickly. And I'm going to delete this one game here, Elden Ring. Let's go ahead and click on delete. Make sure that this works. Delete. So yeah, game got deleted. That is working fine. And now let's go for an edit. And I think we're going to have an issue with edit. So let's let's see what happens. So let's click on, let's say we're going to edit FIFA 23. And yeah, as I was expecting, we have a bit of a problem here. And that is because when we retrieve the data from the backend, let me show you that quickly. Over here, for a very specific game, so in this case for game one, for instance, right? So let's retrieve game one. Let's go ahead and hit send request. What's going to happen here, what's happening is that the generate ID is coming back as a number, not as, as a string. But the way that we are trying to receive that over here in Blazor, if we look at our client, and let me go quickly into our games client, we are receiving that as a game details. If And if I press F12 to go to the definition of game details, game details here is a string, right? Remember that this is a string, the generate ID. So there's kind of a mismatch between the type that comes back from the JSON and the type that we have here. So next, we're going to see how to implement a JSON serialization converter to deal with this problem. And so I think the, simpler, the simplest way to deal with this is by using what is known as a JSON converter. So let me show you how to implement one. Let's go into our Explorer. And what we're going to do is actually switch to Solution Explorer because we're going to be creating a brand new folder here at the root of the project, right click, new folder, and this is going to be named Converters. And in Converter, we're going to use right click, add new file. This is going to be a class and the class is going to be named String Converter. Okay, so let's collapse this. And let's start by fixing the namespace by just clicking in the namespace light bulb, and then change the space to game store that front end that converters. Now the idea of this converter is going to be that regardless of the type that we receive into the converter, we're going to figure out a way to transform that type into a string. And specifically, we're going to be looking at numbers. So to make this an actual JSON converter, all you have to do is to implement the JSON converter class and then um, you have to be specific into uh, like into which type you want to convert values. In this case, we want to convert into string. And in fact, the right value to use here is going to be a string, string null. Okay. And with that in place, let's go ahead and do control dot right here so that we can use this option implement abstract class. Okay. So we impl are implementing the JSON converter abstract class. And as you can see, we have the two methods that we need to implement right now. Now implementing these methods is very straightforward. So all we're going to do here is to first just check that the type of the token that we are uh, reading from our JSON is an actual number. So we're going to say if reader dot token type equals JSON token type dot number. If that is the case, we're going to go ahead and uh, return reader and from that reader we have to read that number and we're going to be reading it as an integer so get int 32 and from that number we can go ahead and turn that into a string so to string otherwise if the if the token is not a number we're just going to go ahead and, and return reader dot get string right we're not going to be dealing with any other case than the number now this converter is going to deal both with the with reading values from the JSON and into our deserialized class, but also it's going to take care of writing values back, right? But we, we don't really care about the write case. It's really the reading that is causing us trouble right now. So for write, all we're going to do is just say writer dot write string value. And then we just put here the value that we received in the parameter. And that's pretty much it. That's all you have to do to implement your string converter. And now let's see, well, how can we use this converter in our, uh, in our class? So let's go back into our models. So let me get out of Solution Explorer and into our game details model over here. And back into our general ID, what we can do now is use this attribute right here. So we're going to use our JSON converter. 
which is going to be of type, so type, type of string converter, right? So that is the, the type that of the, that the class that we just created. Now let me do control dot here. So make sure that we use our game store dot front end dot converters namespace. Let's use that. And I think we're missing one parenthesis, right? So because we're doing this from here on, anytime we try to deserialize JSON into a game details object instance, and the value that we get for general ID is an is a number, the string converter is going to take care of transforming that number into a string so that we can read it properly. All right. And so with that in place, let's see how Hot Reload is doing. I think it's doing fine. So let's go back into here. And let me go back into our homepage over here. Perhaps I'll reload this. And then let's see if we can now edit one of the games. So let's go ahead and do FIFA 23. I'll click on edit. And sure enough, now the general ID was properly loaded. So it is a sports in this case, right? So that's great. And that's all because we use the right converter, right? And so, yeah, let's make one small change here. So let's say that FIFA 23 is kind of on sale. So it's now going to be $59.99 for a few days. So let's go ahead and hit on save. And sure enough, that worked. We can see that the value was updated, which means that the value, the correct value was sent back to the backend and our update logic is working as expected. And with that, I mean, the, our entire frontend is now working properly with full integration uh, with the backend. So technically the application is complete at this point. The frontend that we wanted to achieve uh, is working as expected. Now, one thing that we have not really uh, explored too much so far is what happens in our front end when the back end is behaving a little bit slowly, right? So how would this data load here if the backend is taking time to respond? So that is something I want to explore quickly here. So let's go back into our API. So I'm going to go back into my API and I'm going to stop it. So it's running, control C to stop it, close terminal. And what I'm going to do is just go to my endpoints, games endpoints. And it's going to make a temporal change kind of to simulate what happens if the API is too slow. So this endpoint here is the endpoint that is in charge of returning all of the games, right? When, which is the API that's invoked uh, by the homepage on our front end. So I'm going to introduce a small change here. So let me go ahead and give this an actual body. Okay, perhaps I'll do just this. Okay, and so yeah, we're going to now return away DB contest at games. But what I'm going to do is to introduce one more line here, which is going to cause a small delay in the return. So I'm going to do wait does that delay. Perhaps let's go for three seconds, right? So that's three seconds. So anytime this endpoint is invoked, it's going to take three seconds first, it's going to wait for three seconds, and then it's going to go ahead and actually return the data uh, from the database. Okay, so let's see how this affects our frontend. So let's go ahead and do .NET run. So we rerun this. And instead of keep using that, that same browser window that I've been using so far, I'm actually going to uh, go to another uh, window because I want to show you what happens on the very first load, right? So I'm going to go here in this new window. I'll hit enter. And notice that, well, really nothing is happening, right? So it took three seconds to actually load the page. Right, you can see that again, if I go to this other tab, I'm trying to load, but nothing is really rendering here, right? So that slow backend is causing a pretty bad experience uh, into our frontend uh, because we are not able to see any data until the frontend is ready to return that data, right? And here is three seconds, but when you deploy this to the cloud, right, the backend and the frontend, uh, the experience could be really, really bad depending on the load that the server has. So we have to figure out a way to present something in the client well, the server is, is finishing the work to return the, do the data back, right? Now, fortunately, we can do this uh, actually with just one line uh, in our Blazor application. Let me show you how that works. So let's go back into here and perhaps we're going to be closing most of these tabs. Let's go to Explorer and let's head into Components, Pages, and Home.Razor. So what we're going to do is just go all the way to the top and we're going to add just one attribute into our home component that is known as a streaming rendering. So let me add that attribute here. So it is stream rendering. 
And the idea of this attribute is that it's going to allow our Blazor application to send back some HTML initially back to the browser until the server is ready to send us back the rest of the data. Because remember that when we initially load uh, or render the component, we are ready to present this loading screen, right? This loading message. And only when the, when the data is, is available, we should be able to go ahead and render the table. But so far, we have not been taking advantage of this streaming rendering capability that will allow us to present this partial view here initially and then do something else. So the data is going to be streamed from the server as it is available. Let's see how that works. So let's go back into our browser and let's see how that goes. So I'm going to perhaps close these two tabs and let's open a brand new one. And now let's go browse into our application, right? So that and notice that immediately we get the loading indicator right there, right? And only when the data is ready, then it is going to come back, right? So once again, I'm going to open up a brand new tab. I'll go there, enter. It says loading, right? It says loading and eventually the data comes back, okay? So I think this is a pretty good <laughs> improvement for our experience because once again, uh, everything is going to working, be working super fast in your local box. But as soon as you hit the cloud or any deployed environment, things are going to start going much slower, right? So your UI needs to be ready to behave as fast as possible and, and have this responsive behavior regardless of all of these networking conditions. So make sure that you use a stream rendering in pages where you expect that the data may take some time to load. Okay. And so next, I want to show you one more improvement that we can introduce actually into our edit form. This next improvement that I'm going to show you mainly applies to forms where you have not enabled any sort of interactivity. So static server-side rendering. But I still want to show it to you because you may have to deal with forms that have no interactivity and this improvement is, is very essential. So to start with, what I'm going to do is first, let's go just go back to the backend. This is our uh, Game Store API. And I just want to stop the server and I'm going to remove this, uh, this slowliness that we introduced it a few minutes ago. So I'm just going to do, just do control C. So now the backend should be as, uh, as fast as possible. So I'm going to rerun the backend. Okay. And now let's go back into our VS code instance where we have our Blazor application. So we're going to do control shift E, let's close home.razor and let's go into edit game.razor. I remember that we have enabled interactivity here via the interactive server render mode here. So let's go ahead and temporarily remove this. Let's just remove it so that the form becomes uh, static. So let's see our .NET Watch. The application, I think it just restarted. Okay. And so let's go back into VS Code over here. Let's do, let's refresh it. And then let's go ahead and try to edit one of the games. So I'm going to click on edit. And let's go ahead now and open our browser console, F12. Let's open up. And if you go into the Elements tab over here, and now we click on Save, uh, you're going to see that uh, some elements of the page have changed. And perhaps it's not very evident in this tab here, so let me actually switch into the Network tab. Let's go to Network, and then let's click on Edit, and I'm going to clear this for now. Okay, so it's clear, and now I'm going to hit on Save, and notice how, how all of the files of our home component or of our application really have been reloaded, right? Pretty much the entire page got reloaded here, right? And in fact, if we collapse this for a moment and we go into this first request here, so this was the post that we sent to the server, right? Post request to post the changes. And then we go into this next request, which is a get to retrieve all of the data for the home component. And then besides that, we have to load also all the CSS, the JavaScript files, right? And yeah, a bunch of things happen here, right? Now, this doesn't look too bad in our local box, but in a, a deployed application, this is not going to look very nice. You, you may have to uh, end up with a page that you're going to see that it is loading and it's taking time to load with, with all the files that are involved. So in a static form, uh, there is a nice way to not have to deal with this kind of experience. So let me show you that. So let's go back into VS Code over here. And what we're going to do is just scroll down here into our edit form on the right side of this, of the declaration of the edit form. What we're going to do, and perhaps what I'm going to do is just send this to the next line so we can see better like this. And what we're going to do is just to add one more attribute here 
which is known as enhance. So this enhance attribute is going to enable enhance forms so that they can behave in a similar way as a single page application, right? Where only the, the HTML that changes is going to be re-rendered in the page as opposed to having to reload the entire page. Okay, so now let's see this in action. That's really all you have to do. So yeah, application should have reloaded now. So let's go back into our page and let's click on the edit button once again. So here we are back in edit and I'm going to clear our network tab again. And let's hit on save now, hit on save. And notice that we don't see, we don't see anymore all of those requests, right? So all we see here is this first request here, which is actually, I mean, it is a post. I mean, it is a post back to the server. However, it is executed via a fetch call, right? Notice this, it is a fetch call that does not require reloading the entire page, right? So we do the fetch and then in the next request over here, uh, we have our get for the homepage, but again, it was intercepted by Blazor, the client side, and is transformed into a simple fetch call over here. And because of that, there is no need to reload the entire set of uh, elements for the page, but only we will go ahead and reconstruct the pieces of HTML that change it when we move back into the home control, uh, component. Now, this is the same behavior that you would have observed if you have interactive uh, enabled for the form, but if you have a static form, you want to make sure that you enable this enhanced behavior because as you can see, it's going to uh, end up uh, producing a very, uh, a very interactive and nicely loading uh, component over here. All right, and yeah, with that said, let's just go back into edit game. And we're going to, perhaps we're just going to leave enhance over there and let's bring back our render mode, interactive server. Okay, well, it's not going to hurt uh, in any way to just keep having your uh, enhance over here. So it should be just fine. But now you know how to enable nice interactivity or a nice navigation from one component to the other, regardless of the fact if you are using interactivity or not. Congratulations, you now have a fully working and modern and interactive front end. I hope you enjoyed going through this course as much as I enjoyed creating it. And I can't wait to see what you will be able to build with your new Blazor skills.